The Barbary Bush and Eight Other Stories for Girls The Barbary Bush, Part 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne The Barbary Bush and Eight Other Stories for Girls by Susan Coolidge The Barbary Bush, Part 1 the minute hand of the schoolroom clock was marking the half-hour, and a subdued expectation became apparent in the group of outwardly studious girls who sat beneath it. More than one eye glanced furtively upward in expectation of the stroke. Half-past twelve was the signal for recreation, during which, for thirty happy moments, Mrs. Usher's young ladies, unbent from their intellectual labors, over milk, hard biscuit, and general conversation. The day was a warm one for late April. The morning had seemed long to everybody, and even Miss Parallax, the teacher of exact mathematics, was conscious of being glad when a jingle of glasses without announced that the refection was on its way upstairs, and relief was at hand. The single stroke sounded, and in a moment all was uproar. Desk lids were slammed, chairs noisily pushed back, the girls made a rush for the entry and returned with their tumblers and crackers to lunch in company. There was a buzz of voices broken by shrieks and exclamations. One girl only kept her seat, bent over a geometrical diagram. Barry, Barbary, are you never going to stop? demanded a tall, fair girl, coming up to her. Do hurry and get your milk. It will all be gone if you don't. And, besides... I want to talk to you. I was only finishing this equation. One does so hate to be beaten by a problem. I can't think why you should. I don't. What on earth can it matter whether the square of CB equals D or not? The conundrum is not worth guessing. I never could see what was the use of higher mathematics anyway. Arithmetic, yes, that is useful, because of keeping your accounts. Not that I ever keep mine, but I know I ought. But who in real life ever did sit down to practice geometry? Come, now, Barry, you know no one ever did. I dare say not. Barbara Allen, called Barbary for short and Barry for shorter, according to school parlance, was easily first favorite among Mrs. Usher's thirty-five scholars. It was a select school, and numbered among its list of pupils certain well-known names. There were Kate Van Rensselaer from Burlington, and Kate Schuyler from Dobbs Ferry, and Kate Schirmerhorn from New York, besides the two Biddle sisters from Philadelphia, and Ellen Sears from Boston. Good names, these. Names to figure well in a catalogue, and fill the heart of a schoolmistress with pardonable satisfaction. But still among these Kates, Biddles, Sears, and all, Barbary, with no special family backing, held the reigning place. They loved her for her sunny, sweet temper. They admired her for her girlish wit and cleverness. They raved over the soft curves of her face and throat, the color of her eyes, the thickness of her wavy brown hair, the way in which she sat and moved and stood. Girls are almost as much influenced by pretty looks as boys are. But Barbara was not only pretty— and not only even so very pretty, her gift was charm, and it goes farther than beauty with us all, and its effect lasts longer. Kate Van Rensselaer called Barbara the best bred girl in school, and Kate was very particular in such matters. Kate Shemmerhorn said she had air and was stylish, that potent word in the mouth of a New Yorker. Yet Barbara's clothes were not elaborate or costly. She always had enough to get along with, but never any superfluity. The Biddles raved over her voice, a sweet, low voice, with deep bell tones in it, and refined intonations which were a heritage from a Virginia grandmother whom she never saw. Truth to say, the Biddles, nice girls as they were, had something odd the matter with their vocal organs, the result of a civic environment, perhaps, Certain sharp A's and imperfectly rendered O's, which sounded strangely to unaccustomed ears. Ellen Sears dropped her terminal G's till they lay about thick as leaves in Vallambrosa. 
Barbary, as her friend Mildred Grant declared, was the only girl who said, Don't you, properly. All the others pronounce it, Don't you. These little delicacies and refinements of speech seemed to be born with her, and to come naturally, no one exactly knew why. For, as Kate Van Rensselaer remarked, she was more like Melchizedek than it was natural a girl should be, having neither father nor mother, nor end of days, nor any relations in particular, except an old grandfather and grandmother, of whom little was known, beyond the fact that they lived somewhere in Massachusetts and paid for her schooling. "'But you can be sure they are gentlefolks just by looking at Barbary,' went on this discriminating critic. "'She has good blood in her veins. You can always tell.' Barbara had never said much to her schoolfellows about these grandparents of hers. It was not that she was ashamed of them, but they and their old-fashioned ways and unprosperous lives seemed set so far away from the experiences of her careless, happy, modern companions that it was not easy to explain about them. She had no remembrance of her mother, who had died when she was born, or of the brave soldier father who had followed her so soon, losing his life, to find it again, on the red field of Gettysburg. Her first recollection was of the old roadhouse at Quasset Five Corners, of which, for forty years, her grandfather, Squire Allen, had been landlord and proprietor. To keep an inn in the past days of stages, when railroads were few and far between, and were regarded as dangerous innovations and novelties by many sober-minded people, was both remunerative and highly respectable. It was different now. Barbara loved the old place and the old people who lived in it dearly, but she could see that to outsiders the situation would seem queer and impossible. She had no false shames, no paltry timidities. Had there been any reason for it, she would have bravely announced it to the whole school, or the whole world, that her grandfather, who was the dearest old man she knew, kept a tavern, and had done so most of his life. But there seemed no reason. The girls loved and accepted her for her own sake. No one questioned or apparently cared. They would all love Grandpa if they knew him, reflected Barry, and they would understand just how it is if they could only see the old home and Grandmama. But it would be very hard to make them understand without seeing it. It all seems very far away, here, and... After all, it is not myself, and there is no use in speaking unless someone should ask. Then I would tell them all about it. But so far, no one had asked. The bell of the school sat perched on her desk, eating her biscuit, and a half-dozen girls gathered around to talk to her. It was invariably so at recess. Barry was always the center of a group. "'Finish the story of Muli al-Hassan,' said Kitty Schuyler, there are sixteen minutes left. You had just got to the point where he was arming himself to rush upon the foe. The rest of it is rather gory. Wouldn't you rather that I began something else, a more pleasant story? No, you cruel Barbary Allen, we wouldn't. We want to learn the end of Muley. Rightly named, murmured Mildred Grant. He was as obstinate a mule, I mean more, as was ever made. Go on, Barry. One of Barbara's many gifts was a talent for storytelling. The least little tale seemed to gain charm and value from the way in which she phrased it. She possessed a natural talent as to where to amplify and where to contract, what to add and what to leave out. Very well, she said, you shall hear about Muley. But it is very sad." Then she began, while the girls sat as close to her as they could get. Muley al-Hassan went steadily on with his task. He knew that the foe far outnumbered his little force, that there was no hope, that they must either starve to death or perish overwhelmed in the thick of the attack, and he resolved to end worthily. He took as much pains in arming himself as though he was not about to die. Every buckle and armor clasp was firmly fastened. He set his helmet on his head and turned down the visor. As he fastened his sword belt, he half drew the blade from the scabbard and looked sadly upon it. Engraved on the shining steel was a line from the Koran. It was an amulet, 
meant to strengthen his aim and bring luck, but well he knew that no amulet could serve him now. At last, when all was ready, he mounted his black horse, ordered the gate to be opened, and with his faithful followers about him, dashed straight down the steep hill and into the midst of the Christian army. His sudden onslaught was like a vision of doom, for they had halted to rest, a number were dismounted and unarmed, and before they could collect themselves many were slaughtered. At least a score fell by the hand of Al-Hassan himself. "'My, how delightfully bluggy!' put in one of the listeners. "'No irreverent remarks,' said Barry, threatening the offender with her half-eaten biscuit. "'But what can twenty do against a thousand? In a few minutes all was over. One by one the Moors who followed the standard of Al-Hassan were cut down. He himself was wounded in a dozen places. The foe pressed him fiercely. A lance was at his throat, and he was borne backwards from his horse. It was just then that suddenly, above the dust of the battle, appeared before his glazing eyes a radiant shape. It was Asrael, the angel of death, sent forth by Allah to receive the soul of the hero. His face was kind and beautiful, and in his hand he carried a wreath of shining leaves, plucked from the tree of paradise. Fear not, true believer, defender of the truth, but come to your reward, he said. The Christians could not understand the strange, wild look of rapture which came into al Hassan's face as he slowly fell from his steed. Surely he has seen some vision, they whispered among themselves, as they stood watching him die, and it has, why, in a different tone, what is that? That was a stir among the girls in the entry. Someone came rapidly upstairs. Barbara caught her own name and, where is she, and looked expectantly toward the door as Mrs. Usher came quickly in. Here I am, she called out. Then she saw that Mrs. Usher looked agitated and held in her hand a yellow envelope. A sudden thrill of apprehension swept over her. "'Oh, what is it?' she demanded. "'Is it for me, Mrs. Usher? Is anything wrong?' "'Yes, Barbara, it is for you, and bad news, I am sorry to say. They want you to come home at once. Your grandfather is very ill.' "'Grandpapa!' cried Barbara in a voice full of distress. "'Oh, what will poor Grandmama do? Does it say that he is very ill, Mrs. Usher?' "'Yes, dear, very. I fear there is no hope. You must hurry and put your things up for the three-twenty train.' Then, as Barbara rushed off to her room, she turned and said in a low voice to the girls, "'He is dead, but don't say anything to Barbara.' It is best that she should learn it gradually. Then she, too, left the room. The girls looked at each other in silent dismay. Oh, do you suppose she won't come back at all? whispered Kate Shermerhorn, putting into words the apprehension which all of them felt. That would be too dreadful, said Marian Biddle. I can't imagine the school without Barbary. How we shall miss her. Miss her? I should think so, broke in Mildred, impetuously. But one thing I know, which is that I shall not miss her long, for nothing would induce me to come back next term if she were not here. Why on earth should that old grandfather select this particular time to die? demanded Kate Van Rensselaer. I do really think he might have waited a few months till Barry had finished her education. Oh, Kate, how can you say such a thing? It sounds so unfeeling. None of us can choose our time to die. Poor Barry was so fond of him, and, oh dear, even now she doesn't know that he is dead. I am going to help her pack. There were only too many volunteers for this service. Many hands made light work, and Barbara's trunks were soon ready. She left nothing behind. Her schoolfellows noticed that. Down to the least trifle, everything was collected and folded, as if she was quite sure she should not come back, Kate Shermerhorn said bitterly to herself. The white-faced, silent girl who went so steadily on with her preparations seemed a different creature from the Mary Barbara of yesterday. The girls looked at her wistfully and half afraid. 
It was only when she kissed them for good-bye that the old familiar Barbara seemed suddenly to come back. The unshed tears in her dark eyes and the touch of her soft face made them all cry. They watched her drive away through a mist of weeping. It was not till they reached the station, just before the train started, that Mrs. Usher said gravely, "'Barbara, my child, you must be prepared. I do not think that there is any hope that you will find your grandfather alive.' "'Oh, Mrs. Usher, don't say that. I won't think it is so bad till I must.' But Barbara could not help thinking it. She thought of little else through the many hours of her journey. With her forehead pressed tight against the window pane, she watched the dreary spring landscape as they glided past ponds edged with broom sedge and bulrushes, hill slopes topped with leafless trees, stretches of sandy plain and rocky ledges, telegraph posts and endless lines of wire. There was scarcely a hint of the coming buds and green all wore the hopeless aspect of winter. Afternoon deepened into dusk, dusk into darkness. All was black, except the occasional flash from a distant window. It was like speeding through starless space, and the clank and revolution of the wheels seemed to utter one recurring phrase. Grandpapa is going to die. Grandpapa is going to die. Over and over again. Barbara closed her eyes, and would fain have shut her ears, but the sound rang on, nor could she cease from listening. It was half-past ten before the train reached the little Quisette station, the nearest railroad point to the old inn. There were still ten miles to drive, but Mrs. Usher had telegraphed, and a carryall had been sent over to meet Barbara. She knew the man who drove it, but she could not command her voice to ask any questions. It was not till the slow, interminable drive over the dim country roads was over and the dark outline of the house rose close at hand, all dark except for two lighted windows, one above and one below, that at last she managed to say, making a great effort, "'Jim, tell me, is Grandpapa alive?' "'No, Miss Berry, he ain't. He died at half-past nine before they sent the telegraph. And Grandmama? Well, I hain't seen her since. I suspicion she's not right well, replied Jim cautiously. Barbara asked no more. In fact, there was no time to ask, for the horse drew up at the door. She jumped out and went softly in. Someone came to meet her in the hall, a wrinkled old woman with white hair and a shrewd, kindly face, it was Hepsy Ann Green, who had lived always with Grandmama and taken care of Barbara herself when she was a little girl. "'Where's Grandmama?' demanded Barbara in a whisper. "'She's upstairs in her room. She hain't stirred since she was took. It's the Lord mercy it was up there it happened, and not down here. For how should we have got her up them narrow stairs and through the entry I don't know? She's heavy, and it seems to hurt her to move.' "'Took,' said Barbara. "'Is she ill, too? "'Oh, Hepsy, is everybody going to die? "'Jim just told me about Grandpapa. "'It was some kind of a stroke, "'but I don't think the doctor considers her dangerous, "'only dull and stunned-like. "'It came upon her very sudden, you see. "'Your Grandpa was only sick two hours. "'There, there, honey dear, don't cry.' You can run up and look at her if you're a mind to, but it won't be no comfort, for she don't seem to know anybody yet. I've got some supper in the dining room for you. Hadn't you better eat before you go up, and not come down again? It's nigh on to half past twelve. But to this proposal Barbara would not listen. She ran upstairs and was gone some minutes. When she came down she was crying bitterly. Oh, Hepsy, she sobbed. She looks so changed. She never moved or knew me at all. I never saw Grandmama before when she had not a smile on her face. No, she's past smiling any more, I doubt. There, there, don't feel so bad, child. It's the Lord's will, and we've got to put up with it, and not murmur, 
since it's so. She led the weary girl into the dining room, a big, bare place intended for many people, and looking dark, cold, and forlorn with its one table and single plate and cup. She soothed and petted Barbara and coaxed down a few mouthfuls, then took her upstairs, put her to bed, and tucked her in as though she were still a little child. "'Just say your prayers and try to sleep, honey dear,' she said as she withdrew with the candle. "'You'll need all your strength for what's coming tomorrow.' "'I feel as though I should never sleep again,' sighed Barbara. But she was too young and too tired to lay awake." Before long the merciful oblivion of slumber came to her, and all sorrows and fears dropped away and were forgotten. When she roused to the sense of a new day, the sun was pouring in broad yellow beams through a broken slat in her blind. It was some seconds before she recollected where she was and how she came to be there. It was a long, hard day that followed. Nor was the next any easier. Mrs. Allen roused to partial consciousness, could not bear to have her granddaughter out of her sight for a moment. She clung to her with a sort of frightened energy, and only when she fell asleep could Barbara leave her to do the many things that needed to be done. The kind old doctor came and went. Hepsy turned to her for orders. There was the minister to see, and the undertaker. Barbara felt as if she were walking in a dream." To her carefree, happy girl life the abrupt intrusion of these responsibilities and cares was painfully confusing. Even the funeral of her grandfather seemed a dream, the rows of carryalls and wagons in the sheds beyond the meeting-house, the solemn assemblage of neighbors, the discourse which made her cry because there was so much in it about her grandfather's goodness and readiness to help and oblige people, the wailing cadence of China sung by the choir, there were a great many people present. Squire Allen had been one of the standbys of the small settlement. He belonged to the past as well as to the present, and people respected him as a good citizen and kind neighbor. As clear as the day and always to be depended on to do the square thing by everyone, folks said, though they added that it was a dreadful pity he hadn't a little more sense about business and had let things run down so. The faculty of getting and keeping money is that which is most admired in New England communities. Still, integrity and benevolence command a certain regard. It was over at last. Squire Allen was laid beside his first wife in the weedy little burying ground at the top of the hill, and the long line of vehicles wound slowly down the road again. Barbara went home, feeling little comforted by the services. There was a good deal more consolation in the touch of Hepsy's hands on her hair and the kind voice which called her Honey Dear than in anything the minister had said. The squire wasn't only a professing Christian, he was a practical one, said the old servant, and the Lord don't make any mistakes about the difference between em. I hain't watched him all these years without knowing how it was. Tisn't so satisfactory to be getting older and poorer every day, as to make it worth while to stay away from heaven to enjoy it. I guess they're making it pleasanter for him up there than we could on earth, fix it the best we knew how. Almost no travelers stopped at the old road home in those days. The stage to Oxeter changed horses now at East Quescent, two miles further on, and its passengers dined there. It was an innovation of three or four years' standing. Squire Allen had let the inn at the corners run down so that it was no longer comfortable, people said. The three or four casual wayfarers who halted for a meal during that first sad week were cared for by Hepsy. Barbara saw nothing of them. She remained with her grandmother, only going out now and then into the garden for a breath of fresh air. It seemed as if life were, perhaps, going to be always thus, always so sad and shaded and full of mechanically done duties and she was too melancholy and listless to care very much whether it were so or not, and let day glide after day, careless whether it were morning or evening, and taking no pleasure in either. From this apathetic condition she was sharply roused. Just a week after her grandfather's funeral, Dr. Gregory, after his usual visit to the sick-room, said with a grave look on his face, "'Barbara, you and I have got to have a talk about matters and things,' Some thing has got to be settled, and the sooner we get about it the better. 
Come down to the little parlor, and I'll send Hepsy up to sit with your grandmother. I suppose you have never known much about your grandfather's affairs, said the doctor, seating himself by the table in the little parlor, which had once been the bar room of the hotel, and motioning Barbara to a chair opposite. Nothing at all, wonderingly. Grandpapa never talked about such things to me. I know he didn't. It would have been better if he had. Much better. He was never a man to care for advice in his younger days, and of late years he grew touchy about being interfered with, as he called it. I hate to say it to you, Barbara, but it has left his affairs in a bad shape. A very bad shape, indeed. They couldn't well be worse. I don't quite see how you and your grandmother are going to manage. Upon my word, I don't. He wiped his forehead nervously with his handkerchief. Do you mean, asked Barbara, anxiously, that there isn't enough left for us to live upon? That's precisely what I do mean. Tell me exactly how things are, looking straight at him. She was a little pale, and what her schoolfellows termed Barbara's business look had come into her eyes, a clear, resolute, penetrating look, unusual in a girl's face. I never noticed it before, observed the doctor, wiping his forehead again. But there's quite a look of your great uncle James about you. He was the lucky one of the Allen family, you know, went out to China, made a fortune there, and died of cholera, leaving it all to the board of foreign missions. Pity he didn't will some of it to the squire. It's queer that I never observed the resemblance before, for it's really striking. Go on, said Barbara, briefly. Oh, yes. Well, to put the whole thing in a nutshell, your poor grandfather has left everything to go to rack and ruin of late years. He lost the stage custom, which was worth a good deal, by not keeping the stabling in proper shape, and the dinners ran down, and the drivers grumbled till the company lost patience and made the arrangement at East Quescent. Then he let the house get out of repair and shabby, so people didn't care to stop at it. It used to be a proper place. I can remember when three and four sleighing parties a week would come out from town for a dance and a hot supper. And in summer there were always city families staying here, off and on. It was quite a different place to what it is now. I should think so, indeed. Go on, doctor. Well, your grandfather seemed to lose all his ambition after that spell of fever he had eight years ago. It aged him considerable, and he never was the same man again. Then, three years back, he endorsed Israel Saunders. There wasn't another soul at the corners but would have had more sense than to do it, and that swept off nearly all he had saved. Things have just gone from bad to worse since then. When the estate is settled up, I'm afraid there won't be much left, except those bonds of yours. They're safe, I know, and the old home, and perhaps a few debts to call in. I'm not sure as to them." Are there some bonds belonging to me? Couldn't Grandmamma and I live on those? My dear, there are only four of them. The interest is two hundred and forty dollars. It isn't enough to keep you, and your grandmother is never going to be able to do anything again. We might sell this place and take some little bit of a house. I wouldn't mind how small it was, if Grandmamma could be comfortable. The old doctor shook his head. I don't know who there is here who would want to buy the house as it stands. You see, it is not as if it were doing a paying business. And then, there's your grandmamma to be considered. I expect it would kill her to move. She's so attached to the old place. It's a hard sum to figure out, anyhow you put it. Yes, said Barbara, slowly. It's like a paradox. All the things we might do, we can't and all the things we can't do, we ought to do. I must take time to think it over, she continued after a short pause. I don't seem able to realize it yet. It is all so sudden. When are you coming again, doctor? Day after tomorrow. Well, let me have till then, and please think, too. Perhaps you will hit on something. She went upstairs after the doctor left to see if she was needed. Hepsy, sitting in the shaded window with her mending basket, made a sign for silence. Mrs. Allen had fallen asleep. Softly Barbara stole away, 
After a moment's hesitation, she walked down the long upper entry and into the room at its end. It was a large room extending over the width of the house, with two windows at either end and a fifth, in a sort of jog caused by the intrusion of a wing. The sun streamed in through the pensile boughs of a great weeping willow without, golden yellow with its mounting sap. What a pleasant room, thought Barbara. I don't remember this part of the house much. I wonder Grandmamma didn't choose it for her own. There was an old-fashioned bedstead in the room, but the tables and curtains had been removed, and the four bare post and unvalenced legs looked awkward and unsightly. Barbara studied the effect in silence and shook her head. Then she went softly down the entry examining each room in turn. An idea was forming in her brain, and she mentally took stock, as it were, of the aspect and contents of each chamber. There was not one pleasant one among them. All were small, some partitioned off from what had been the ballroom of the inn, others made from rooms originally large but divided in two by party walls, which brought fireplaces and windows into the wrong places. There were some good pieces of old furniture scattered here and there, but the mahogany was scratched and lusterless. A brass handle was missing now and again from the bureaus. The painted floors were dull and dusty. Everything was unattractive. Room after room. Barbara did not cease till she had inspected all. She made her way to the great cobwebby garret, in whose sloping corners every odd and end and disused scrap of the past forty years seemed to have accumulated, and took a comprehensive survey of its contents. Then she ran downstairs and went over the ground floor with equal thoroughness. And lastly, she made a study of the outside of the house. It was a long, low building with wings, painted white, with a two-storied piazza across the front, three windows on either side of the door below, and seven in a row above. The door was framed in narrow windows, whose small panes made a geometrical pattern. At each corner of the house was a large square chimney, and the roof was surrounded with a railing, above which arched the boughs of two great elms which grew in front, and the equally ancient willow tree at the side. A long L at the back contained the kitchen and offices, and was separated by a paved court and pump from the row of stage stables, now empty and deserted. There was something pleasing to the eye in the old-fashioned buildings, but the prevailing look was of shabbiness. The dingy white paint had peeled off in places. Here and there a blind was missing or hung loose from a broken hinge. The latticed edges of the roof and piazza showed gaps. The gravel was weed-grown and the grass rough. Still, as Barbara noted the details, her face cleared a trifle. The idea in her mind was taking feasible shape. "'We must stay here,' she reflected. "'Grandmama can't be moved,' the doctor says. "'And besides, there is nowhere else to go. "'We cannot stay here unless we can persuade people to come and stop at the house. "'People won't come while the place looks as it does. "'Ergo, as Miss Parallax would say, it must be made to look differently. "'But how to do it? That is the problem. End of Part 1 The Barbary Bush and Eight Other Stories for Girls The Barbary Bush, Part 2 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne The Barbary Bush and Eight Other Stories for Girls by Susan Coolidge The Barbary Bush, Part 2 All that day and the next she pondered this question— Every moment that could be spared from the care of her grandmother she spent going over the house and making entries in a little notebook which she carried in her pocket. By the second day her plan was digested, and she felt ready for her interview with Dr. Gregory. He came looking as much puzzled and troubled as ever. It was evident that no kind fairy had dropped any suggestion on his pillow. "'Well,' he said briefly, "'have you anything to say to me? I see by your face you have.' You look more like your Uncle James than ever. This last as a parenthesis. Yes, I have been thinking hard ever since you were here, and I have come to a conclusion, but I am afraid you will think I am crazy when you hear what it is. I dare say I shall. 
men of my age are apt to think girls of your age crazy. What's your conclusion? Out with it. It sounds rather wild, but the only way I can see out of the difficulty is that I should put this house in order and try to get its custom back, so that it may support us. Great Scott! That is a notion. Why, child, have you any sort of an idea what keeping such a house as this is like? Not much, I admit. I shall have to find it out for myself as I go along. But you don't quite catch my idea, doctor. I don't want to keep the house in the old way, as Grandpapa used to keep it, I mean. I want to make it something a little different. There's a great craze just now for old-fashioned things, as you perhaps know. This house exactly lends itself to such effects, and if I could do it over in a quaint style and make it attractive, I think people might come out from town to stay here in the off-seasons, late fall and early spring and midwinter, people who need a change and don't want to go far. It's real country here, for all it's so near the city, and it's very green and pretty, and the air is good. I seem to see just the set of people who would come if I once make it into a sort of fashion. You're much too young to attempt such a thing. But I shouldn't appear very often, you know. Hepsy would be the figurehead of the establishment. I can keep in the background and pull the wires. But when I did have to come forward, I'm not a bit afraid that I couldn't make myself respected. I can be pretty dignified when I choose, doctor. She drew herself up as she spoke, and a color flashed into her cheeks. I believe you, said the old doctor slowly. But all this would cost money, Barbie. Where is it to come from? That is true, and it is one of the chief difficulties, admitted Barbara, frankly. But there are those four bonds of mine. I propose to use a part of them, the whole if necessary. My dear child, those are all you have in the world. It would be very unwise to put them in a risky venture like this, Remember, you are entirely inexperienced, and very likely to make a mess of the whole thing, and lose every cent you put in. Of course there is a risk, but I don't think I shall make a mess of it, and if the plan succeeds and the house pays, the money is much better invested so than where it is. We can't possibly live on the interest. You said so yourself. The doctor was silent. Now, went on Barry, with a pretty tone of persuasion, I really know a good deal about housekeeping, though you may not think it. I've been at school so much that you may naturally suppose that I have never had time to learn such things, but I always had a fancy for cooking and taking care of things, and Grandmama used to let me help her, and Hepsy taught me a great deal when I was little. Then last summer, when I was in Europe with Mrs. Usher, oh, dear Grandpapa, think of his giving me such a treat, and he feeling so poor all the time. She stopped suddenly. Tears rushed to her eyes. Yes, I know, I know, said Dr. Gregory, patting her hand. You were the apple of his eye, always, Barry. He'd have done anything for you. I know all about it, child. Then there's all the more reason why I should do all I can for him now, for Grandmama, I mean. It's just the same thing, went on Barbara, impetuously. And I am glad he sent me to Europe, for, besides that I love him better for being so kind, it makes it all the easier now. I think I must have a thrifty turn, doctor, like my great uncle James, you know, for all the while we were gone I was studying the way in which they manage hotels and pensions over there. It interested me, and I used to talk with the women at the bureau and ask questions and get recipes. I only did it to amuse myself but I can see that it will be useful to me now to know about such things. Of course it's different over here, and we couldn't copy exactly, but you can't think how much more economical their ways are over there, and how everything is turned to account. But who is to look after your grandma while you and Hepsy are carrying out this wild scheme of yours? demanded Dr. Gregory, with an expiring effort at protest. I thought of that, and it seems to me that Jane Jordan is the proper person— She's Hepsy's sister, you know, and her husband died in the winter. She used to live here before she was married, and Grandmama liked her full as well as she did Hepsy. I think she'd very soon get used to having her about. And Kitty Jordan, her daughter, will be just what I shall want for a little table girl. I could be training her while the alterations are going on, you know, 
Hepsy thinks Jane would come if she could bring Kitty with her. What alterations are you thinking of? Not a great many. There are four partitions upstairs that ought to be knocked out. You see, we should never have a great many people here at once. It isn't the sort of house for that. And the few who come will want large rooms with plenty of space and light. Little cramped ones, such as there are now, would be no use at all. See, doctor, here is a plan that I made yesterday. Taking away the partitions here, and here, and here, pointing with her pencil, will give me three big rooms on each side of the entry, each with a fireplace, besides the large one behind. Then there are two more in each wing, not so big, but fairly good, and four little ones at the back, which will answer for the men servants and maids, the sort of people whom I want to have come to this house will all drive out from town in their carriages and bring their maids. Bless my soul! And how do you propose to make these grandees drive out? By making the house so pleasant that they will want to come, replied Barbara, with a brave look in her eyes. Then here's a ground for a plan. I thought I should turn this room into a small private dining room. There's sure to be someone who objects to dining in company, and in the right wing I shall have two small private parlors. Then I shall make a larger private sitting room of the one that used to be Grandmamma's, and that leaves the big parlor and general dining room for transients. And where are you going to stow yourself away when all this is done? Oh, the housekeeper's room, in the left wing, would be mine, and I shall sleep in the small one opening from it. It is close to the kitchen, you see, and I should be on hand for emergencies. They are nice rooms, and I shall make them pretty. Trust me to look out for number one, with a smile. It was the first time the doctor had seen her smile since her return, and he welcomed it as a symptom. It was as though the hard work she had prepared for herself had braced and refreshed her spirit. I will think it over, he called back as he drove away. Please think yes, she cried in return. I am not sure but she has hit on the only way out of the dilemma, he reflected as he jogged along. What a capable creature she is, to be sure. Her great uncle James over again, as I told her. Not one girl in a hundred would have thought of such a plan, much less have felt capable of carrying it out. Poor child, she hasn't the least notion of what she's undertaking. That's the best of it. Folks don't know till they're well along in a job how bad it's going to be. If they did, they'd never try anything, I suppose, and then the world would come to a pretty pass. Well, with a groan, I suppose I shall have to let her see what she can make of it. It's a bad business, and I feel as though I were conniving at a case of emphaticide. But what else is there to do? Barbara had her way. As Dr. Gregory had said, what else was there to do? The inevitable is an unanswerable argument, and matters were at such a dreary deadlock that any path out of the dilemma was acceptable. So he gave consent. Two of the four bonds were sold, the money was deposited in the bank, and the improvements to the house were begun. There was a stir of excitement at Quasset Four Corners when it became known that little Barbary Allen was fixing up the tavern and intended to run it for customers as her grandfather had done. People said it was foolish for a chit of a girl to undertake such a job, that Dr. Gregory was a fool to permit it, and that it was sure to end in a general smash-up and foreordained failure. One or two, who, perhaps, had private views of their own as to the ultimate disposition of the property by Vendu or otherwise, prophesied even harsher things. But all were interested, and as the repairs went on quite a crowd, six or eight were considered a crowd at Quasset, assembled daily, at such odd moments as their extensive leisure left a command, to watch the carpenters at work on the blinds and balustrades, or the painters as they covered the dingy clapboards with a coat of smooth buttermilk yellow, picked out with white, a combination chosen by Barbara, because she had noticed it often on old colonial houses in northern New England. The blinds she ordered painted a deep green, because people who sleep late in the morning like their rooms dark, as she said. The trees were judiciously trimmed, the grass cut, and the drive rolled smooth and re-graveled. The barns received the same care. Dr. Gregory protested against this as a useless expense, but Barbara persisted. It makes the place tidier, she said, and besides, coolly, I shall want them in order when the stages come back. The stages? Nonsense! You'll not get them back here, child. 
a thing that once flies off the handle like that never gets into shape again. But Barbara had the stables repaired and painted all the same. The reformation of the outside was easy enough. With the inside of the house, Barbara's real difficulties began. So much needed to be done, and there was so little money to do with, for Barbara was resolved not to spend the whole of the little stock in reserve unless it were absolutely necessary. I must at least leave enough to bury Grandmama and me decently if we starve to death during the experiment, she said to herself, half quizzically and half bitterly. Before buying anything, she and Hepsy devoted several days to a thorough examination of the contents of the big garret. It was a place that rewarded search. Nothing, apparently, had ever been thrown away in the old inn, however useless in appearance. It had been stored in the garret or the loft over the barn. All manner of unexpected treasures turned up in the course of this clearing out. The missing bureau handles, the broken claw feet of the high chests of drawers, fire dogs of many patterns and sizes, fireboards almost as quaint in design, the pulleys and weights of the tall eight-day clock for which a quarter of a century had been accumulating dust in the barn, the chintz furnishings of the old four-posters, warming pans, fire buckets, two spinning wheels for flax, and a larger one for wool, all manner of odds and ends. Barbara was handy at tools as with many other things. She set up a private glue pot of her own, and hammer and brads, a little chisel and saw, and went about mending chair legs and settee backs, screwing on knobs and replacing broken hinges in quite a workmanlike manner. Or, if the job was too difficult for her powers, one of the good-natured carpenters at work on the place would often lend a hand, and make things strong and safe for her to finish at her leisure. She could oil and varnish and rub as well as they, and put a smooth coat of paint over a floor, and she never forgot, as they were but too apt to do, to lock the door of the room afterwards, so that the floor might dry without anyone's stepping on the fresh paint, which was a point in her favor. One great find she made in the garret, which was a number of leftover rolls of the paper with which the hall had originally been hung, a delightful old landscape paper with tall imposing trees and groups of shepherds and shepherdesses disporting themselves beneath and cockatoos and birds of paradise flying above in all shades of tea blue. Years before, in a fit of misguided zeal, Mr. Allen had pasted this over with a paper supposed to be of superior modern elegance, a green paper with red and gold lozenges which suggested caterpillars sprinkled at regular intervals over it. Ugly in itself, it was still uglier as conflicting with the characteristic of the house. When it was torn off and the halls upstairs and down rehung with the old-time landscapes, the improvement was marvelous. Everything else seemed at once to fall into cord with it, the twisted balustrades of the white-painted staircase, the tall clock restored to its place in the corner, the wooden settees, which Barbara brought in from the barn loft, scraped, varnished, and set on either side of it, the row of leathern fire buckets, each with its date, which she hung on the landing, and the big wool wheel standing vis-a-vis -vis to the clock. Barbara longed for some eastern rugs to lay on the brown-stained polished floors, but these she could not afford. In their stead she put squares of the heaviest rag carpets she could find, bound or fringed, and lightly tacked to their places. These she could buy from her neighbors. They made rag carpets still on some of the outlying farms near Quasset, and the general mix of colors and absence of pattern seemed to suit the effect which she wished to produce better than a modern Kidderminster or Brussels. Out of the garret, which seemed to possess the useful quantities of that wondrous bag, carried by the old mother of the Swiss family Robinson, came two heavy coverlets, needleworked and thick as carpet, which did duty as portiers over the dining-room door and parlor doors. She also found a whole trunkful of dimity curtains and counterpanes edged with ball fringe, which were the very things for the bedrooms, and another of delightful patchwork counterpanes, upon whose squares of India cotton appear birds and flowers of subdued but brilliant hues, it was not till every corner was ransacked, and every scrap of old material turned to account, that Barbara began to buy. Then she went to Boston for two long days shopping, with a firm determination in her heart that whatever she got should be pretty, odd, and a bargain, or she would not buy at all. A few years since such a quest would have been hopeless. Nowadays it is comparatively easy. Many modern stuffs have a flavor of the antique about them and the cheaper things are often as pretty in their ways as the dearer ones. 
Barbara had no difficulty in finding papers which suited her purpose, at fifteen and twenty cents a roll, good and unobtrusive in design and of refined colors, soft tones of yellow and olive and blue. There were curtain materials in plenty, thick and thin, which cost little, and cheap chintzes resembling the old patch, in effect, to suit her antique chairs and sofas. A little hunt in the bargain shops revealed stores of delightful tumblers and goblets, knobbed or grooved, in spiral circles, which looked old enough to suit the days of King Arthur, and cost but nine pence apiece. Pretty dishes, also equally inexpensive, brown glass which looked like cut glass, and deep-hued Japanese wares at the price of common white. A store of these did Barbara lay in, with a sense of wonderment at her own good fortune in finding them. "'It seems impossible that I can have got so much for so little,' she said, counting over her money, and looking at the long range of articles which she had just unpacked. "'See, Hepsy, these charming little blue pitchers only cost fifteen cents apiece, and the plates eighteen. And just look at my flower jars. I want always to have a great many old-fashioned flowers about the house, and those eleven vases, all different and all pretty, only cost me four dollars and a half. You and I must fly to work on the pincushions and the curtains now, and then we shall be ready to begin.' End of part two. The Barbary Bush and Eight Other Stories for Girls. The Barbary Bush, part three. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne. The Barbary Bush and Eight Other Stories for Girls by Susan Coolidge. THE BARBARY BUSH, PART THREE One discovery made in the attic was of the old sign which had hung above the door of the inn half a century ago, and had been taken down when Grandpapa entered into possession. The bush was the legend it bore in faded letters of blue and gold on a white ground, and the pole by which it was affixed to the piazza still survived. This sign Barbara herself retouched. She painted a thick wreath of barberries around the edge, and after some consideration added one word to the inscription, making it run thus, The Barbary Bush. This was in part because of the play on her own name, and partly because of the added quaintness of the title. This done, there only remained to compose an advertisement which should correspond with the title and aspect of the place. It appeared about the middle of June in the Boston papers, and was as follows. The old roadside inn at Quasset Four Corners, having been put into complete repair and refurnished, is now ready to receive lodgers. For information and terms, address B. Allen, The Barbary Bush, Quasset Four Corners, Massachusetts. For seven weeks this carefully worded appeal appeared day after day in the morning issue of the Herald, Globe, Post, and Advertiser, and nothing whatever came of it. The custom of the house was still limited to the half-dozen wayfarers on foot or wheels who, between Sunday and Sunday, stopped for a single meal and went their way. Occasionally one of them said something complimentary about the dinner or the improved looks of the place, but fine words butter no parsnips, and the young landlady needed more substantial approval. In vain she reminded herself that the Barbary Bush had opened too late for the spring and early summer chances, that everybody had left or was leaving town just as she began to advertise, everybody at all likely to patronize her, that is, in vain she repeated the old saying about Rome not having been built in a day. She could not keep at times from feeling very downhearted. It was trying to have worked so hard and see no result, to sit idle-handed while she would fain have been busy. There was this added perplexity also, that while any day might bring a call which would tax all her resources, such a call could not be foreseen or counted upon. In the state in which her finances were, she could by no means afford to stock her larder with perishable eatables on an uncertainty, and yet there was almost as great a risk in being caught unprovided by a large party and having her reputation suffer in consequence. Her neighbors hinted discouraging things. Dr. Gregory began to look sober and shake his head when he spoke of the future. Only Hepsy kept up her spirits. "'The Lord ain't so inattentive to things as some people seem to think,' she said ocularly and he knows you've done your best. You just wait and see how it turns out, honey dear. Barbara listened to these heartening comments and waited. There was, in fact, nothing else to do. 
but it was with a sinking heart at times that she did so. Taught by an inborn sagacity, she kept her resources well in hand for a possible emergency, laid in a few cans of the best imported soups, and took pains with her vegetable garden. She was careful to be provided with bread, butter, and milk of the best quality, and bought a coop full of spring chickens and set them to scratching in the disused corner behind the barns till they should be wanted. I feel easier in my mind, now that those nice little broilers, as Hepsy calls them, are on the premises within reach of a sudden call, she told Dr. Gregory, and I need not lie awake wondering what I should do if a carriage load arrived after the meat man has gone by for the day. It is really very nervous work, never to know if I am to have a dozen people for dinner or none at all, but the worst of it is that it is almost always none at all. The house was kept in nice order, trim, spotless, and fragrant with freshly cut flowers. These cost nothing. Squire Allen had dearly loved his garden, and Barbara found a store of the old-fashioned sorts ready to her hand. Pinks, larkspurs, foxgloves, and phlox, climbing roses and white lilies, lavender, sweet williams, and self-sown hollyhocks, she could afford to be lavish with them, and she was. If only someone would but come to see how pretty they looked. She was in a mood of unusual discouragement one morning in early August, as she stood in the garden surveying her vegetable beds. "'This lettuce which you planted so late is just in perfection,' she said to Hepsy. "'The tomatoes are getting ripe, too. Oh, dear me, I wish somebody would come and eat them.' We are frequently unconscious of the inaudible footsteps of fate even as they near us. Someone was coming at that very moment, as Barbara stood pensively regarding her lettuce and throwing a word now and then over her shoulder at Hepsy, who sat on the step of the side door shelling a mess of young peas which she had just gathered. This somebody was a brown young fellow in knickerbockers and flannel shirt, with a knapsack over his shoulder and a tennis cap sat on a closely cropped head. He was to outward appearance very like other travellers who had come and gone, leaving no visible results behind them. Barbara barely turned her head as he passed up the walk, and never dreamed that, as far as her fortunes were concerned, he represented the turning of the tide. But all the same, though she little suspected it, under that tennis cap, and within that somewhat rough, tramping gait, lay the making of her future and that of the Barbary bush. Who? whistled Sidney Owenson, as he stared at the renovated front of the building. The rookery is all done over, I declare, and, upon my word, very well done, too. Somebody with taste has been at work here. That old sign now. I never noticed it before. The Barbary Bush. Now I wonder who chose that name for it. It's awfully fetching, and so is that wreath of Barbary's. I should never have known the place. He crossed the piazza to the door the upper half of which stood invitingly open, and gave another long, low whistle. "'By Jove!' he said aloud. "'It's an old-fashioned picture. I don't know when I have seen anything so pretty.' Before him lay the broad hall, all in soft shadow, against which the gilt figures on the clock dial and the brass handles of a tall mahogany chest of drawers made glinting lights. On the table stood a great bow-pot of sweet williams, crimson, pink, and white, and a breath of mignonette came through the open door of the parlor on the right, a cool, inviting room, as he could see, with a pale olive paper and white curtains which waved slightly as the summer wind blew through the closed blinds. Sidney noted these things rapidly as he stood gazing across the door. Then he lifted the iron knocker and gave a resounding rap. The opposite door opened, and an elderly woman appeared, staid and respectable, in a white apron. "'Will you please to walk in, sir?' she said. She did not drop a curtsy, as an Englishwoman under the same circumstances would have done, but there was courtesy in the tone and manner. "'Thanks,' said Sidney Owenson, politely, doffing his cap. "'Could I have some dinner here, do you think? This old house is a good deal changed since I was here last, about a year ago.' "'Yes, sir. A great deal has been done to it. "'Will you wish to have a room, sir? Dinner will be ready at about half-past one, if that suits you.' "'Thanks. It suits me very well. Yes, I think I will go up and have a wash,' said Sidney, vaguely curious to see more of the house. "'I suppose you haven't many people stopping here just now?' "'No, sir, not many. This way, please.' "'Who keeps the inn now?' asked Mr. Owenson, as they went up the stairs. "'Old Allen, who used to be here, is dead, isn't he?' "'Yes, sir. 
He died last spring. Miss Allen keeps it now. She showed him into the large room with the chintz-hung four-poster, closed the door on him, and ran rapidly down the back stairs to Barbara, who was still ruefully hovering over her vegetables. "'Miss Barry,' she cried, "'you and me has got to take pains with dinner today. It's sort of borne in on me that this young feller is the kind you've been looking for all this time. He's a city chap. That you can see in a minute. But he's sort of different from them that has been coming, and he might say a word for the house.' "'And by George,' Sidney Owenson told his mother the next day, "'I have seldom been so surprised as I was by that dinner. "'I ought to have had my mind prepared by the way the rooms looked, "'but somehow one never does expect decent food "'or serving at that sort of a country place, "'and I expected, of course, to see the usual thing, "'with a little modification in the way of tidiness, perhaps. "'In the first place, they didn't ring a bell. "'A little maid in a cap knocked at the door with, "'Dinner is served, sir,' and when I went down, instead of the large bare table with a cloth across one end of it, which I was prepared for, there was a small round one, drawn up close to the window to catch the air, and nothing on it except a very white tablecloth, an artistically folded napkin with a roll inside it, and a little covered soup tureen. Oh, yes, there was a bowl of roses in the middle of the table, which smelled as if they were just picked, so fresh and summery. The soup was consommé, and if you'll believe it, there was grated parmesan to eat with it. You could have knocked me down with a feather when I saw that. Then came a perfect broiled chicken, with peas and new potatoes, and a platter full of ice-cold tomatoes, wreathed with crisp lettuce, and seasoned exactly right with oil and tarragon. After that, a plate full of broiled mushrooms on toast, and to wind up, iced cantaloupe, and three great sweet apples baked to a jelly, with thick cream to pour over them. I haven't had such a good dinner I don't know when. So few things, but each so good in its way. No pie, no mixed pickle bottles, no chow-chow or tomato ketchup, no bird bass full of cold vegetables, no flies. I felt as if I were dining in a dream. It was like the nicest sort of a little English country inn, only the food was a hundred times better. And does the old woman you speak of keep the house and prepare these dainties herself? asked Mrs. Owenson, entertained and surprised by the little story, which Sidney had purposely made as long as he could to amuse his mother. No, I think there is someone else, a Miss Allen, sister or daughter of the former landlord, but I didn't see her. The old woman seemed the person in charge. It is singular that a person in her position should have so much taste, remarked Mrs. Owenson thoughtfully. I'll tell you what, mother, went on Sidney, it wouldn't be half a bad plan for you to move out there for a few weeks. It's high ground at Quasset, you know, and cooler than this, and it's only twenty miles. I think you'd be comfortable, and it's better for you than staying in town. We could fix up a bed in the carriage, I am sure, in which you could make the journey without its hurting you. You know the doctor said last week that he should get you into the country as soon as it was possible. Yes, I know he did, but I thought then, and I think now— that it would be cold weather before I could bear the journey to Dublin. There's so many changes, you know. But to be lifted in the carriage and set down at this place of yours would be quite a different and much easier thing. It might be possible, and we will talk to Dr. Minot about it, if you really think I will be comfortable there, that is. I do think so, mother. If the doctor agrees, I'll write the old lady this evening. Mrs. Owenson had broken her leg in three places two months before, just as the summer Hagira to their country place was imminent, and had perforce stayed in town through the warmth of June and the heat of July, cheered only by an occasional east wind and the attentions of her younger son, who came and went, but gave the greater part of his time to his mother, to whom he was devoted. The doctor, when consulted, approved of the plan. A letter was written and the arrangement was made. Barbara's chance had come. She was to receive Mrs. Owenson, her son, maid, nurse, companion, coachman and horses, for a period of two months, at highly remunerative prices, and she felt that this good luck was probably but the beginning of still better things. Five days later the Owens's carriage drove up at the door of the Barbary Bush, just as the sun was setting. The drive had been a tedious one from the slow pace which it was necessary to observe. Mrs. Owenson was very tired, and rather disposed to repent her experiment, but as she leaned forward to look at the place, and saw the long, cream-colored building under its shading elms, 
she gave a little exclamation of relief and pleasure. "'It does look pleasant,' she admitted. "'It's because I'm so tired, probably, but I was beginning to feel sure that you had exaggerated things, Sidney. I see you haven't. Now, if you can once get me safely upstairs and into my bed, I think I shall like it.' Hepsy was on the stoop, waiting to receive them. She handed Sidney a strip of carpet with strong handles sewed on either side, which resembled a legless camp-stool. "'What is that?' he asked, surprised. "'It's a kind of seat which Miss Allen thought would do to take the lady upstairs on. She saw one like it in a hospital, she says. "'This was really a clever notion of the old lady's,' Mrs. Owenson remarked, as her son and the coachman carried her smoothly up the staircase. "'A great deal better than being personally conducted by you alone, Sid, as I was when I came down. Oh, what a pleasant room!' It was the big room at the end of the hall, and it did indeed look pleasant. The many windows were all open to let in the fresh air, but a wood fire laid ready for lighting in the andirons of the Franklin stove showed that cold days had been thought of also. The end farthest from the bed was arranged as a little sitting-room, with a lounge, easy chairs, and a low table. There were flowers on the chimney-piece and flowers on the dimity-topped bureaus. The sheets were invitingly turned down, and the curtains drawn far back for coolness. It looked most attractive. Mrs. Owenson was more and more charmed with every moment. "'I declare,' she said, sitting up on her pillows to drink her tea, English breakfast tea in a china cup with a dash of cream. "'It's like a fairy tale, the white cat or beauty and the beast. Only a white cat or an enchanted prince could serve such a nice supper in a wilderness like this. Look at that muffin, if you please. "'Sid,' I hope there's one like that for your supper. What's under the cover? Tomato omelet, as I am alive. Now don't try to make me believe that there is not a fairy about the premises somewhere. Tomato omelet, at Quasset Four Corners. Sid, your old woman is bewitched. If you knew the right formula, you can disenchant her in a moment and turn her into a princess. In that case, I'm rather glad that I don't know the formula. I like her better as she is, said Sidney, pleased at his mother's pleasure. I don't believe there's a princess going who has such good ideas about cooking. Give me my old woman every time. Now, mother, since you seem all right, I'm going downstairs to attend to my own appetite. I hope that old brick is going to give the rest of us something equally satisfactory for supper. It was not until several days later when, as it chanced, Sidney had gone off for a brief visit with some friends that Mrs. Owenson met Barbara. She wanted to arrange for a niece to come to her for a fortnight's visit, and demanded to see the landlady. Her eyes were on the door when Barbara tapped, and there was a distinct picture before her mind of the sort of person she expected to see. Tall, angular, neat, capable, a typical New England old maid of the superior type. Her surprise was great when, in answer to her come in, there appeared a slender, upright girl, dressed in the simplest black, relieved only by a white collar and apron, with a sweet face lit by a pair of resolute brown eyes, and brown waving hair dressed to perfection. An unmistakable lady at every point. She carried three beautiful white Provence roses in her hand. "'I hope you are feeling better this morning,' she said simply and cordially. "'Shall I put these into your vase? They are just from the garden, and very sweet.' "'My dear, I don't quite understand,' said the surprised Mrs. Owenson. "'You must excuse me, but I was expecting to see the landlady.' "'I am the landlady,' said Barbara. "'Hepsy said you wanted to speak to me.' "'You!' cried Mrs. Owenson, a world of astonishment in her voice. "'But I was told that Miss Allen was an elderly person. Is she your aunt?' "'No, I have no aunt.' "'I'm the only Miss Allen there is,' replied Barry, unable to keep from smiling. "'Please forgive me for being so young, and tell me what I can do for you. I'm very anxious that you should be comfortable.' "'Oh, I am. I never was so comfortable out of my own house before in my life. It was only that I wanted to ask. But do you mean that you really keep this in and arrange things so delightfully all by yourself? I thought there must be someone besides that old servant.' No servant would be capable of it, or very few ladies, in fact. Do excuse me for being so curious, but how old are you, and how did you learn it all? 
I am nineteen, nearly twenty, that is, and, indeed, I haven't learned it all. It is still a new work for me, and I hope to improve and do much better as I go on. You are my first lodgers, you know, and I trust you will let me know if there is anything you think should be changed. I have to learn, like all beginners, by my own mistakes, and criticism from people who know how such things should go would be a great help. There is nothing to criticize that I can see. Everything is delightful, said Mrs. Owenson kindly. She felt wonderfully drawn to the pretty creature, younger than her own daughters, who it had taken such a task on her shoulders. Mrs. Owenson's daughters were all married. She had grandchildren fast growing up, for all that she looked and felt so young. "'Do sit down a little while, if you can spare the time,' she said persuadingly, "'and please tell me a little bit about yourself, and how you came to be here keeping a house like this. Invalids have such a dull time that they are privileged to be inquisitive, you know, and I am sure that you have not spent all your life at Quasset Four Corners.' Barbara sat down, and won by the gracious manner and kind eyes of her questioner, told frankly the little tale of her necessity, her disappointments, and her hopes. Mrs. Owenson listened with absorbed attention. "'It's a romance in real life,' she declared. "'Somebody ought to write it out. Not one girl in a thousand would ever have thought of such a plan, or been capable of carrying it out successfully as you have done. "'Then you really think I shall succeed?' asked Barbara anxiously. "'It would be such a relief to be sure of it. It means so much to us, and all the people about here have been certain that I should fail. Your coming was the first gleam of hope I have had. It takes so long to start a thing of this kind, and get people to notice it, and you see Grandmama and I cannot well afford to wait. "'My dear, you will have plenty of people a little later. Don't be afraid as to that. It's exactly the position for a house of this kind,' and you have made it all look so charming that there is no danger that you won't have customers. I shall be surprised if you don't find yourself the fashion yet. You are very wise, however, to put your old servant forward as a figurehead, she added, struck with a sudden thought. It would never do to get yourself talked of as a pretty young landlady and have people coming here on purpose to get a look at you. It would not, replied Barbara coolly. But it will never happen, Mrs. Owenson. Hepsy receives people for me, and answers questions, except in a case like yours, when someone is ill. I must go now. Please let me know if you want anything. She didn't quite like my saying that, reflected Mrs. Owenson, but I'm still not sorry I said it. Such a young girl might easily make a mistake which could lead to unpleasant consequences. How pretty she looked with that little blush and dignified air. Wherever she got it, she's a thoroughbred little creature. I can't imagine how she came to be what she is, with such an ancestry and surroundings. Mrs. Usher's school. Let me see. Didn't some of Harriet Sears's girls go there? I must find out from them. Mrs. Owenson was that unusual thing, a woman of the world who still retained the freshness of her sympathies and the power of enthusiasm. She took strong likes and dislikes, and was frankly ready to laugh at the scrapes into which these occasionally led her. But they never hardened her sensibilities. Her sons teased her about her impulsiveness, and laughed at what they called her fancies, but they loved her only the better for them. They were part of the warp and woof of her nature. One of these fancies she now experienced for her young landlady, and it grew stronger after every interview. These interviews were always of Mrs. Owenson's seeking, and were procured with a difficulty which lent them value. She was lonely, she declared. She needed to be amused. Barbara must take time to sit with her now and then. It did her good, and she wished it so much. Thus she pleaded, and Barbara could not resist the plea. She grew very fond of Mrs. Owenson, who had a motherly quality about her, irresistible to a girl who had never known a mother, and had always longed for one. To talk with Mrs. Owenson was like opening a door, closed for many months back, into her bygone life, and though it revived some regret, it could not but be an enjoyment. She planned her work, and gave as many moments as she could spare to this new and delightfully exacting friend. But these were not many, for the house was pretty full now, and it taxed both her resources and Hepsy's to provide properly for such an influx of people. With Sidney's return, accompanied by a friend, and the arrival of his cousin, Miss Elliot, Barbara naturally withdrew again into the background. Mrs. Owenson did not actually need her company any longer, 
and though repeated messages came down begging for a visit, she was inexorable. Miss Berry was too busy to be spared just then, Hepsy would say. It was only when the others were driving or off for the day that Barbara allowed herself the treat of a talk with her friend, and she only laughed when reproached for her hard-heartedness. "'I'm carrying out your advice,' she said demurely. "'It was good advice, and I mean to abide by it.' "'Hoist on my own petard,' laughed Mrs. Owenson, half admiringly and half provoked. "'You are a stubborn person, and if I didn't like you so much, I could find it in my heart to quarrel with you.' I miss you dreadfully, Barry. You don't half know how much. You have Miss Elliot now, and Mr. Owenson and Mr. Granger to keep you company, so you can't really need me. Really and truly, I will always come when they leave you alone, but for the rest of the time you must excuse me. I am very busy, and besides, it is really better I should. You know you said so yourself. I know I did. Well, stay as long as you can, now that you have come." I've grown so fond of you that I want you all the time. But you have a great deal to do, I know, and no doubt you are wise about it. I wish you didn't have to do all this, Barbary. It seems hard you shouldn't be enjoying yourself with the other girls of your age. It does seem rather hard, on the days when things hitch, when Hepsy's rolls are not up to the mark, or Mr. Jones comes without anything in his wagon that quite suits me, and an awful fear that you will have nothing for your dinners sweeps across me, then I do wish sometimes that I could be put back a year or two, and find myself at Mrs. Usher's, with nothing to do but study and enjoy myself. Then, on other days, when everything works smoothly, and my pudding turns out well, and my jelly gels, and Hepsy reports that everyone liked the salad, why, then I think I am having a pretty good time on the whole. With a self-denial as difficult as it was judicious, Mrs. Owenson had refrained from telling her son the history of their young landlady. It's better for Barbara herself not to be talked about, she reflected. She'll emerge from this eclipse some day, like as not, and meanwhile it's best that she should keep in the background. Besides, there's no use in making a romance of the case. Young men are so easily affected by that sort of thing. Sid might lose his head, or tell his friends, and the story get out. I don't want any of their mothers blaming me. She was so much in the habit of sharing her impressions with her favorite son, however, that she found it hard to be discreet. And she was proportionately discomfited, therefore, when, a month after their arrival at the Barbary Bush, Sidney came in one day with an unexpected question. "'Mother, have you any idea who a girl can be whom I just saw now in the orchard of this house? I didn't know there were any young people stopping here.' "'What sort of a girl?' "'Oh, a very pretty one, tall, with fine eyes, dressed in black, and a nice figure, not a bang-up beauty.' but mighty near being one. Miss Allen, who keeps this house, is young. Perhaps it was she. Oh, it couldn't be Miss Allen. This is a lady, I tell you. She has the sweetest voice I ever heard. I can't imagine who it is. What were you doing, Sid, to happen to come across her and her voice? Well, I was strolling about with no evil intentions in particular, and I made my way past that bed of tall asparagus, which screens the vegetables, to a shady bit of an orchard, into which I had never been before. And presently this girl came along with a kitten in her arms and a basket full of apples. She was talking to the kitten. That was the way I came to hear her voice. She didn't see me. I kept discreetly behind a tree. Now, Sidney, said his mother, who had made up her mind rapidly while listening to his explanation, I am going to repose a confidence in you. All the time we have been here I have been keeping something back, because, well, because I thought it was best. But now I will tell you about it, and I think you will understand. Briefly and picturesquely she related Barbara's little history, her bringing up, the sharp changes in her fortunes brought about by her grandfather's death, and the brave struggle which for the present she was engaged in. It was quite an interesting story, as she told it, and Sidney listened, intent and wondering. You see, she ended, that unless you are discreet, you could easily do this poor child a great deal of harm. A little careless talk about her and her affairs with your chums and college mates might bring her into a notice which would be embarrassing and make it hard for her to continue in what she is doing. She's a noble little creature, whom all good people are bound to respect and help, and I am sure I can trust you to keep her secret and not to gossip about her with other fellows. The situation is just unusual enough to set them all to peeping and popping about in her path, 
just from a mistaken idea of chivalry and romance. I should be awfully disappointed in you, Sid, if I thought you capable of doing such a thing, but I am sure you are not. You may trust me, mother. Not a fellow among them shall hear her name from me, declared Sidney. He chuckled a little, as if amused by some inward reflection. That's my dear boy, said Mrs. Owenson. Of course I shall be civil to her myself, if we meet, added Sidney. As you say, she is a person to be thoroughly respected. Oh, certainly, said his mother. So, acting under this permission, Sidney was civil, very civil, when he and Barbara met, which somehow chanced rather often, and all went smoothly for the next month at the Barbary Bush. End of Part 3「The Barbary Bush and Eight Other Stories for Girls – The Barbary Bush, Part 4 – This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne The Barbary Bush and Eight Other Stories for Girls by Susan Coolidge The Barbary Bush, Part 4 It was a crisp, sparkling morning in mid-October. The Owensons had gone away the week before, and Barbara missed them so much that she had to keep very busy over accounts and winter preparations of all sorts to avoid low spirits. Sid had grown to be almost as much of a friend as his mother in her estimation, and he brought into her life something which his mother could not bring, the sympathy which youth gives to youth, dear, hopeful, and delightful. He had scrupulously observed his promise of never naming her name to the other fellows, so scrupulously, in fact, that it was suspicious. It seemed as though he found particular pleasure in keeping the secret to himself. Barbara had just recorded the result of a long column of figures at the bottom of her page when Hepsy hurried in, brimful of an exciting piece of news. "'What do you think, honey dear?' she began in a tone which was decidedly not sympathetic. "'There's been a big fire over to East Quasset, and them stage stables is all burnt out. The hotel caught, too, but the engine got over there in time to put that out and save the furniture. It was pretty badly burnt, though. Jed says it will have to be almost built over before they can use it. Mr. Harmon is all broke up, he says. You see, he was between two insurances.' The old one run out last week, and he was going to see about a new one this week, only he didn't have time. Hepsy, you don't sound half sorry enough. I pity Mr. Harmon. It's hard luck. Well, Miss Berry, I don't set up to be particularly sorry for those folks at East Quasset. I can't forget how they stole the stage away from us and almost broke your grandfather's heart. You wasn't here then, and you don't know how bad he felt about it. The defection of the stage line from his accustomed halting place at the corners had been a great loss to the old inn, and was so still. It was one of the few lines of the sort left in New England, and connecting, as it did, the railroad, ten miles to the east, with a series of mill towns and villages higher up among the hills to the northwest, it still commanded a steady run of travel. Five, six, eight dinners a day count for a good deal in the prosperity of any inn, to say nothing of stabling and horse feed. The final breakdown of the roadhouse in Squire Allen's hands dated from the time when the stage company, influenced, as was believed, by the evil arts and persuasions of this same burnt-out Mr. Harmon, transferred their stopping place to East Quonset, and thereby incurred Hepsy's everlasting resentment. Barbara had always cherished a dream of getting the stages back, and her quick wit saw at once in Hepsy's news something that might be important for herself. "'What will the stage people do now? Has Jed any idea?' she asked, trying to keep her face and voice free from excitement. "'Nobody knows yet, though I know very well what they ought to do. They're mighty close-mouthed folks about their affairs, but there's one good thing.' Jed is going over tomorrow with a load of hay for the barn at the depot, and he'll see John Bradley, 
and perhaps he'll say something. I don't think much of that Bradley man, though. It was all his doings that they changed over to East Quasset. If he hadn't found fault with our dinners, they'd never have thought of it. It's natural that people should like good dinners, observed Barbara, temperately, and I'm afraid Grandpapa grew rather careless about such things towards the last. Dr. Gregory says he did. Never mind, Hepsy. If they give us another try, we'll do better. Two days later, Hepsy brought further news. Honey, dear, it's so funny that I can't help laughing, but them stage folks, they are planning to surprise you. Jed, he heard John Bradley and Mr. Billings, that's the manager, a-talking. And Mr. Billings, he said he didn't see but that they must try the corners again till the East Quasset house was fixed up and the barns rebuilt. And that John, he made all sorts of objections. And Mr. Billings told him it was the only place, and he's heard things were better than they used to be. And the upshot was that John concluded to try it, provided it could be a sort of surprise. I don't want the house all slicked up till we've made the agreement, and then left to run down again, he says. I'll take my own time, and send no word, and see what they're like. If it's any kind of tavern, they'll have some kind of a dinner, and I'll see what sort of one it is before I commit myself. They didn't know Jed was near enough to hear. But, Hepsy, this is important. I'm really obliged to Jed for giving us this warning. You see, we have no one in the house just now, and it might easily have happened that there was not dinner enough for them. What day are they coming? Did Jed hear? No, Miss Berry, that's the worst of it. John Bradley didn't name any day. Well, it must be before long, because there's no other inn that is at all convenient for them. That's true, Miss Barbara, and we'd better keep sort of ready all the time, I think. We will. Now let us see. Mrs. Owenson says you make the best chowder in the world, Hepsy, and that nothing can equal your chicken pies. Suppose you make a beautiful big one at once. That will keep, and can be heated in half an hour, and I will get a fish every morning for a chowder, and we will have some apple quince tarts made, and one of those milky rice puddings, which can have an orange marmalade and souffle top put on in five minutes, I have just thought of a contrivance by which we can secure twenty minutes' notice before we are surprised. The contrivance was nothing more nor less than a field glass inherited from a sailor great uncle. Armed with this, Barbara each morning perched herself on the edge of the scuttle which topped the main building just at the hour when the stage was presumably due at the parting of the crossroads ten miles away. The first day saw the horses' heads speeding toward East Quasset but on the second, the shining blinkers swept the curve toward the corners, and Barbara ran down to give warning. Hurry, Hepsy, they are coming. Twenty minutes' notice is worth a good deal under such circumstances. The chicken pie and the tarts flew into the oven. The chowder, already prepared, was set bubbling by the time that John Bradley drew up his team before the door and called, in a lordly way, House! I say, house! confident that there could have been no warning given, no possibility of fixing up a dinner and deceiving him into arrangements which he should afterward repent. Things were in a forward condition. At just the right interval, not too long and not too soon, Hepsy answered his call, and simultaneously a boy appeared to take the horses. "'Are you the woman of the house?' demanded the sturdy driver, taking stock rapidly, meanwhile, of the improved condition of the premises. No, sir, Miss Allen owns it now. I'm the housekeeper. Oh, the old man's daughter, is it? No, sir, his granddaughter. Well, I hope you and she keep it better than the old squire used to. There's five passengers for dinner today. It's just for once, cautiously. And give us your regular dinner, if you please. Can't wait for no extra cooking. Hepsy looked hard at the shrewd old fellow. She understood his tactics perfectly. Yes, sir, she answered promptly. It will be ready in half an hour. All right, and you understand it's just for once. 
We don't want to make a regular arrangement anywheres. As yet. I think that's fixed pretty well, meditated the wily Jehu. There can't be much of the outside of the cup platter business done in half an hour, so it'll be a fair sample this time, and as I find it, I'll go buy it. How he found it may be surmised from the fact that, after topping off several helps of everything with a second plateful of the orange marmalade rice pudding, he boldly marched into the kitchen and demanded to see Miss Allen. Deal with principles is my motto, he informed Hepsy. Barbara, who had rather expected this demand, was in her own sitting room, with everything in perfectly nice order. I do not know on what principle she had put on her most becoming gown, but it was a judicious act. Many a business transaction between man and woman has turned upon the choice of a ribbon or the fit of a pair of gloves. She was very serious and businesslike with John Bradley, but at the same time courteous and pleasant. That important personage was taken much aback at finding her so young and well-favored, but he had a soft heart under his bluff manner, and a daughter at home not far from Barbara's age. She did not find him at all difficult to deal with, and before they parted a bargain was struck. The stage was to stop for dinner at the Barbary Bush for two months, on trial. After that, further arrangements might be made, or might not, according to circumstances. "'If you can do better elsewhere than you can here, you will be quite right to change,' remarked the young landlady, quietly. "'But I don't think you can, Mr. Bradley. I am very anxious to keep your custom, and think, by taking pains, I can please you. You must tell me if anything needs to be altered, and I will do my best to make it all right.' John's account of the interview to his employers was as follows. I want no ways prepared to find such a young creeter keeping a tavern, but she's got a head on her shoulders, sir, I can tell you. Was you satisfied with your dinner, says she? I was that, says I. And mind you, Mr. Billens, it wa'n't no dinner fixed up for the occasion, for she couldn't have had the least idea we was coming. Deluded John. Very well, says she. You can count on a dinner as good as that every time you do us the honor to dine at the Barbary Bush. Those were her very words. I never see a house so improved as it is. All done over ship-shape, and as tight as a trivet. And she meant exactly what she said, Mr. Billings. I could tell that by the look in her eye. A pause. I was sorry when I come home to take charge of things to find that we had lost your custom, says she. My grandfather... My dear grandfather, I think that is what she called him, was old and failing toward the last, and I can understand that things may not have been quite as they ought to be. But now that I'm in this place, all that shall be changed. If you'll just mention when you're not suited, I'll see that it's made right. If the complaint's reasonable, says she. She's a real lady, Mr. Billings, and has a pretty way with her, she has, and she knows how things ought to be. I don't often see folks that come to the house, she told me, because I'm rather young for such a place, and my old housekeeper does better than I should. But of course I shall always see you, when it's necessary, Mr. Bradley, because I want to feel sure that you're suited. So it ended with my making an agreement for two months, and then, if Mr. Harmon's ready, we can move back if we like, or we can stay on at the corners if we'd rather. I hope it strikes you as the right thing to do, Mr. Billings." "'It strikes me that your young woman with the pretty manners "'has had very much her own way with you in the matter,' "'remarked the manager of the stage line, with a laugh. "'However, if you're suited, I am. "'The Corners is every bit as handy for us as East Quasset. "'And if this Miss Allen gives you good dinners, "'you can fix it any way you like, John. "'I'm satisfied.' "'So the stage came back to Quasset Corners, "'and came to stay, for, by the time the two months' agreement was up, Barbara, partly by the excellence of her dinners and partly by her pleasant way, had so completely conquered and subjugated John Bradley that he would have resented and resisted any idea of removing back to East Quasset. He became one of the young landlady's firmest friends and upholders, and to the end of his days spoke of her as the sensiblest girl he had ever come into contact with. "'She's got a head like a man, sir,' he would asseverate, and that's more than you can say of every man that comes along. And she is as kind as a woman ought to be, too, 
and knows how to manage and keep herself pretty. In fact, sir, she's a rare avis, as the professors say. With the coming back of the stage, a long reign of prosperity inaugurated itself at the Barbary Bush. With every month its custom increased and its reputation. Mrs. Owenson acted as an unpaid agent to advertise it among her Boston friends. People discovered how pleasant it was, and how near and convenient, and it became a little fashion to go there. People came who were tired or needed a short change. People came who had been ill, and people came for the fun of it. Party after party succeeded each other all that winter and spring. It proved a cold season, with an unusual amount of snow and sleighing, but Sidney Owenson organized more than one frolic among his friends, with an early supper and dance at the inn and a moonlight drive back to town. Barbara could hear the gay voices and laughter from the pantry where she stood, helping old Hepsy to wash the plates and glasses. Twice she was aware that her school friend, Ellen Sears, was of the party, but she made no sign, and Ellen never guessed she was near. These evenings, when people of her own age were making merry under her roof and she had no part in the pleasure, were the hardest she had to bear, and still shut away from the natural joys of youth, and to be so lonely and isolated and different, as Barbara told herself. Sidney Owenson, who always managed by hook or crook to get a word with her on these occasions, found her once stirring eggnog over a spirit lamp, with her face stained with tears, and was much dampened in soul thereby. But the tears were soon dried, and Barbara was her resolute, helpful self again, ready for her daily task, and content, so long as things went well. Just once she relaxed her determination to keep in the background and the shade, and she repented it afterward. It was during the second winter, when Sidney got up a sleighing carnival in masks and fancy dresses, matronized by one of his sisters, and persuaded Barry to put on one of her great-grandmother's gowns, with a little black mask and hood, and slip in among the company for one dance with him. No one guessed who she was, and the waltz with Sid was very nice but the brief little taste of gaiety seemed to unsettle and disturb her, and she made firm resolutions against doing such a thing again. It was stealing a pleasure under false pretenses, she said to herself. Those people would have been shocked had they known who it was, Mrs. Mallinson particularly. I hope they will never know, but nothing shall induce me to be so foolish again. Nothing. And nothing ever did. The third winter was a mild one, with almost no snow, but this mattered less, for the promoter of the sleighing frolics was absent. Sidney Owenson, under strong pressure of persuasion from his mother, was in Europe, gone for two years to finish his medical studies. It had not been easy to induce him to go. He had said a good deal about the projected course at the John Hopkins and the clinics at the Massachusetts General and Mrs. Owenson had been vaguely conscious of something behind these arguments which made her uneasy. She was fond of Barbara, but she had begun to blame herself as the cause of a proquintity which might lead to a grave social mistake, and she was glad and relieved to have her favorite son away for a time. When his two years' course was nearly over, she went out herself for the summer. Then she persuaded Sidney to remain for a special course at Vienna, where she established herself also— so that it was well on in the fourth year before he came home. When he did, Barbara was no longer at Quasset Four Corners. All had gone prosperously there. The inn was fairly established in favor and fashion, and Barbara rarely had empty rooms to complain of. Gradually she added to her staff of assistants, so that less of the personal fatigue fell upon herself, and practice made all easier. Her neighbors respected her as successful, and she had won their liking by many friendly acts and services. The Barbary Bush had grown remunerative. Not only did it pay its way, but a surplus remained at the year's end, which, acting under Dr. Gregory's directions, she invested judiciously in such a way that, at the close of the fifth year, she had far more than repaid herself the sum borrowed from her little capital. Dr. Gregory was very proud of her, and disposed to take most of the credit of the experiment as the result of his advice at the outset. And Barbara, though she knew better, smiled when he did so, and never contradicted him. It was a cheap pleasure, 
which she was quite willing that the kind little doctor should indulge in, to suppose himself the architect of her good fortune. Grandmama has been comfortable all this time, and kept the home she was used to, and never missed anything, she reflected. That is the main thing. That is what I did it for. Oh, how glad I am that I did it, in spite of everything. How glad I am that I decided to keep the house. It was the only thing to do. At the end of the fifth year, Mrs. Allen died suddenly and painlessly. She had never fully recovered her consciousness after the shock of her husband's death, but she was serene and patient, easily amused as a child, and she always knew Barbara and had a smile for her as she came and went. Her death left a sad blank in the house and seemed to remove the reason for continuing there. For her sake the burden had been assumed. Now the task was ended, and the burden seemed doubly heavy with the impulse of duty forever taken from it. And, just then, as we say, forgetting that these just-thens of which we speak are prepared for by a long series of small, unrecorded acts and efforts, an offer, alike magnificent and unexpected, came from the landlord of one of the great city hotels for the purchase of the Barbary Bush. Its advance in popularity had attracted his attention. He had looked into the matter and made up his mind that he could use the inn advantageously as a sort of country annex to his own establishment. He offered twenty thousand dollars for the place, with all its belongings, and Barbara, after talking the matter over with Dr. Gregory, made haste to cinch the bargain. For he might change his mind, she said, and then where would I be? Nobody else would ever give me so much, I am very sure, and, to tell the truth, doctor, I am longing to get away. Since Grandmama died, I have felt hopelessly not at home in the house. "'What will you do, now that you have enough to live on?' demanded the doctor. "'I'm not quite sure, but I think something which you will consider absolutely foolish.' "'I don't believe it. You couldn't do anything absolutely foolish. You're too like your great Uncle James for that.' "'Well, he left all his money to the Board of Foreign Missions instead of to his relations.' That seems to me pretty foolish, considering how much some of us have needed it since. But you asked me what I am going to do. I have almost decided to go to Paris and stay a year, doctor. Great Scott! What for? Isn't America good enough for you? Yes, indeed, and too good. But I want a year's study and a year's change— I don't propose to sit idle all the rest of my life because I have a few hundred a year to live on. I shall want to go to work again presently. And, meantime, Paris is a reasonable place to be in, as I shall manage it, and I can get hold of all manner of things there which will be of use to me by and by. Well, I suppose you know best what you want. If it were any other girl but you, I should call it a wild goose chase— but you have a head on your shoulders, and I've found that you generally come out right, whatever you do. Thank you, doctor. I consider that a great compliment. Barbara sailed for Arvra only a week before the Owensons came home from their long wanderings. It was not many days before Sidney made time to run out to Quasset Corners. He returned perplexed and discomfited. Mother, he demanded, did you know that the Barbary Bush had been sold, and that fellow at the Westmoreland was running it as an adjunct to his hotel? Why, yes, of course. A Barbara wrote about it, said Mrs. Owenson, trying to speak naturally and unconsciously. Why on earth didn't you mention it to me? Didn't I? Well, the letter came when we were in the hurry of leaving Paris, and, let me see— Yes, you were away at Etriette with Arthur Norman at the time. It seems curious that you should forget to speak of it. There was the voyage home, too. Plenty of time to talk over things. Why did she sell it? You can't think how differently the place looks. All the same things are there, but the soul is gone. Old Mrs. Allen died, and... Old Mrs. Allen dead? Why, mother... "'That's another thing you never mentioned. "'When did she die?' "'It was all in the same letter, I think, Sid. 
replied Mrs. Owenson, somewhat nervously. And, as I tell you, you were away. Mrs. Allen died in March, and I think it was last month that the house was sold, not many weeks ago, at all events. And where did Barbara go? Where is she now? Halfway to Paris, I suppose. She sailed on the Champagne last Wednesday. Are you in earnest? Paris? What should she go there for? I am not quite sure about her plans, but she means to study French and qualify herself for some sort of work. She has enough to live on comfortably, for the inn brought a good price, she wrote me, and I hope she will do well, for she is really a very nice girl, ended Mrs. Owenson unguardedly. Now, don't let us talk about her any more at present, for I want to settle with you about the Dublin plans. Are you going to spend the summer with me? I hope so. The better part of it, I fancy, replied Sidney, looking kindly but quizzically at his mother's flushed face. And, as you say, we won't talk any more about Barbara Allen, at present. The subject was dropped, and Mrs. Owenson hoped it had passed from her son's mind. But when, the following spring, he suddenly announced that he must run over to Europe for two months' study of microscopy in an advanced branch, her apprehensions revived. Whether they were justified or not does not belong rightfully to this story, which concerns only the five years' struggle of a brave little maiden under a hard urgency and her final success. But so much I may say, that there is in Boston now a Mrs. Sidney Owenson, whom people find particularly nice and attractive, but about whose history little seems known beyond the fact that she was an orphan, and Dr. Owenson married her in Paris. Her name by an odd coincidence, is Barbara, and Mrs. Owenson, who seems very fond of her daughter-in-law, calls her Barry. Do you recollect an old childish game which we all used to play in our youth, where the little players with linked hands dance round and round the barberry bush, all but one left out, one who is kept outside the rest, till, at a given signal, they all sing, make a ring and draw her in, and kiss her when you get her in and then her turn comes. Perhaps that was the way in which Sidney Owenson played his game, and disregarding fears and objections, his mother's anxieties and his sister's warnings, chose for himself a lonely little player who was not having her fair share of the fun, drew her in, and made her happy with the rest. If it were so, he showed his cleverness, for his Barbara is quite as good at the game as any one, and is made welcome by the other merrymakers, as a good player always will be, and to him, as for her, work and sport are both made lighter from the fact that they share them with one another. End of The Barbary Bush The Barbary Bush and Eight Other Stories for Girls by Susan Coolidge The Lady in White Satin the lady in white satin was not a real lady, but a portrait, which for more than half a century had hung above the white panel wainscot of the entrance hall in old Carberry Mansion at Newburyport. It hung just where the sun on summer noons, streaming through the small panes, which made a geometrical pattern above and on each side of the door, sought out and glorified its dim, rich tints and lit as if with life the high-bred face whose transparent fairness and deeply shadowed gray eyes were full of pathetic sadness it was not the portrait of a maiden or of a triumphant court beauty though the air of courts seemed suggested by the bearing of the graceful figure but of a youthful matron who had tasted both sides of life and had learned to look with apprehension on its pleasures as well as on its pains a mist of unshed tears seemed to soften the wistful eyes from which breathed a subtle and melancholy appeal the dress was beautifully painted after the style of sir peter lillet with gray pearly shadows and high glancing lights a great blood-red ruby 
dropped from each ear and was relieved against the white neck on the left hand were three rings one set with a ruby and one with a large pearl the right hand held a yellow rose no name was signed upon the canvas which was enclosed in a massive though tarnished frame of gilded wood pictures of this quality are not common in the smaller new england towns still no one talked or thought much of the carberry portrait for one thing it was an old story it had always been there the young people said they were used to it that a history was connected with it was dimly understood but the history was an old thing also and was half forgotten now occasionally some stray artist or connoisseur would come along ask to see the picture and rave about its technique or its expression awakening thereby a little fresh flutter of interest in the minds of its owners but as a general thing the sad-eyed lady in white satin looked down unheeded from her place above the wainscoting as the tide of family life ebbed and flowed through the door across the hall the prosperity of the carberry family was of nautical origin old captain carberry grandfather of the present squire had been one of the most daring and successful of merchant traders in the palmy days of newburyport beginning with a single small brig personally conducted his ventures had gradually swelled into a fleet ships of his sailed into greenland seas in search of whales they went to barbados after sugar and negroes to china for tea to europe for wine and oil and silks a lucky skipper his mate had dubbed him in his early days and a lucky ship owner as he continued to the last storms and waves dealt gently with him tempest passed him by his crews never mutinied nor did his captains peculate for the keen instinct which was his by birthright judged men in character with the same unerring certainty with which it dealt with the ship's timbers and lines of build he was a man of integrity as well and of singular cheerful kindliness and his prosperity was less resented by his neighbors than would have been the case with almost any other merchant in newburyport with all luck their failings and unintermittent good luck in a family is a failing the carberries were always popular people percy's or persistent as her father sometimes called her cared more for the old portrait than did any of the others when she was quite a little child she liked to stand before it and make believe that its eyes followed her about as the eyes of a friend might the portrait and she were akin she felt it but even when percy's knew little of the old story which was seldom spoken of and for good and sufficient reasons never fully explained by the elders of the family persistent was father's daughter as mrs carberry was wont to say and hetty mehitable was hers parents sometimes make these subdivisions among their children claiming superior share or ownership in this one or that according as they appeal to taste or affection or reproduce the individual type of which we are all conscious and which we value because it is our own hetty bright and alert given to the activities of service like martha of old was privy counsellor to her mother in all domestic affairs it was she who ordained the arrangement of the teacups and chocolate pots for supper parties who chose the new coverings for the parlor sofa and knew the moment when the currants are disposed to jelly and peaches are to can but it was percy's whom the squire called 
Percy's had a happy knack of being within call, if he wanted his gloves mended or his umbrella found. It was she who went to him to the door and kissed him goodbye when he started for his office, who sorted and tidied his writing table, brought his slippers when he came in tired, and never forgot the fresh flower which he liked to see in the little glass above his books and papers. Squire Carberry was fond of flowers, and he loved his little Percy's in quite a particular fashion. There was a tinge of romance in his feelings for her, and she could do pretty much what she liked with him. Other children there were in the ample family fold, sons out west, a married daughter or two, a boy at Harvard, and a little Nan at her daily school. But with them our story has nothing to do. Percy's and Hetty were the ruling powers of the moment, as their elder brothers and sisters had been in their day. The Carberries were sitting at breakfast one morning in the big square dining room when the maid brought in some letters. Pshaw! said the squire after ineffectual struggle with the contents of one of his letters what hands these frenchmen do write here percy's see if you can read this for me percy's knowledge of french was not beyond that of the average new england girl but she contrived to make out that papa's correspondent mr cardillac asked to leave to introduce his notice to m henry de Cepre, a lawyer of bordeaux who was about to visit the united states to look after certain business interests in which his the writer's firm was concerned and about which he desired greatly to avail himself of squire carberry's valuable advice and knowledge of the premises commending him therefore to the good will of their esteemed correspondent he begged leave to sign himself respect the movement p cardillac for duvel cardillac et compagnie hm said the squire a french lawyer is he well we shall see what the fellow is like when he comes i wonder if he is old or young queried hetty elderly said her father decisively they don't send young lawyers off on business of consequence in France any more than other places, I reckon. I'll take another cup of coffee, Anne, if you please. And Percy's, you may give me that little end of the Johnny Cake. Let me butter it for you, Papa. Percy spoils you awfully, John, said his wife as she handed him his cup. You're just a big baby where she is concerned. I can stand it, remarked the squire cheerfully. It does her good, and it doesn't hurt me a bit. We understand each other, don't we, Percy's? Yes, Papa, handing him the daintily prepared morsel. Now, just one little red radish to eat with it, don't you think? I don't mind if I do. Now, the last mouthful disposed of, I'm off. We shall have to ask this Frenchman to dinner, or something, when he comes, I suppose, Anne. Oh, certainly. He ought to be asked to stay with us, I think. It won't be for more than a day or two, will it? A day or two? Why, I was calculating on getting rid of him between trains, remarked her less hospitable spouse. Well, that's just as you like. We have room enough if you want to invite him only. Let me know when to expect him. Oh, it'll be a week or two. Yet before he turns up, there's time enough to look about us, said the squire cheerfully as he pushed back his chair. The squire was wrong in his reckoning. The very next day, in the middle of the morning, came this note by the office boy. Dear Anne, Frenchman here. Seems a good sort of fellow. Have asked him to dine and sleep. He speaks English. This last clause took a weight off good Mrs. Carberry's mind as she hurriedly set about preparations for the unexpected guest. 
It's so provoking, the way things always happen, she lamented to Hetty. Now, if it had been tomorrow, the fishman would have been along, and we could have had some salmon. These Frenchmen are used to many courses, I believe. Do you suppose he can eat strawberry shortcake? If not, he's such a goose that we won't feel sorry for him, responded Hetty, as she heaped the crimson fruit lightly on the crust and powdered it with sugar. Don't worry, mother. There's some splendid cream, and I've taken out the olives and the ginger and the Albert biscuit, and Percy's has trimmed the lettuce with nasturtiums, and it looks as pretty as a pitcher. He'll get on well enough, however eminent he is, and you must just go upstairs and cool off and be all ready to meet him. But he and Flurry are not so easily disposed of, and both Hetty and her mother bore traces in their flushed cheeks of the morning's work when they came down to greet the guest. Percy's alone was exactly as usual. The advent of the elderly stranger had not quickened her pulse by a beat and in the simple gown of white woolen, with just one touch of rose color at the throat. She looked cool and fresh and innocent, as one of those slender streaked bell blossoms, which New England springs call back to shady woolen coverts, as she glanced up to acknowledge the introduction of Monsieur de saint Pré from Bordeaux into the circle of her acquaintance. But with the glance came a quick blush, and a dimple formed in the smooth cheek, which would have been a smile had it dared. For, behold, Papa's elderly lawyer was not elderly at all. He was a slender young man, not over twenty-seven or eight to all appearance, with southern fire sparkling in dark eyes, and southern sweetness softening a firm mouth and chin. He was an attractive face, and there was such evident admiration in the look which meant hers that Percy's felt herself blush again. Women are quick to read such looks. It is part of their equipment for the battle of life, and in its way, not an unuseful one. The typical Puritan maiden, Henry de Saint-Pré, said to himself, pure and shy and fair. She realizes the ideals of the American poets, a flower growing from the rocky soil. What eyes! They could never have felt a shadow or guessed at a stain. Thus his thoughts went, as he replied courteously to Mrs. Carberry's hospitable questionings, in English so good as to surprise them all. It is because my mother was English, he explained, my father was carried to England when a little child, and remained there till grown to a man's estate. When he went back to France, my mother went with him. And you? asked Hetty. No, mademoiselle. My parents had many children, but all died in infancy except myself. I was not born till after my father's death. I never saw him. I am the last of my race. A silence fell after this remark. It was broken by Mrs. Carberry. John, I think that Monsieur de saint Pré would like to go up to his room before dinner. Suppose you show him the way. The bell will ring in a few minutes now. What a pleasant young man he is, she said after he left the room. I don't seem to mind him at all. It would have been hard on us, though, if we had been obliged to speak French. I quite feel to take to him. The dinner from soup to strawberry cake proved a success, and the intelligence of the guest, his good manners and readiness to be pleased with things American, continually grew upon the liking of his hosts. He admired the tooth cornice of the old dining room, the high, white-painted chimney-piece, with its pattern of carved fans and conch shells, and was suitably impressed when told that Lafayette, on his second visit to this country, 
had dined at the table around which they now sat and i must show you his coffee cup said mrs carberry who had quite got over her dread of the foreign visitant no one has been allowed to drink out of it since it is just preserved in the family as a relic if you'll take any interest in our colonial history you'll like to see this old chart of newsbury harbor said the squire as they passed through the hall on their way back to the parlor it's a curious thing you'll notice he paused for his guest was not attending to him he had come to a sudden stop before the lady in white satin and was staring at it with an intensity of bewilderment and surprise with no abstract love of art however profound could explain what's the matter asked the squire carberry it's only began monsieur de sempre in a confused tone that i'm taken by astonishment overwhelmed how do you say it bouleversé i cannot understand how it is that here your house i find a portrait of my grandmother your grandmother mais eh, monsieur sans doute or my eyes deceive me utterly it is impossible or it seems so that it should be here in america on the walls of a stranger's house but that so wonderful a resemblance could exist by accident would be stranger still is this picture known to you monsieur have you its history i know nothing about it said the squire dryly not at all may i ask what makes you think it is the portrait of your grandmother monsieur de sempre you could never have seen it before for it has hung just where it is in the house of mine for nigh upon seventy years no monsieur naturally i have never seen it but i have known that such a picture existed and has been lost and the miniature than they that i have with me you shall see what a marvellous resemblance it is which has overcome me he darted upstairs as he spoke and in another moment returned holding in his hand a case of tarnished leather which he opened and held out to persis who chanced to be nearest him her exclamation of surprise brought the whole family about her papa it's wonderful it's our white satin lady herself there could be no doubt about it there was the same pensive droop of the head the same wistful eyes and delicately modelled features the same softly sad expression with just the change which a year or two added to the age and a different dress might produce the miniature showed the person only as far as the bust and the upper part of the arms the faintly indicated gown was of pale olive with a handkerchief of yellowish lace there was just the hint of a necklace but in the ears yes there were the same ruby drops as in the larger picture they could not be mistaken squire carberry scrutinized both pictures steadily and gravely you have told us that you are the last of your race he said what was your grandfather's name the marquise de saint pre monsieur replied the young frenchman rather haughtily for his host tone was abrupt and judicial where did he live monsieur we are of the zironde the chateau was but a few miles from bordeaux and what became of them ma foi what became of the rest of the french noblesse in the terror he shared their fate monsieur carberry he and my grandmother their two daughters with their eldest son and his wife and my uncle the seigneur de saint algen all went to the guillotine in the same cart the executioners were merciful that day they did not separate them my father a child in arms was the sole one to escape he was hidden by the peasant nurse in whose charge he was and later taken to england the chateau was burned to the ground by a mob of saint colotte and it has always been supposed that in the fire the portrait which i 
find here perished. And when what year did all this take place? In November 1793, Monsieur. But, you will pardon me, I fail to see the purpose of these questions. The squire exchanged a look with his wife. You will see presently, he said in a friendlier tone. I too have a story to tell, Monsieur de saint -Pré. It was needful that I should satisfy myself about certain particulars before beginning it with you. Let us go into the parlor, and you shall hear it. Girls, you may stay if you like, and Anne, please give the orders that we are not to be interrupted. If any visitors come before I have got through. He led the way across the hall, followed by an amazed group. This was the story which the squire told them. My grandfather, Jabez Carberry, was a sea captain, so he began. When quite a young man, he sailed for the coast of France, in charge of a small trading brig named the Sarah Jane, whose owners lived in this town. She was loaded with rum and sugar, and he was to bring back, in exchange, an assorted cargo of French commodities. The laws against immigration were very strict just then, and all the vessels in the ports were just jealously watched by the agents of the government. The day before Sarah Jane was to start for her return voyage, a boat came off from shore in the darkness of the early morning. Two gentlemen were on board. They brought a number of cases and boxes with them, and they asked for a private interview with the captain. He took them down to his cabin, and after locking the door, they offered him a large price to take them and their families with him and land them in New York. He refused. His duty obliged him to do so. To consent was to risk the confiscation of the brig and her cargo, and he was responsible to his owners at home. But the gentleman pleaded urgently. They were men of stately presence, he said, men of rank evidently, and they told him that his answer meant life or death, not to themselves only, but to the delicate women and little children. At last, against his convictions, he yielded, and consented to receive them, on the condition that they should come on board at the moment of sailing, which was to be twelve o'clock the following night. Nothing should induce him to wait. A half hour after that time, he told them, and they promised to be punctual. My grandfather never knew the names of these gentlemen, Monsieur de saint -Pré. They thanked him eloquently for his compliance, but they gave no names, and he asked none. In those days, it was safer not to know. One of them deposited in his hands a considerable sum of money, for this my grandfather insisted upon giving a receipt, but the gentleman tore the paper in pieces and dropped it overboard before he left. He did not need it, he said, and the paper might endanger the captain, which was quite true. The property they had brought was hoisted on board, and in the thick dusk the strangers rode silently away. This was on the 2nd of October, 1793. At midnight, the Sarah Jane had her cargo stowed. The clearance papers had been signed, and she seemed all ready for her start. The tide served. The night was very dark. Everything seemed favorable for the fugitives, but they did not appear. In spite of his declaration, my grandfather delayed. The evident anguish of dread felt by his visitors had so impressed him that he could not bear to sail away and cut off their last chance of escape. Hour after hour he delayed, making this pretense, and that with his crew. At length, just at dawn, he ventured on the hazardous step of rowing ashore in a boat, hoping to get some clue to the fate of his passengers. He found the city in a ferment of excitement. People were avoiding each other, or whispering in the corners, no one dared to speak plainly, but
but from hints and half sentences my grandfather gathered that during the night the agents of the revolutionary tribunal had made a swoop upon the city and arrested a number of suspects the foredoomed victims were already on their way to paris my grandfather wasted no time he got back to his ship as soon as possible and sailed without a moment's delay on his own responsibility he touched at new york and there he deposited the frenchman's property in the custom house as they had named that port his hope was that if later they succeeded in effecting their escape from france they might seek and claim it there there was no name on any of the cases only on each a small cross had been traced in red paint the money my grandfather brought home with him what else could he do with it he made a full explanation of his conduct to his employers who was justified by them in what he had done on each of his succeeding voyages to france and he made five he visited bordeaux and did all that was possible without risk to identify and trace the owners of the sum in his hands failing to obtain any clue whatever to them he at last after waiting more than three years ventured to make use of the money as his own he invested in the trading ventures of various sorts and it laid in the foundation of the very considerable fortune which he afterwards accumulated but the pitcher asked the listener i am coming to that five years after these events my grandfather happened to be in new york and his occasions took him to the custom house one of the periodical sales of the baggage and merchandise which had remained unclaimed for a certain length of time and were advertised in vain was going on on a certain case indicated by the auctioneer my grandfather recognized the frenchman's mark the red cross and he bid it in the hope that the opportunity might yet come of restoring it to him or his family the case contained this picture which you have seen this afternoon monsieur de sempre it has hung in this house ever since that was nearly seventy years ago it is the most wonderful story i have ever listened to in my life ejaculated the young frenchman it is not quite done continued the squire of this money which i told you my grandfather used in his business he kept a strict account he never regarded it as his own but as capital loaned him against his will by a party or parties unknown and to be accounted for whenever the proper time should come in making his last will he appended to it a detailed account of the circumstances under which it came into his possession he had left strict directions to his heirs coupled with his curse upon any of them who should disregard or evade the behest that if ever the rightful owners of the property should turn up and prove their claim the whole sum together with reasonable interest for the use of it should be duly refunded to them monsieur your grandfather had a noble heart said henry de st pre you had the right to be proud of so worthy an ancestor but of the money no one could justly claim it with so long an interval it is rightfully yours not so fast said squire carberry smiling for as you know it it is the property of somebody else of which you are disposing in such high-minded fashion it is not distinctly proved as yet that it was your grandfather who had visited my grandfather's ship when that is done it will be time enough to settle what should be done about the money in question i have told you the story which for obvious reasons we have preferred to keep secret not wishing to swell the national immigration list with a long succession of would-be claimants i have told it to you i say because there is a fair presumption mind i only say a presumption that you may be concerned in it 
you and i are equally interested in finding out the truth of the matter we will work together to that end if you are agreed take your time monsieur de sempre collect your proofs and when you bring them to me we will speak more at length as to this business meanwhile consider as us old friends and come to our house as convenience dictates your grandmother's portrait if so it be that she is your grandmother will always be ready to give you a welcome authority and kindness were mingled in the squire's tone and checked the young frenchman's expression of gratitude while irresistibly exciting them it was nearly nightfall before the conversation came to an end isn't it exactly like something in a story-book asked hetty of percy's as they went upstairs to bed only think yesterday morning we did not know that there was such a person in the world as monsieur de sempre and now we seem to have known him always and all these years we've had his grandmother's picture hanging in the hall it beats all the novels we ever read doesn't it yes said percy briefly she was not half so disfuse about her emotions as hetty but her heart was full of strange surprise she had always been more intimate with the lady in white satin than any of the rest of the family and now here was her grandson life seemed greatly enhanced in interest during the next few months to the carberry family henry de sempre came and went gradually acquiring the foothold of an intimate friend in the house the business on which he had come to america detained him for a number of weeks during which he had frequent occasion for visiting newburyport he seemed unable to decide on anything without consultation with the squire which though naturally gratifying to the older lawyer called out from him to the opinion that the french system of legal education didn't seem to set young men as squarely on their feet as did the american it was just as well however he opined young men were ready enough to feel their oats all the world over a little modesty and deference to their elders wasn't a bad thing deluded squire if he had said deference to their elders daughters he would have hit the mark more exactly at length his business finished monsieur de sempre returned to france from whence came frequent letters to the squire detailing the steps which he was taking under the new light shed by the american disclosures to obtain proofs of the identity of his grandfather and uncle with the mysterious visitors of sarah jane proofs of the sort needed were hard to come by after the lapse of nearly three-quarters of a century the family papers had been burned with a chateau no witness survived who could testify to the circumstances at last after months of delay the opportune discovery was made among the documents of a convent at montehu of a narrative deposited there by abbe Gorales, formerly preceptor of the youthful marquis de saint pre in which while detailing his own narrow escape from arrest he incidentally mentioned the attempt on the part of his patron to leave the country on an american vessel and its frustration at the moment of accomplishment by the sudden seizure of the household by the agents of the tribunal and their consignment to the conciere armed with a copy of this document which though not exactly proof was of value as corroborative evidence henry de st pre returned to the united states the fair-minded squire asked no better than to be justified in his own convictions in feeling that all reasonable doubts were satisfied by the production of this paper he accepted the story as true and monsieur de st pre as the heir of the property so long and so jealously guarded for him by the hands of the strangers henry was received with a welcome like that which greeted the prodigal son 
the fatted calf was killed for him the best robes brought out of the press and an air of holiday pervaded the household one would have thought that the last of the saint press came over to confer a fortune upon the carberries rather than to despoil them of a large share of which they had always accounted rightfully their own the squire was ready with his accounts voluptuous as became the records of seventy years but henry refused to go into the details it was enough far more than enough that here in faraway new england this rare plant of high honor and honesty should have been budded and borne fruit and that after so many vicissitudes the lost fortune of the saint press should come back to them again thirty thousand francs was the sum deposited with captain carberry by the marquise de saint pre fifty thousand dollars was paid over by the squire to his grandson the saint press could hardly have put their money out for better advantage now we are quits declared the squire as he laid the check on the table before his guest and he drew a long breath as if the weight of responsibility and his grandfather's possible curse had rested heavily on his mind not so said henry de saint pre your conscience is fully acquitted my dear sir and your debt is fully paid the escutcheon of the carberry stands for evermore stainless and sans reproche as that of any chavier of old i thank you in the name of my family for this great gift money is not indifferent to me any more than other men but there are things that far outweigh it in worth and for this fortune which you bestow upon me i have no want my professional income already gives me more than my needs take back your check squire carberry and give me in its stead a far better thing the hand of mademoiselle Voltre fille whom i have learned to love with an ardent love and who has deigned to give me some regard in return he held out his hand to percy's as he spoke blushing deeply she gave him a timid hesitant glance at her father something in his face reassured her with shy and dainty grace she placed her fair little hand in the offered palm but let henry lead her to where the squire sat papa are you not vexed she asked anxiously no my little darling my little percy's never vexed with you he took her into his arms kissed her and for a few minutes held her so close without speaking the rest waited silently mrs carberry was in tears and a big drop formed in each of hetty's blue eyes and made the candles expand and dance until they looked like enormous rainbow-hued bubbles what must be must be said the choir at last do you really care so much for him percy's yes she whispered very well then take her henry except for the fact that you are a frenchman and live in france i'd rather give her to you than most men i know but take your money too i don't sell my child but i'll give her to you and see that you use my gift well the money will come in handily enough as you'll find when she and you set up housekeeping percy's don't go empty-handed either there's a shot or two still left in the old locker after paying off the saint pres but over and above that i'll make her and do a wedding present which you will value you shall have grandmother's picture next to percy's it shall be the most cherished of my possessions said the happy lover how can i thank you my dear squire dear madame by making percy's happy replied the squire laying his hand on henry's shoulder she's the best thing that i've got and it shows how well i think of you that i'm willing you should have her i never knew my father and my mother is little more than a dim remembrance to me said monsieur de sempre deeply moved but i am now doubly enriched 
Besides my bride, you give me other gifts, a father, a mother, sisters, brothers. I can only give you in return myself. But poor as it is, I am henceforward most truly in heart and service yours. That evening, after the others had gone upstairs, Percy's and her lover, who had lingered for a half an hour's talk over the fading fire, stole out into the hall for a good night look over their joint possession. The beams of the hall lamp fell full upon the fair, pathetic face, whose gaze seemed to confront them as with recognition. There she hung, the lovely, melancholy presence of old, and reading her lineaments in the light of history. There seemed a prophecy in the sadness, prescience of the bitter fate that awaited her youthful beauty. The sad eyes seemed to rest upon her sole descendants with yearning intensity. She has lived long among strangers, said Henry softly. Now she is coming to her own at last, to her native land, her home, a real home, which you and I will make for her, Mommy. Percy slipped her hand into his. He folded her into his arms, and their lips met in a long kiss. The fair lady in white satin looked down at the embrace and seemed to bend forward as if in blessing. End of the Lady in White Satin Chapter 7 of The Barbary Bush and Eight Other Stories for Girls This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jude Summers The Barbary Bush and Eight Other Stories for Girls by Susan Coolidge Chapter 7 Angels Unawares the early spring of our North America is a fickle and unscrupulous season. Sharp contrasts delight her. Sudden changes are her particular joy. To follow warm days with cold blizzards, to tempt the unwary out, minus overcoats and galoshes, and then overwhelm them with a worse-than-January rigor, to run the temperature up and down the gamut of degrees from zero to midsummer heat, seems to afford a peculiar satisfaction. And when, as sometimes happens, her victims drop by scores into untimely graves, behold this hypocritical early spring officiating as chief mourner, with a mist of tears, a face as sweet as one of Raphael's Madonnas, and hands heaped with votive blossoms. It is not to be wondered at, therefore, that three elderly and highly pecunious gentlemen of New York, who left that city on a morning in April under skies of tender blue-gray, suffused with golden sunshine, should have found themselves at half-past seven of the same evening struggling in a snowbank in the outskirts of a little village called Pot Haven. Of them it might truly be said that, going out to shear, they came back shorn. Their errand, a secret and informal conference with a financial magnate who chanced to be spending a week at his country seat, had to do with one of those mysterious redistributions of a great railroad property which puts money into the pockets of a few rich men and takes it from a myriad of poor ones. All had gone successfully, and chuckling over the idea of the coming coup, they had turned their horses' heads cityward, for tempted by the beauty of the weather, they had driven out in a light open trap, belonging to the younger of the three, only to find a snowstorm underway and steadily increasing. The wind was in their faces, the sleet fierce and cutting, the recollections of the road became confused by the blinding shower, and more than one wrong turn was made before fate landed them, with a broken pole, in a drift four or five feet deep, exactly where they did not know. Mr. Joy Rollins, the oldest and richest of the three men, fell under most. Mr. Saltonstall on top of him, and Perry Pug, owner of the team, crowned the heap. He was up in a moment, and with an activity worthy of a young man, tried to rein in the kicking and struggling horses. It proved a job beyond his strength, and seeing a house close by with a lighted window, he began to call for aid. Hello, house, house, I say, is there anybody there? Come and help me. 
the door opened, and Mr. Perry Pug uttered a forcible pshaw, for the form which appeared on the threshold was that of a woman, whose petticoats fluttered wildly in the wind as she leaned forward to see who called. "'Is there a man there?' shouted Mr. Pug, in extremity, as the off-horse made another desperate plunge. "'No,' came back the answer, in a clear youngish voice. "'There isn't, but I'm just as good. Hold on one minute, and I'll be there.' She ran rapidly in, and as rapidly returned, having thrust her feet into india-rubber boots and buttoned on a cloak. Another second, and her hand was on the bits of the nearest horse. "'I can hold him,' she panted. "'See if some of the others can't undo the harness.' Her hand seemed to possess some calming influence on the horse, for presently he stopped rearing. Mr. Pug's animal also quietened down, so that he might be able to help in the unharnessing. Soon the horses were free. "'Now,' said the woman, "'you and me'll have to lead them to the barn.' She pointed to a dark blotch in the grayness, and with confident steps led the way toward it. Perry Pug followed as best he might. He heard her slide a door back, then the rattle of a horse's feet on a wooden floor, but he saw nothing. "'I've tied that one,' said the woman, coming back. "'Here, give me the reins of yours. I know the way. Jim will fetch out a lantern directly.' "'Why didn't you send this Jim in the first place?' demanded Mr. Pug, with rather scant courtesy, as he followed the sound of the hoofs under cover, instead of coming out and getting wet yourself. "'Couldn't. He's not to home,' was the concise answer. "'Besides, he is too small, only twelve but he can carry a lantern, and he will when he comes in. She was hitching the horse as she spoke, seeming to find by instinct the stall and the ring in the darkness. "'We'd better get back to the others. It's snowing worse than ever,' she said, when the business was concluded. Mr. Saltons was trying to help Mr. Rollins on to his feet out of the debris of broken carriage, lap robes, and snow. "'Hurt Rollins?' asked Mr. Perry Pug rather anxiously. "'Not much. Shoulder is a little stiff, but it is nothing serious. I'm half frozen, however. Did you say there is a house near?' "'Yes, sir, and there's a good fire in a stove,' put in the invisible girl. "'You'd better all come and get warm. It's no use trying to do anything with the carriage till we can see. I'll just pick up the robes, though. It won't improve them to get soaked.' She heaped them in her arms as she spoke. "'This way, sir,' she said, and then noting a stagger on the part of Mr. Rollins, she put the other's strong young arm under his. "'Lean on me,' she said. "'You needn't be afraid. I'm as strong as a horse.' Strong she was. Mr. Rollins, who was more shaken up than he liked to confess, found himself half carried over the drifted sidewalk and up the two little steps of the porch, and deposited close to the fire in a comfortable rocking chair with calico cushions. He sank into it with a sigh of relief, while the girl, for a girl she proved to be, a girl of four or five and twenty, with a fresh but by no means pretty face and a strong, well-built figure, hastily pulled forward two other chairs, one with rockers and no arms, and the other with arms and no rockers. "'Now, before you sit down, you'd better let me give you a brush,' she said. "'You're all white with snow.' Suiting the word to the action, and the action to the word, she produced a stout whisk-broom, and in short space the snow was on the floor, then in a dustpan, then cast into the stove to melt at its leisure. "'I hope your feet are not damp,' she said to Mr. Joy Rollins, who, as the senior of the party, seemed particularly to attract her notice. "'You haven't got on any rubbers.' "'Rubbers were the last thing we thought of when we started,' said Mr. Perrypug. "'The morning was as dry and warm as could be.' "'Yes, so it was here, but I sort of mistrusted it, too. "'You take your shoes off, sir, and I'll put them to dry.' "'There never was such a quick girl. "'In one minute, as it seemed, she had the shoes drying "'and old Roland's feet on a cricket, with a blanket shawl to keep them warm. "'That's comfortable,' he said with a little groan of contentment. "'I'm greatly obliged to you. "'I wonder if I could have a cup of tea without putting you to a great deal of trouble.' "'Why, of course you could. "'And would it be possible, would it inconvenience you too much to, to, in fact, to give us all something to eat?' put in Mr. Salston gravely. "'We lunched earlier than usual, and, if I may judge my friends by myself, are ravenously hungry. "'It must be eight o'clock. "'By Jove,' consulting his watch, twenty past, and I forgot about the train. "'When does the next pass the station?' "'There isn't any more to-day.' except the owl at 11.35, and that doesn't stop. 
We must make it stop. I'll telegraph, Sulston. You authorize me, of course. Shall I sign your name? Mr. Sulston answered with a nod. But, said the girl in a bewildered tone, what difference would a name make? They don't stop whenever they're told, do they? Oh, my friend here is, has something to do with the management. They'll stop for him. And now, Miss, uh, he paused questioningly. Savary's my name. Nice Savary. That is, it's Berenice, but they all call me Nice. Ye gods and little fishes, said Perry Pug to himself. What a name for the nineteenth century. Outwardly, he bowed and went smoothly on. If you could, without too much trouble, give us a little supper. That's just what I've been trying to think out, said his hostess frankly. You see, Jim and me was going to have clams and dipped toast for tea. Clams and dipped toast, ambrosia, interrupted Perry Pug. Yes, but you see there are only a few clams, not half enough for you gentlemen if you're properly hungry. I wish I'd known, and I'd have dug more. We only... At that moment the door was flung open, letting in a fresh swirl of snow, and a boy with a tin pail in his hands. Oh, niece, I hope you haven't been scared about me. Me and old Brooks went out to the south oyster bed and got caught in the snow and couldn't get back. We had to scull all the way back against the wind, and you'd better believe... Here he took in the fact of the visitors, and relapsed into bashful and curious observation. What's in that pail? demanded his sister. Oysters. Uncle Brooks says... Never mind that now. Light the lantern and go out to the barn. See if two horses that is there are fastened up all right, and give them some hay. With an interrogating glance at their owner, then keep on to the telegraph with a message this gentleman will give you. And if Noble's gone home, go after him, and tell him it's important and got to go right off. Then stop at the tavern and tell Mr. Spires that the depot carriage must come here at eleven to take three gentlemen to the owl. Hurry, Jim, and by the time you get back there'll be something good and hot ready for you. Jim was evidently under excellent discipline. He went without a word. Nice hastened into the next room, which seemed a sort of supplementary kitchen, and presently smoke and a clatter of stove lids issued therefrom. Mr. Salston nodded to old Rollins and remarked, There's a girl with a head on her shoulders. I'd like to put her in charge of Section 10 in place of that dunce of a Royce. She'd make a first-rate railroad agent. Make the men stand around. The kind they used to have in the old colonial days, remarked his friend. I wish they'd take to manufacturing them again of the old patterns, as they do the chairs and sideboards. No nonsense about her. A smell of roasting coffee began to curl from the outer room, and presently Berenice reappeared. In a series of rapid dashes, she seemed to do everything in dashes. She pulled a round table to the fire, spread a napkin on it, arranged cups and saucers, and set a pile of plates to warm in the glow of the stove grate. The smells without grew more outrageously appetizing each moment, and the hunger of the amused and observant guests more imminent and keen. "'Here,' cried Berenice, darting in with a small covered dish, "'are the clams, what there is of them. There's just one small help apiece, but they'll keep you from quite starving till I can get the oysters fried. And here is your cup of tea, sir.' She placed a little brown pot by Mr. Rollins' side, set a plateful of crisp toast in the middle of the table, and vanished again. Mm, "'Heavens, what clams!' cried Mr. Perry Pug, after his first mouthful. They were of the small, round variety for which Pothaven is famous, and were indeed delicious, tender, very hot, and imbued with a concentrated flavor which seemed to be the result of some peculiar method of cooking. Alas, there were very few of them. When the last drop of their gravy was soaked up, the three hungry millionaires felt their appetites, but wetted for what was next to come. The next course consisted of oysters, crumbed and fried to perfection, and of small hot muffins of graham flour, crisp and flaky, which Nice called pop-downs. Also the best coffee that any of them had ever tasted. Following, there was a dish of apples, baked in some marvellous manner, which converted each into a half-jellied globe of translucent sweetness. The guests ate and praised with immense gusto, and their hostess beamed upon them while she served the edibles, with a sense of real satisfaction. "'Grandmother Savory taught me to cook,' she said, in answer to a question from old Rollins, who seemed ten years younger from the influence of this unexpected good cheer. "'Mother died when Jim was a year old, and I wasn't but thirteen. But Grandmother took us both. She was a natural-born cook, I've heard folks say, and she knew all the old ways, so I learned them, too. 
"'Dear me, I say she could make a chicken pot pie,' said Mr. Pug. "'I remember how good it used to taste when I was a boy.' "'Corn beef hash, perhaps such as my mother used to make,' ventured Salston. "'Chowder, not unlikely,' put in old Rollins. "'And whole cake like we had at home half a century ago.' "'Pork and beans with a dash of molasses,' suggested Salston. "'Cornbread, pandowdy, doughnuts,' added Perry Pug. Berenice nodded, smiling, to each of them in turn. "'Every one of them,' she replied. "'I never saw such corned beef hash as my grandmother's, or such beans, either. As for her pumpkin pies, no one ever began to touch them, unless it were me, and mine never quite came up to them, and they never will. I just wish you could stay long enough, and I would make you one, and a pot pie, too.' There was a cordial good will in her voice that was contagious. She was clearing away the supper things as she spoke, and Mr. Salston now brought a chair and begged her to be seated. "'You have tired yourself quite enough for us,' he said. "'Sit down and tell us a little about your plans and your brothers. What are you going to do with him? Is this house your own?' "'No. Grandmother had a five years' lease of it, which is all but up. We must leave it, and I'd like to leave Pothaven if I could. Jim's got to earn his living, and I must do something to help.' "'but I don't know much about anything except cooking, "'and no one wants that here. "'Everyone does their own work, you know. "'There's very little chance for anyone in such a place as this.' "'While she spoke, Mr. Joy Rollins was taking stock of her. "'For half a century his keen eyes had scrutinized "'the face of affairs and the souls of men. "'Very little escaped them. "'He noted the set of her head, "'the clear gaze of her honest eyes, "'the wholesome pink of lips and cheeks, and the air of vigorous capacity which accompanied her every movement. She is of the old kind, he thought. They don't make them now. It was nearing train time. Let me catch that tear in your overcoat together before you go, said Niece to Mr. Rollins. She did so, then fetched his shoes, dry and warm now, and helped him on with them and with the coat as simply as if he had been her father. Mr. Salston rolled up a bank bill and tried to slip it into her hand. "'What's that for?' she demanded sharply. "'It's a trifle in recompense for all the trouble you've taken for us,' he replied. "'To pay for it?' cried Berenice Savary, with a flash of her eyes. "'No, sir, that's not the way in our house. "'It wasn't much I could do, but such as it was you are kindly welcome to it. "'We Savarys don't expect payment for giving strangers a meal "'who are split in snowdrifts at our doors.' "'Salston!' cried Mr. Perrypug suppressing the fact that his own palm concealed a rumpled bill. "'I am surprised at you.' "'My dear,' interposed Mr. Joy Rollins, "'you are a good girl, and you shall have your own way. "'We are not a bit too proud to accept your hospitality, "'but you must let us thank you. "'You've taken care of us all, of me in particular, "'as if you were my own daughter. "'And a good deal better,' he added to himself. "'His look restrained his companions "'from making any further attempt at payment.' Presently, the depot hack, a wretched old baroche of antiquated model, appeared, and with a hearty good-bye they departed. Berenice, as she washed and put away her dishes, half thought that the whole visit had been a dream. But dreams do not send back letters. Ten days later, this missive came to Pothaven. Dear Madam, Your visitors of last Tuesday hope you have not forgotten them, as they certainly have not forgotten your kindness to them on the night of the storm, or your excellent cookery. I am instructed by them to make you a proposition. Would you feel inclined to quit your present location, come to New York, and cater for a lunch club of sixteen gentlemen, all middle-aged and respectable? They will guarantee the rent of suitable rooms, together with the wages of one woman servant, and all expenses, and pay you in addition fifty dollars a month. Besides this, I personally will undertake to find work for your brother in the employ of the R.C. and Y.R.R., with which I am in connection, where he will have fair pay and a chance to work up if he has the right stuff in him. Please let us have your definite answer by Tuesday the 20th. The rooms will be ready on May 5th, in case you decide to come. We should wish you to consider the agreement binding for one year, at the expiration of which both parties shall be free to make other arrangements if desired. Yours very truly, Joy Rollins. This was eight years ago, and for that length of time Berenice has presided over what her clients call the nicest lunching place in New York.
The bright little corner room used by the club has a sanded floor, duly swept into patterns by a broom every morning. This by the special request of Mr. Salston, who remembered such a one in the kitchen of his youth. All the chairs are wooden ones, with patch cushions, to suit the desire of old Mr. Canalupi, another of her customers. There are plants in the windows, and on cold days a snapping wood fire. It is a pleasant place. The club pet her a good deal, and are very good to her, but they keep her existence a profound secret, only now and then letting in some eminent stranger from out of town, as a great favor, to eat such a lunch as, they truly say, cannot be found anywhere else in the city. Berenice orders everything. The only restriction upon her freedom is the rule that the same thing is not to be sent in oftener than once in five days. There are two hearty dishes always, with a sweet of some sort to follow, and such brown bread and white bread and muffins as are not to be had anywhere else. Sometimes it is chowder, sometimes fricasseed chicken, or baked fish with a savory stuffing or grandmother's hash, or fried liver and bacon, which no one in the world save Nice has the secret of doing in exact perfection, but always, whatever it is, it is perfect of its kind. Berenice has a wonderful knack for remembering and suiting the individual tastes of her old gentlemen, as she calls them. Her Indian puddings and fried mush are a perpetual astonishment to them. Her pumpkin pies and Marlborough tarts the ideals about which they talk amongst themselves to the discomfiture of their several chefs and high-priced caterers. Once Berenice proposed to them that she should take some lessons and learn new dishes. They say croquettes are good, she urged, and there's something called a volivance that folks seem to like. Her list was cut short by a groan of disapprobation from the company. My dear, croquettes and volivance are exactly what we come here to escape from, cried old Canalupi. For heaven's sakes, stay as you are. If you once learn those French messes, you are a ruined woman. So Berenice stayed as she was, and pets and cossets her old millionaires, of whom she does not stand in the least in awe, according to the old-fashioned models. Mr. Joy Rollins is, perhaps, her special favorite. He's so nice and kind, she tells Jim, and though this is not exactly the estimate in which that eminent financier is held in Wall Street, he really is so to Bernice. He invests her little savings for her in wonderful ways, so that they double and redouble in no time, and her balance in bank is rolling up into a respectable sum. Meanwhile, she has her evenings free, and with Jim for an escort, can see and do all manner of pleasant things equally unknown and impossible to the dwellers in Pothaven. The old gentlemen have a pleasing habit of leaving concert and theater tickets on the table for her use. "'Isn't it just like what the Bible says about entertaining angels unawares?' she tells Jim. "'That snowstorm didn't amount to anything. It was melted in two days, and yet all this has come of it.' Hm, muttered Jim. "'Pretty queer angels they are, I guess.' "'Jim has learned a thing or two, you see, during his training in the employ of the R.C. and Y.R.R. Company. "'But angels is as angels does, Berenice truly holds, and Jim's disclaimers count for nothing with her.' End of chapter 7「The Barberry Bush and Eight Other Stories for Girls by Susan Coolidge In the Cathedral This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. In the Cathedral the sun was setting red and dim behind the distant mountains of Wales, and tinting with a purple flush the nearer Malvern Hills. It was a fine evening, people said, in the old city of Gloucester, and so it was as September evenings go in the west of England, though an American would scarcely have been enthusiastic over it used as we are to the gold sunshine and deep blue skies of our autumns and the low hung clouds and the scudding fogs over the severn and the cold damp wind would have seemed rather the presage of a bad day to come than the token of a pleasant one just drawing to its 
clothes but as a nation we are spoiled by our prevalence of good weather and are disposed to find unreasonable fault with the english climate forgetting that all the wit and worth of all great britain combined can do nothing to alter or improve it elise french saw nothing worthy of blame in the weather as she stood that evening in the drawing-room window putting on her gloves preparatory to going out it was a pretty room full of firelight flowers and faded well-kept furniture and the lady who sat beside the hearth matched well with her surroundings as pretty as the room and as well preserved as the furniture are you off she said turning a smiling face toward her daughter shan't you want a cup of tea before you go no thanks flora will be sure to be having it when i get there she is always later than we are you know good-bye mamma dear i shall be back soon after breakfast i suppose jemima attending to your dressing-bag oh yes she took it round just after luncheon don't worry about me flora and i will have a comfortable evening together and you must enjoy the dean's dinner i wish flora would not always send for you when there is a party on hand remarked mrs french discontentedly i should have liked you to dine at the dean's and there are to be some young people i hear yes but of course flora has the first claim flora was mrs mount jeffreys elise's cousin a nervous fanciful little woman who like mrs tulliver habitually lived in a world of her own with a population of one she was in rather delicate health and had a husband who spoiled her dreadfully and she hated to be left alone so whenever mr mount jeffreys was called away she demanded elise's company as a right and elise who spoiled her also invariably went let me see reflected elise as she stepped into the street i must stop at pitchard's for mamma so i can't take the short cut the short cut lay directly across the nave of the cathedral from the south porch to the opposite door on the north which leads to the cloister it saved going round three sides of a pretty wide square and the townsfolk especially those who lived in or near the close were in the habit of using it except at such times as services were going on there was no service now elise knew but she glanced at the majestic building which barred her way and marked the flying rays of sunset which tipped and gilded pinnacles in the buttress but her errand made the short cut ineligible so she turned sharply to the right and walked swiftly down the street in the waning light she was rather an attractive little figure as she went along not pretty but distinctly bonny in the scott sense neat trim and fresh looking with the frank happy look of a child in her gray eyes and dimpled cheeks neither brilliant nor beautiful the fairies who presided over her birth had endowed her with one compensating gift in the shape of a lovely voice as clear and true and sweet as the pipe of a lark old people and children loved best to hear her sing and at sunday services those who sat near her apt to listen to her rather than to the cathedral choir the sunset was faded into dusk before she reached her destination a cab was standing before her cousin's door and the maid who opened it had unwonted air of excitement about her what is the matter asked elise instinctively she felt that something was the matter your mistress isn't ill is she oh no miss not ill but it's very haggarded we all are there's a message come from the master he's been hurted on the railway hurts badly well that i can't say miss the message says not but my mistress is in such a taking that nothing will serve her but going off to him at once she is getting ready now so is collins 
elise waited for no more but ran rapidly up the stairs sure enough there was her cousin bonneted and gloved with flushed cheeks and wan excited eyes engaged with hands which visibly trembled in stuffing things into a bag which things collins a staid retainer pulled out as fast as they were put in refolded replaced or substituted something else in their stead what is it flora demanded elise breathlessly is george really hurt as marianne says oh you've come elise i'm so glad i have been needing you so much yes he's terribly hurt poor darling i'm going to him at once dr evans doesn't wish it but of course i'm going my place is by george's side when he is ill and suffering but did george send for you certainly not george never sends for me you know he never wants me to do anything he would keep me in cotton wool if he could i believe he particularly says no reason for anxiety don't come but it makes no difference i know he needs me and i am going where is he hurt in his arm he says accident elbow wrenched nothing to signify still i know that it must be a bad hurt for his handwriting doesn't look at all like it usually does but flora it was a telegram how could it look like george's handwriting do wait till tomorrow you will hear again from him before then and very likely will find the accident less serious than you suppose and then if you decide to go either mother or i will go with you george will be worried to death at your taking a night journey and you are sure to be knocked up by it oh no i'm not i'm perfectly well only anxious and it would kill me to stay and think about it all night it's no use arguing the point elise of course you cannot enter into a wife's feelings how could you and my mind is quite quite made up collins is going with me and we shall get to charing cross at half past twelve remonstrances were useless as elise well knew when flora had made up her mind the thing she was pleased to call her mind like many weak people she was extremely obstinate and her very weakness made it harder to combat her decisions elise contented herself therefore by giving what help she could and a half an hour after her arrival saw her cousin drive away in the cab with collins who luckily was neither young nor flighty and could be trusted to keep her wits about her she had been too busy to think about herself but now the question arose of what she was to do to spend the night in flora's home with her demoralized maid-servants was not to be thought of it took but a moment to decide i'll just run home by the short cut she said to herself it won't take ten minutes and i may be in time to see mamma before she starts her party she glanced at the clock and was dismayed to find that it lacked but eight minutes of closing time that was enough however she concluded if she walked fast as she set out at a rapid pace it was dusky in the street and duskier still in the cloisters so dark in fact that the carved fans which are the glory of its groined roof were invisible all merged into one deep soft shadow but the cathedral was open still for she hurried down to the angle of the west walk the door swung back and some one came out passing her in the darkness inside the building it seemed lighter for the high clear story reflected somewhat of the streak of day that still lingered in the west halfway across the nave she heard the door through which she had passed lock behind her and there was scarcely time for a thrill of apprehension when boom 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 came the strokes of the tower bells and mingled with their clang the sharp unmistakable click of a turning key from the exit toward which she was hastening she was fastened in like a lapwing elise ran to the south door caught at the handle made sure that it was fast and then began to beat with all of her force upon the panels crying let me out let me out i am ellis french 
You have locked me in. Let me out. But the bells drowned her calls, and the noise of her blows upon the door, and as the bells ceased, a sound of distant, retreating steps on the flagged walk showed that the verger was on his way to home and his supper, and with no idea that he had left a prisoner behind him, a poor little prisoner who appeal he had disregarded. It was really a trying position for a girl of nineteen to find herself in, there is something awful in the sense of a great space which the eye cannot penetrate. It affects the imagination powerfully. Happily, Elise French was neither nervous nor hysterical, but a sound, vigorous girl with nerves under common good control. And though she turned pale and clasped her hands tightly together, as she realized her predicament, she neither shrieked nor fainted. In fact, after the first chill start of dismay had passed, she felt an impulse to laugh at the plight into which her imprudence had brought her. It is really too ridiculous, she said to herself, but there, this is comfort. Mamma will not be worried. She thinks I am safe at Flora's. She sat down in the nearest chair and looked about her, shivering a little as she realized the vast and height in silence. What do people do who are shut up in cathedrals, she reflected. I don't think I've ever heard of anyone being so. If I could get in behind the choir and cuddle up in the lady chapel, I think I shouldn't mind it so much. But of course the gratings will be locked. Those miserable vergers are so afraid of missing a sixpence that they are sure to fasten them. She groped her way toward the iron gates, which bar the ambulatories, but found them, as she had supposed they would be securely fastened. The lights in the great east window were dark now, all the glorious red and gold merged into a common brown blackness. There were a few stalls without the sanctuary, where certain favored cathedral families were accustomed to sit, and toward these Elise turned. There, at least, there would be something soft to sit upon she found cushions and hassocks in plenty and with these made for herself a place of repose this isn't half bad she thought only i wish it were not at all so big and i wish i had some dinner before i came but i'm glad since i must be shut in that it's the cathedral not any other building it is holy ground and the angels must be here if anywhere taking care of the place where men leave it and go away she said her prayer softly like the devout english girl that she was afterward a hymn or two and then almost unconsciously she began to sing the clear young voice rang out into the dim wide space as a bird song rings in the forest aisles keep me all keep me king of kings beneath the shadow of my wings the sweet notes abruptly ceased what is that thought elise with a throb of terror she listened intently Surely something was moving in the north aisle, not far away. A moving shadow stirred the darkness immediately before her. Then a voice, an odd, impatient, sharp voice, with a wail in its tone, like a complaining child, said, Some more! Sing some more! Elise could not repress a start. The cushions behind her rustled. The shadow moved near. A hand caught hold of her dress. Some more, repeated the voice impatiently. With a stifled shriek, Elise pulled her gown away and rose to flee, but the hand caught her arm. What are you going away for? demanded the voice. Stay and sing some more. I like it. It makes me happy. Nobody sang in the bad place. What's the bad place? asked Elise, trying to speak calmly. Don't talk about it. Don't say another word about it, replied the invisible presence in exciting tones. Do you hear? Don't talk about it. 
They will come and find me if you do. It was a bad, bad place, but I'm away from it now, and I shall never go back. I hid behind the marble man over there. Oh, I was clever, very clever. They will never think of searching for me here, and we will stay always, and you shall sing. He's mad, thought poor Elise, sick with terror. He certainly is. I am shut in with a madman. Oh, what shall I do? A wild notion of getting away into the tower and ringing the bells for help flashed over her. But the iron grate and the darkness seemed insuperable difficulties. Besides, the lunatic was holding her arm. He seemed to divine her thoughts and tightened his grasp. Don't hold my arm so you hurt me, said Elise, steadying her voice. With a mighty effort, I will sing to you, if you will sit down quietly and listen. Oh, I'll listen, replied her terrible companion. I like to listen. That was what made me come out of my hiding place, my nice hiding place, where they never will find me. Never. Do you think they'll find me? Do you? I did not mean to come out. Oh, no, no. Oh, no. But when you began to sing, I did. Oh, why did I sing? Whatever made me, thought poor Elise. But the madman had released her arm and now pushed her back into her seat and settled himself beside her. Sing, he reiterated in a tone of command. And Elise sang, choosing the most soothing air she knew. At first her voice was unsteady with fear, but as time went on, she realized that her singing had power to tranquilize and make harmless the demented creature at her side. She regained her powers. Never had her notes sounded so clear and high as now, and they rang back from the lofty arc overhead in the soft echoes which doubled their volume. She even grew to find a certain pleasure in her task, building, so to speak, a wall of defense about her youth and helplessness out of the harmonics which she invoked if some poor wandering child of thine has burned to-day the voice divine now lord thy gracious work begin let him no more lie down in sin she sang the lunatic was perfectly still now. She thought him asleep and paused to rest. He stretched himself heavily along the carved bench. His head fell on her lap. Sing, he ordered drowsily. Sing more. And so it went through the whole of that long, unutterably long night. Intervals came when the sound of unmeasured breathing showed that the sleep had its healing touch upon the poor shaken brain which rested upon her knee and she could venture to stop for a while and calm herself with silence and prayer once or twice she drooped into a momentary slumber but only to be aroused by the renewed command peevishly uttered sing some more then she commenced her task to the last day of her life Elise French could never quite bear to join in some of the hymns which she sang over and over and over again during the terrible vigil. They were too indelibly associated with pain and horror of darkness, the dread of dawn, the fear of what might come with dawn, to be endurable. At last the dim light of the early morning began to steal into the cathedral, familiar shapes of tombs and chapels. In monumental brasses detached themselves from the darkness and stood revealed the marble man who was no other than the exemplary dr jenner in stone became visible at the west end of the nave and seemed to look toward her benignantly elise could see the head on her lap now the wild man and wan bloodless face but there was nothing horrible in the aspect nothing malign or ferocious. And now, indeed, she sang as for her life, 
intent on keeping the madman lulled in sleep till the doors should be unlocked and aid come she went on untiringly hymn after hymn anthem after anthem ballad after ballad her voice grew faint her limbs were stiff from keeping the same attitude so long surges of nervousness swept over her but she neither stirred nor stopped and so she sat and so she was still singing when the keys grated in the lock and the verger and his assistant together with the young prebendary entered to make ready the lady chapel for an early celebration i never saw so strange a scene wrote the young prebendary to his mother afterwards first we heard this high beautiful voice a little strained and unnatural in a tone but still beautiful and then while we were still staring about us in wonder we saw the girl sitting in one of the carved stalls as fixed as marble and almost as white we stood stock still with surprise like three fools till she with the wanest smile you ever saw beckoned us to come nearer and sang for she dared not change to speaking for fear of waking up the dreadful creature beside her i have been here all night please come and help me for i do not feel as if i could keep much longer on and i am afraid to stop i had seen miss french once or twice before i came to gloucester but had never particularly noticed her she's a quiet girl and not exactly pretty and well there are always such a lot of girls in the cathedral towns and you know how it is yourself but somehow the strangeness of the thing and her wonderful self-control and the brave look in her eyes quite overcame me and when i had slipped the lunatic's head off her knee on to a cushion and released her she stopped in the very act of going to whisper don't hurt him he did me no harm and i don't think he is violent or dangerous i suppose he will have to go back to the asylum but i wish he needn't for he does hate it so by jove mother i thought she was the sweetest thing i ever saw i just wish you could have seen her and then as she slipped away toward the door the madman roused reared his rumpled head and screamed after her don't go away stop and sing some more oh do sing some more that was what he had been saying all night she told us no wonder she was exhausted she fainted away after she got home but she was all right again now how i little imagined said mrs mount jeffreys on the day of elise's wedding a year later when i drove away that night to take care of george who wasn't a bit grateful but just sat up in bed and scolded me what was to come of it aunt blamed me at the time i know but how could i foresee that there was a lunatic hidden away in the cathedral and you are going to be locked in and sing to him all night now elise i put it to you how could i and really i think she ought to be grateful to me and you too for if i hadn't forgotten all about you you might never have met ralph at all and where would you be then where indeed responded elise a dimpling blush and the bishop giving him that nice living too as soon as he heard of your engagement because he said the cathedral owed you something after all you had suffered now elise do own that it was a good thing that i went off that night and forgot all about you and your dinner of course i couldn't know what it was to lead to but there's one thing continued flora triumphantly if i had known i would have done exactly the same end of in the cathedral The Barbary Bush and Eight Other Stories for Girls by Susan Coolidge The Engineer's Story This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Engineer Story This is about it, said John Scott, the engineer, as the train slowly crested a long, gradual grade. You're atop of the Rocky Mountains now, ma'am. Emily Vaughn looked to the left and to the right, and was conscious of a feeling of disappointment. She had pictured the top of the Rocky Mountains as something quite different from this. Here were no frowning heights or sudden gulfs, only a wide, rolling plateau, some distant peaks which did not look very high and far ahead a glimpse of lower levels running down into plains it seemed hardly worth while to have come so far for so little really she said but where are the mountains they don't look nearly as high as they did yesterday naturally ma'am responded the engineer things don't appear so high when you're as high as they are we're atop, you know, but there is no look-off, no wonderful distance as from the top of Mount Washington. I confess I am disappointed. It's kind of queer, said John Scott, with a dry chuckle. How folks from the east keep alludin' to that here little hill as if it were the standard of measurement. We don't think so much of it this way. Why, ma'am? You're about 3,000 feet higher at this minute than if you were at top of that little shruck of Mount Washington that they think so much of. Miss Vaughn smiled, but she experienced a shock nevertheless. The New England mind does not easily accustom itself to hearing its sacred mountain thus lightly spoken against. Have you ever seen Mount Washington? she asked. Oh, bless you, yes, replied John Scott cheerfully. I was raised over Freiburg and grew up alongside of it. I thought it was a pretty big concern when I was a boy, but now he closed the sentence with a short, expressive laugh. Miss Vaughn changed the subject. She was not offended. She had grown to like this rough, good-natured engineer, in the course of the three days' journey, during which, favored as a relative of one of the directors of the road, she had several times been privileged to ride, as now, in the engineer's cab, for a better view of the country. "'Have you been long on this road?' she asked. "'Pretty near since it opened. I run the third through the train that come out from Chicago, and I haven't been off the line since.' winter or summer, except for these three months, when I was laid up with a broken leg. This must look very differently in winter, said Miss Vaughn, noting the treeless distances and the snows still glinting on the higher peaks to the left. You may believe it does. The first year when the snow sheds wasn't built, it was terrible. I was running that train that stuck in the snow seven days. Perhaps you'll remember about it? It was all in the papers. I shan't forget that. Not if I live to be as old as my grandfather. And he didn't die till he was ninety years old. Tell me about it, said Miss Vaughn, persuasively seating herself on the high side bench of the cab with that air of attention which was so enticing to the storyteller. Amusements are few and far between in the long monotony of an overland journey to California. Besides which, Miss Vaughn dearly loved a story. There ain't much to tell, said John Scott, with something of the feeling which prompts the young vocalist to complain of hoarseness. I ain't any hand at telling things either. Then won by Miss Vaughn's appealing eyes, he continued, We ran all fair on time till we was about two hundred miles beyond Omaha. Then the snow began. It didn't seem much at first. The woman folk in the train rather liked it. They were all crowded to the windows to see, and the children hurrahed. Anything seemed a pleasant change after the sagebrush, I suppose. 
but as it went to fallin and the drifts grew deep and the cars had to run slow the older ones began to look serious and i can tell you that we who had the charge of the train felt so we was just between two of the feedin stations and we put on all the steam we could hopin to push through to where provisions could be got in the case we had to stop but twarn't no use the snow kept comin i never see it come so the flakes looked as big as saucers and the drifts piled so quick that when we finally stuck in about ten minutes no one could see out the windows the train would have been clear buried over if the brakemen and the porters hadn't gone over the whole length over the roofs every half hour swept it off with brooms and shovels we had a lot of good shovels aboard by good luck or else nothing could have saved us from being banked up outright but it was terrible hard work i can tell you there twarn't more laughing among the passengers by the time it come to that, and the children stopped hurrahing. Oh, the poor little things! What did they do? Were there many on board? Was there plenty for them to eat? That was the worst of it. There wasn't plenty for anyone to eat. We had stuck just midway of the feeding station, and there twasn't a great deal of anything on board besides what the passengers had in their lunch baskets one lady she had a tin of condensed milk and they mixed it up for the babies there was two of em and so they got on pretty well but there was another five children not babies but quite little and i don't know what they would have done if it weren't for that young lady the young lady said miss vaughan looking up with some surprise for with the words a curious tremble had come into the engineer's voice and a dark flush into his bronzed face what young lady was that it was a moment or two before john scott answered the question i don't know what she was called he said slowly i never knew she was the only one on the train so we just called her the young lady she was traveling alone our folks had asked the conductor to look after her. She was going out to some relative of hers. Her brother, I guess, who was sick down to Sacramento. That's how she'd come to be there. Were the children under her care? No, ma'am. She was all alone, as I told you. But she took them under her care from the very first. They had their fathers and mothers along. Three of them had, at least and the other two had their mother and a nurse girl, but somehow no one but the young lady seemed to be able to do anything with them. The poor little ones was half-starved, you see, and there wasn't anything to amuse them in the dark car, and one of them, who was sickly, fretted all day and most all night, and the mother didn't seem to have no faculty or no backbone to her, but whenever the young lady came around, that sick one, and all the rest would stop crying and just seem as chipper as if it was summertime outdoors and the whole train full of candy i don't see how she did it he went on meditatively throwing a shovel full of coal in the furnace door some women is made that way i suppose as soon as we see how things were going and how bad they was likely to be that girl kind of set herself to help along she had a mighty gentle way with her, too. You never have guessed that she was so plucky. Plucky by it, George. I never saw anything like her pluck. Was she pretty? asked Miss Vaughan, urged by a truly feminine curiosity. Well, I don't know if you'd a call her so or not. We didn't think much how she looked after the first. She was a slender-built girl and her face sort of kind and bright both to me her voice was as soft well as soft as a voice can be and it kind of sang when she felt happy she looked you straight in the eyes when she spoke i don't believe the worst man that ever lived could have told that girl a lie if it had been to save his life her hair was brown she was different from girls in general somehow I think we may say that she was pretty. 
observed Miss Vaughan with a little smile. I ain't so sure of that. There's plenty of ladies come over the road since that. I suppose folks would say better looking than she was. But I never see any face quite like hers. It was still like a lake, and you seemed to feel as if there were depth to it. And the farther you went down, the sweeter it got. She never made any rustling when she walked. She wasn't that kind. Another pause, which Miss Vaughn was careful not to break. I don't know what them children would have done without her, went on the engineer as if talking to himself, then with sudden energy. I don't know what any of us would have done without her. The only trouble was that she couldn't be everywhere at once. There was a sick lady in the drawing room at the end of one of the Pullmans. She had weak lungs and was going out to California for her health. Well, the cold and the snow brought on a hemorrhage. That was the second day after we was blockaded. There wasn't no doctor on board, and her husband was mighty scared. He come through the front car to find the conductor, looking as pale as a ghost. My wife's a-dying, said he. Ain't there no medical man on this train? And when we said, no, he just gave a groan. Then she must die, he said. Great heavens, why did I bring her on this fatal journey? Perhaps the young lady will have some remedies, suggested one of the porters, for we'd all got into the way already of turning to the young lady whenever things are wrong. Well, I went for her, and you never see any one so level-headed as she seemed to be. She knew just what to do, and she had the right medicine in her back. And in less than an hour, that poor lady was quite comfortable, and her husband, the most relieved man that there ever was. Then the young lady come along to where I was standing. There wasn't nothing for me to do, but I was waiting, for I didn't know what there might be. And said she, Mr. Scott, I am growing anxious about the fuel. Do you think there is plenty to last? Suppose we were kept here for a week. Now just think of it. Not one of us dumb fools had thought of that. You see, we was expected to be relieved from hour to hour, for we had telegraphed both ways, and the snow had stopped by that time, and none of us had any notion that it was going to be the job it was to dig us out. Only the young lady had the sense to remember that it might take longer than we was calculating on. Says I, if we are kept here a week, there won't be a shovelful of coals left for any of the fires, let alone the engine. Then don't you think, says she in her soft voice, that it would be wise to plan to get all the passengers together in one car and keep a good fire up there and let the other stoves go out? It's no matter if we are a little crowded, says she. Well, of course it was the only thing to do. As we see at once when it was put into our heads, we took the car the sick lady was in so she'd not have to be disturbed, and we made up beds for the children, and somehow all the passengers managed to pack in, train hands and all. It was a tight squeeze, but that didn't matter so much because the weather was so awfully cold. That was the way I had come to see so much of the young lady. I hadn't anything to keep me about the engine, so I kind of detailed myself off to wait on her. She was busy all day long doing things for the rest. It's queer how some people's characters come out at such times. We got to know all about each other. Some stopped surin and mammon and being polite and just showed for what they were worth selfish ones and the shirks and the cowards and the mean cusses who all wanted to blame someone besides the almighty for sending the weather there wasn't no use for any of them to try to hide themselves any more than it was for the other kind the women as a rule bore up better than the men it comes natural i suppose for a woman to be kind and silent and a pale and patient when she's suffering but the young lady wasn't that sort either she was as bright as a button all along. 
you'd have to suppose from her face that she was having just the best kind of a time. I can see her now, standing before the stove, roasting jackrabbits for the other supper. Some of the gentlemen had revolvers, and when the snow got crusted over so they could walk on it, they used to shoot them, and we were glad enough for every one shot. Provisions were so scanty. The last two days, them rabbits in snow water melted in the pail over the stove was all we had to eat or drink. I suppose there was nothing for you to do but to wait, said Miss Vaughan. No, ma'am, there wasn't nothing at all for me to do but to help the young lady now and then. She let me help her more than the rest, I used to think. She'd come to me and say, Mr. Scott, this rabbit is for you and the conductor. She never forgot anybody except herself. Once she asked me to hold the sick little girl while she took a sleep. It was a mighty pretty always to see her with them children. They never seemed to have enough of her. All of them wanted she should put them to bed and sing to them and tell them stories. Sometimes she'd just have all five squirming over her at once. I used to watch them. Well, how did it end? asked Miss Vaughan, as the engineer's voice, which had gradually grown lower and more dreamy, came to a stop. Eh? What? Oh, rousing himself. It ended with three locomotives, and a relief train from Cheyenne broke through to us on the eighth morning after we was abrogated. They brought provisions and coal, and we got on first rate after that. Did the sick lady die? No, ma'am, she was living. When I last heard of her down to Santa Barbara two years ago, that was. And what became of your young lady? She left at Sacramento. Her brother or someone was down to meet her. I saw him a moment. He didn't look like her. And you never saw her again? You never heard her name? No, ma'am, I never did. The engineer's voice sounded gruff and husky as he said this. He shoveled in coals with needless energy. Are you a married man? asked Miss Vaughan. The question sounded abrupt, even to herself, but seemed relevant to something in her mind. No. John Scott looked her squarely in the face as he replied. His countenance was rather grim and set and for a moment she feared that she had offended him. Then, as he met her depreciating gaze, he reassured her with a swift smile. No, ma'am, I ain't. And I never shall be, as I know of, he added. Second rate wouldn't satisfy me now, I guess. He pulled the cord which hung ready to his head, and a long screeching whistle ran out over the plain, and set the prairie dogs scuttling into their burrows. This is the feeding station we're coming to, he explained. Twenty minutes here for supper, ma'am, and it ain't a bad supper either. I reckon you'd like to have me help you down, wouldn't you? End of Engineer Story Barbary Bush and Eight Other Stories for Girls by Susan Coolidge a Quiet Girl, Part 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Barbara Bush and Eight Other Stories for Girls by Susan Coolidge, A Quiet Girl, Part 1. The steamship Calabria, 36 hours out from New York, was plowing her way on an April morning some years ago against a headwind and a sea which, though subsiding, was still decidedly rough and unfriendly. A bright sun had begun to dry the recently scrubbed decks when a passenger, the first visible since Sandy Hook was passed, crawled up the companionway very much as a fly creeps windward after a cold storm and emerged on the deck. This passenger was a young man, wrapped in a fur-lined coat from whose pockets a pipe case, sundry newspapers and a book protruded. A steward followed, bearing a chair and a rug, which he sat down in an indicated spot while their owner proceeded to make himself comfortable in an accustomed and leisurely way. He was a well-built, rather handsome fellow, with a full beard of light brown and as much of the English look as can be given by broad shoulders and a pair of cool blue eyes. 
whose gaze was rather interrogative than kindly. His movements, though deliberate, had nothing of the languor of seasickness about them. In fact, Mr. Elliot Bryce, as a card tapped to the back of his chair proclaimed him, was no longer seasick. His tax to Neptune, a moderate one, had been paid for the present voyage. He was aware and glad of the fact, and opened his book with the composure of a man who, having weathered more than one first day out, knew what to expect of the Atlantic and his own sensations. For half an hour he remained. For half an hour he remained in solitary possession of the deck. Then a yellow gentleman was held upstairs by the steward and laid on a canvas chair in the sunshine. A chalky gentleman with a baby in his arms next followed and stowed himself and his charge in a corner away from the wind an englishman whose port wine complexion had faded to a brown sherry tint during recent vicissitudes appeared and a husky voice ordered soda water and so much brandy measuring with his fingers in an imaginary glass two boys crept out and curled up together for a time like a couple of disconsolate puppies then revived by the air began to punch and tickle and finally to chase each other up and down Plaintive voices and the rattle of a spoon from within the deck cabin suggested the gentler sex in process of consolation, but so far no ladies were visible, and Mr. Bryce, after a calm stare at each newcomer, returned to his book with no increase of interest in his fellow passengers. At last a lady appeared, a lady's head, that is, for the supporting body was hidden by the hatchway. It was a pretty head with profuse blonde hair, some loose tendrils of which, blowing in the wind had a charming effect delicate features and that pearl and rosy skin which is the brief endowment of american girlhood at its best the pearl predominated at the moment but still the face was fair enough to attract mr bryce's eyes from his book presently the girl turned to address someone farther down the stair is it wet asked the invisible person not a bit returned she of the blonde locks tell ma so lila Tell her it's real pleasant and dry, and she'd better come up right away. She'll feel better the minute she does. But tell her to make Pa bring the fur blanket for the wind's right fresh. And Lila, ask Carr to make haste. I'll wait for her here close to the door. The voice was disenchanting, high-pitched, unmodulated, and with that insistence on the terminal G, which is characteristic of rural New England. Elliot Bryce, who was fastidious to voices as about other things, made no offer of assistance, though the pretty creature came forward dragging after her a tolerably heavy chair, when, however, she stumbled and nearly fell over the outstretched legs of his own. He did rise, picked up the chair, and assisted its owner to regain her footing. Where shall I put it? he demanded with cool courtesy. I don't know, I'm sure. I don't know where's a good place, said the pretty girl confusedly. Another young lady now emerged from the companionway, and made her way quietly across the dividing space, neither stumbling nor seeming to observe the fixed gaze which met her from Mr. Bryce's round eyes. Oh, Carr, cried the first girl, in a tone of relief, you are come at last, aren't you? This gentleman's so good as to fix my seat for me, but I don't know where he'd better put it. Here, I think, it will be out of the wind, said the new arrival, in a voice so pleasing to Mr. Bryce's ears that he paid it the tribute of a bow as he moved away even turned his head for a glance at the speaker who after sitting a friend in the chair had placed herself upon a shawl spread on the deck there was nothing noticeable about her he decided dark hair coiled up under a compact little hat a slight figure in a rough jacket features neither plain nor pretty except a round chin whose firm outline was softened by a delightful dimple but there was an intangible something which taken in connection with manner and accent made Elliot Bryce say to himself, Now that is a lady. Extraordinary. Isn't Ma coming up? demanded girl number one. She was nearly ready, but she felt so ill that she had to lie down again. Your father was giving her some iced champagne. I think she means to try again soon. The wind brought the words distinctly to Mr. Bryce's ears, and again he wondered at the difference in the two voices. Cars were soft and vibrant, and there was a finish and precision of intonation which was full of refinement, rare in any circle, reflected the listener. The other was just the ordinary New England voice, neither better nor worse, he told himself disgustedly. Wasn't it horrid all day yesterday and last night? I never thought the sea could be so bad. How the glasses smashed in the cabin, and the vessel tipped and tipped, till I thought she grew over. I had to hold on by both hands to keep from rolling off the sofa. 
Did you ever know anything so awful, Carr? It was pretty bad, but there were some funny things too. A boot and a slipper came in in the middle of the night when you were asleep and danced the oddest little dance round the stateroom. And at dinner, when it was so very rough, I saw a leg of mutton in mid-air flying down the passage between the cabins. Then the steward came with a fork and pronged away in a corner. And when I asked what it was, he said he was collecting the potatoes which had been upset and rolled in all directions. I laughed till I could hardly hold on. Dear me, how could you? I never felt so little like laughing in all my life. I was all scared to death and Lila, she kept shrieking and calling out to Pa that it was real mean of him to bring her out in this old sea and make her so sick. I told her to shut up and hold her tongue, that everyone would hear her, but she didn't pay the least attention. I do think children are perfectly horrid. I told Ma just how it would be if he brought Lila, but she wouldn't believe me. See, Carr, that is the captain with a gold band around his hat. Ain't he splendid? He looks good-natured. How weather-beaten his face is. I suppose he lives in high winds most of the time. There aren't many passengers up yet. Everyone's been sick, I reckon. Did you notice that gentleman by the stairs? Isn't he good-looking? He was real polite, too, and fixed my chair for me. Carr's reply was inaudible, but apparently conveyed a warning, for the answer was, Gracious, he couldn't hear me, do you think? Well, with a giggle, if he did, there's no harm in saying that a person is good-looking. He can stand that, I guess. I never knew a man yet who couldn't. There's Ma now, I declare, and she jumped up, throwing aside her rugs, and went forward to meet a tall and pallid lady, elaborately dressed, who emerged from the companionway, supported on one side by a little girl, and on the other by a small, anxious-looking man with a bald head and spectacles. The stewardess followed, loaded with wraps and cushions. A solemn hush ensued while the sufferer was duly shawled and tucked into a chair. There, Ma, you'll feel better now, I guess, remarked the little man in a depreciating voice. I hope so, was the answer. I think it's quite time something was done to help me. I never should have consented to come if I imagined what it was going to be like. Mrs. Mitchell never had a sick day when she crossed, not one. The sea was like a mill pond, she said, just as smooth as smooth the whole way when she came, emphasizing the words reproachfully. I'm very sorry, I'm sure, said her husband. But I'm not responsible, my dear. You must remember that. I didn't make the Atlantic, and I can't help its being rough when it's a mind to. I didn't say you could, Mr. Frisbee, stonily, but you needn't have gone on assuring me that it was apt to be smooth at this season of the year. I never should have come if you hadn't been so positive about it. However, it's no use talking, and I believe I feel a little better now I've got up here. Do go and sit down somewhere, Mr. Frisbee. It makes me nervous to see you standing about so. Lila, fasten your jacket and tie on your veil. You'll be as black as a nigger before we get to the other side if you go about in the sun like that. There, the wind has taken my rug off already. I never saw anything like it. Tuck it in, Elise. Let me do it. Thank you, Miss Carr, in a more gracious tone. You ain't been sick much, I guess, or you'd show it more. What do you take to ward it off? Oh, I didn't take anything, and I was sick for an hour or two yesterday, Mrs. Frisbee, and didn't get up at all till this morning. An hour or two, that's coming off pretty well, I consider. You've got no cause to complain, I'm sure. I was as sick as death all night, just as sick as I could be. I couldn't speak except to scream to Mr. Frisbee now and then, and I can't think why it should have been so, for I took everything I could hear of to prevent it. I took three of the compound carminative pills before starting, and put on a porous plaster on behind and a mustard paste in front, and ate pickles all the way to Sandy Hook, and two kinds of homeopathy. I don't believe anything does any good, though, when it's as rough as it was yesterday. At this juncture, Mr. Bryce rose and walked away. Who's that? he heard as he went. He's rather stylish looking. The rest of the passengers so far seem pretty common, and Mrs. Frisbee glanced about her with an eye of disfavour. Insufferable people, muttered Mr. Bryce to himself. Bad form all true. Loud, pretentious, ignorant. I wish a law could be passed prohibiting Americans from going abroad till they have passed some sort of competitive examination. It would ruin half the Swiss hotels though, I suppose. And a good thing that would be. Descending to luncheon, he found the places in his immediate neighborhood dotted with cards labeled Frisbee. Presently, the small gentleman and Miss Carr appeared and took the seats next his own. Mr. Bryce fed in studied silence. 
Miss Carr glanced at him from under her eyelashes but said nothing. Her escort was less abstinent. Hem, he began modestly. May I trouble you for that butter, sir? Then, we've had a rough passage so far. Is it your first experience of an Atlantic voyage, sir? No, you have crossed before? More than once, perhaps? It's our first attempt at anything of the kind, and a pretty bad one for beginners. Have you generally found it as rough as this? Sometimes better, sometimes worse. Passages vary. You can never tell beforehand how it will be. That's just what a friend of ours said to us before we left home. She has crossed four times, and three out of the four, it was smooth. Once, she had a storm all the way. Curious, wasn't it? You recollect Mrs. Mitchell describing her experience, Miss Carr, don't you? The young lady bowed without speaking. It's Miss Carr's first voyage, too, went on Mr. Frisbee, but she makes a better sailor than the rest of us. Do you happen to be acquainted with Major Eaton of the United States Army? No. I ask because we resemble him so strongly. Same height exactly, I should say. Same features. Only his hair happens to be red and he has a little cast in one eye. Very slight. You hardly notice it. I thought you must be relations from the likeness. It's singular, isn't it? Very, answered Elliot with disgusted emphasis, being further irritated by the conviction that Miss Carr was stifling a laugh over her plate. If you've been abroad before, you can perhaps give us some hints as to our future course. We have laid out to stay from one year to fourteen months, seeing all the best that there is to see in England, Scotland, Ireland, Holland, Belgium, France, Switzerland, Germany, and Italy. Miss Elise, my daughter, wants me to throw in Russia too, and Egypt, and the Holy Land. But I don't know about it. It seems a good deal to do within a time. Don't you agree with me? That it's the wiser course to confine yourself to six or eight countries and see them thoroughly. What is your opinion, mister? That you're quite right in not trying to do too much in a short time, replied Elliot briefly, and bolting his last mouthful, he fled from the table. That doesn't appear to be a very affable person, remarked Mr. Frisby plaintively. I wish I could have arrived at his real opinions on the subject. Oh, here's his card. Bryce. Elliot Bryce is the name, Miss Carr. It's queer, but Judge Sherwood of our place, mother's name was Bryce. I wonder if this gentleman is any connection. I'll ask him. Elliot, who had regained his chair and book, was by no means charmed at the question, but being pressed, was constrained unwillingly to admit that there was a relationship. His grandfather's half-sister, he believed, married somebody named Sherwood, but the connection was a distant one, and he really knew very little about them. But my dear sir, cried Mr. Frisbee radiantly, the connection isn't distant at all. Your great aunt, did I understand you? That makes you and Judge Sherwood's second cousins once removed. Half second cousins, did you say? Oh, one never counts such things fractionally. You are quite nearly related, and you must let me shake hands. I'm delighted to meet you. Judge Sherwood is one of my best friends home to Pawtucket. His house and mine are just opposite. I see him almost every day. Frisbee is my name. Richard C. Frisbee. I'm delighted to make your acquaintance. What is it? Who is this gentleman, Mr. Frisbee? demanded his wife from her chair. Mr. Bryce, my dear, a cousin of our good friend, Judge Sherwood. Mr. Bryce, make you acquainted with Mrs. Frisbee. Miss Elise, my daughter. Miss Lila. Miss Carr, let me introduce Mr. Bryce. Miss Carr is a friend of my daughter's travelling with us. Mr. Frisbee rubbed his hands excitedly as he achieved this fivefold introduction, while Elliot bowed formally to the four ladies without speaking. I'm sure I'm very glad to know a fellow passenger, said Mrs. Frisbee graciously. It gets to be awful lonesome at sea when you can't converse or do anything. You're lucky in being able to read, Mr. Bryce. Doesn't it make your head swim? Not at all. I declare there's some pleasure in an ocean voyage when one is as well as that. At least you must lend Mr. Bryce those books you brought. They are only novels, ma. I don't believe a gentleman would care about them, but he's very welcome if he does. The pretty face was so pretty that Elliot was betrayed into an answering smile. You are very kind, he said with a softening of tone, which emboldened the young lady to ask, May I look at your book? He handed it to her. Hard cities of northern Italy. Oh, ma, see how splendid with pictures all true. What a nice book to have. It tells about the Italian cities. Just what we want to know. I'll get it for you in London, said her father, while Mrs. Frisbee majestically added. 
If it's to be procured, your pa will find it, you may be sure. We never spared any expense on my daughter's education, Mr. Bryce. Four years at Madame Hawker's seminary, 1100 Beside extra straight along, it came pretty steep on Mr. Frisbee. But I tell him once a girl is educated and married, and it's over. It isn't like boys, always failing and coming back on their fathers and expecting to be started out again in business as good as new. A girl is got rid of once for all. Oh, ma, giggled the daughter. While Mr. Bryce, his sense of antipathy renewed, made another stiff bow and without further speech moved away. He kept at a distance from the party and for the next two days eluded all Mrs. Frisbee's attempt to draw him into conversation. It is difficult, however, without absolute rudeness, to keep on avoiding people in the close neighbourhood of shipboard. Elliot could make himself inaccessible, but he could not be distinctly rude, and so it came to pass that almost against his will he saw a good deal more than he cared to see of the Frisbee family. It was often as Mrs. Frisbee who took advantage of unguarded moments to force a conversation with him, but now and again he seated himself voluntarily beside Miss Frisbee, whose beautiful face and a certain girlish candour of manner had for him an attraction only dispelled when she spoke. That voice, that awful voice, he would say to himself as he stalked away after these interviews. I wish American girls could either be taught to speak or born dumb. The younger sister he relegated in his own mind to the chamber of horrors and never spoke to or looked at if it were possible to avoid it. Miss Carr remained the enigma of the family to him. She was curiously different from the others, simpler in dress, quieter in manner, shunning conversation rather than courting it. But there was a delicate little force of personality about her which asserted itself as does a flavour in food, unformulated, but distinct. She talked little, but her eyes sometimes said what her lips failed to say. More than once he caught a look which gave him a sense of discomfort, an analytic look, as if in the recesses of her thought she was taking measurements and weighing him, him, in balances which did not always tip in the direction which his self-love would have indicated. The eyes were grey, not large, but singularly clear and limpid. They looked out from their dark lashes with a frank, untroubled sincerity like a child's. Yet they had a compelling power, cool and gentle, which had nothing of the child about it. He had never seen any eyes quite like them. That she was not related to the Frisbee family seemed to him a foregone conclusion. He gathered from chance remarks that she and Alice Frisbee had been at school together. But that was all he gathered, till one day, in a tete-a-tete, more prolonged than usual, with the beauty, further explanation came. You see, said Elise, Carr behaved splendidly, just splendidly when I had typhoid fever at school. It was the middle of the second year and we were roommates, but I didn't feel to know her much till then. We were such different kinds of girls, you know. It takes something out of the usual to make Carr show what she is. She just did everything, stayed by me and telegraphed Pa, and set up three nights before they got a nurse. And when Madam Hawker wanted to send me straight out of the house for fear there'd be a scare among the other girls, Carr just locked the door on her and wouldn't let anyone in. But the doctor, till Pa came, it saved my life, the doctor said, for I couldn't possibly have got well if they had moved me. That was why I made Pa ask her to take this trip with us. That, and because everything is ten times nicer when she's around. Her father's a country minister, you know, and of course his means are not large and I don't suppose Carr would ever have the chance to come if she hadn't come with us, though perhaps the rich aunt that sent her to school might have taken her some time. But I wanted her to go with me. She's just splendid, Mr. Bryce. Where is Mr. Carr settled? Mr. Carr? Yes, Miss Carr's father. Didn't you say he was a country minister? Oh, Mr. Walcott, you mean? Carr is just a nickname for Caroline, you know. He's at St. Johnsbury, so she was not even Miss Carr. Mr. Bryce wondered more and more, and then wondered at himself for wondering. Elliot Bryce rather prided himself upon being an American. Half his time since he graduated from Harvard had been spent in Europe, going over for six months or a year at a time at his fancy and the pursuit of a quasi-literary profession dictated, and coming home for winters or summers to look into his affairs and placate the stepmother and older brothers who were inclined to regard his literary career as all bosh 
another name for idling away his time. During his temporary returns, he looked at things American from a standpoint distinctly critical. He was still under 30, but he liked to think of himself as a cool, dispassionate observer, a cosmopolite who stood outside of the narrow limits of national prejudice and could analyze and judge his own country with a clear-cut acumen of a denizen from some outside planet. Mars, we will say, or better still, because still farther off, Jupiter. There was a boyishness in his conscious superiority of attitude, of which he was not at all conscious, and nothing would have angered him more than to have others so estimate it. Mr. Frisbee, as became a reputable citizen of Pawtucket R.I., was fiercely patriotic. Dissertations on the glories of America, past, present, and to come, were a chief staple of his conversation. Mr. Bryce grew weary of what he was pleased to term perpetual spirit eagling, and in a moment of irritation expressed a contrary view. After all, you know, he drawled in that British accent which he had cultivated with much assiduity and some success, it's not what we think of ourselves, so much as what other nations think of as that counts. The English have taken a queer fad for Americans of late, but at the bottom of their hearts, they know that we are far behind them in real civilization. And no wonder they do. Look at our civil service. Look at our administration of affairs. Look at our ridiculous Congress. And look at the absurd government of the cities. Sir, sir, broke in Mr. Frisbee, fairly spluttering with indignation. You must excuse me for saying so, but I think it's mighty poor business for an American to run down his native country and its institutions. My admiration for America is a very tempered one, I confess, in spite of the fact that I was born there, remarked Mr. Bryce calmly. The words native country do not mean so much to me as to some others, perhaps from the fact that I have had the chance to see something else. Mr. Frisbee's resentment at his speech was too deep for words. He marched away down the deck, mopping his heated forehead, while the pretty Elise tossed her head and said coquettishly, Why, Mr. Bryce? You ought to be ashamed of yourself. You're not a bit patriotic, are you? No, not if patriotism means swallowing your own country whole and thinking everything about her good, bad, or indifferent, absolute perfection, began Elliot loftily. But he stopped as he met Carl Walcott's grey eyes, fixed upon him with a look of indignation and sorrowful wonder. Mr. Bryce, she asked, did you ever read Scott's Lay of the Last Minstrel? Yes, of course. Oh, I see, flushing a little. I know what you're thinking of. I was thinking of the man, with so, so dead, who never to himself have said, This is my own, my native land. I always think of those lines when I hear people talk as you have been doing. I know you don't half mean it. You couldn't. But it is terrible even to pretend not to have any sympathy for the land to which you belong. That is a sentimental view if you will pardon me for saying so. Children are stuffed with it in our public schools, I believe. But really, grown persons must be allowed to discriminate, to philosophize. I don't think love of country is sentimental. It's a sentiment. There is a great difference between the two, and I don't see of what use philosophy can be if it teaches us to wrong our higher natures. Miss Walcott, but how dreadfully in earnest you are. This is only a light discussion such as people have on shipboard. You shouldn't take it so seriously. One cannot help being serious about such important things. I'm so sorry for you if you really feel as you say you do. A man without country is like a tree with its roots in the air. He cannot grow. He counts for nothing. Every wind of heaven blows him about. She paused. Her colour stole into her cheeks. I ought not to be so vehement, she said. Don't let's talk any more about it. It makes me too unhappy. Good night. She vanished down the deck. Car is so funny. She always gets stirred up like that when anyone abuses America, said Elise. Good night, Mr. Bryce. Are you glad or sorry that we shall be on land again tomorrow? Now you needn't try to be polite. I know you are glad. He was, and all the more after the recent conversation. It left him in a state of deep inward annoyance. Though what does she know about the matter, he said to himself. A quiet little country girl, brought up apparently on a diet of 4th of July orations. Who would have expected her to blaze out so? By Jove, her eyes fairly burn into me. I never dreamed there was so much fire about her. She actually seemed to pity me. Me? 
It was with real satisfaction that he exchanged farewells next morning with his fellow passengers and found himself whirling in a first-class compartment through the south of England on his way to Cornwall with the comfortable assurance that the Frisbee family was safe in Chester. One is not bound to keep up that sort of steamship acquaintance, he reflected. I shall probably never see or hear of them again, but man proposes and God disposes. Mr. Bryce had by no means done with the Frisbees. It was nearly two months after the Calabria landed her passengers in Liverpool that Mr. Elliot Bryce arrived late one night at Brussels and drove to the rooms which had been reserved for him in the pension corker. He had engaged them on the recommendation of a London acquaintance. It's not a large place, his friend had said, but comfortable and all that. You'll meet chiefly English there. Your countrymen haven't found it out yet, or they have sent up the prices. Sure to do that, you know, wherever they go. You'll find it a deal cheaper than the hotels if you're not above such considerations. Mr. Bryce, who had inherited a certain turn for thrift from a long line of sturdy merchant ancestors, was by no means above such considerations. He also enjoyed the idea of meeting chiefly English. His room struck him as comfortable, and he descended to the second breakfast in a benignant state of mind, which received a rude check as he entered the salle to be confronted by a row of familiar faces. They belonged to the Frisbee family, but they wore an air of unwanted dejection, which changed to relief and animation as they recognized him. Oh, ma, cried the pretty Elise, springing up rapturously. It is Mr. Bryce. It really is. How perfectly splendid. We didn't suppose anything so nice could happen in Brussels, did we? Now we shall mind it a bit. Pa, please change seats and let Mr. Bryce sit next car and me. We have such lots to say to him. Who could resist such warm of welcome and from so fair a creature? Elliot dropped into the chair indicated with a sense of being overcome by fate. It was not such a bad fate either. Elise was prettier than ever, it seemed to him, and his inexperienced eyes failed to discover that this improvement was in part due to the charming Paris clothes which she had wore, the fish, the fossé filet, and green peas, the curry and cheese and raspberry jam made their slow rounds of the table, while he lent a willing ear to the confidences of his voluble neighbour as to the haps and mishaps which had filled the interval since they parted. Yes, we stayed in England nearly a month, but it rained and rained and rained till we were desperate, and it was so cold that we wore our fur capes all the time. Till we wore them out, then Mark caught an awful influenza, and we got all so discouraged that we thought Europe was awful. But when we got to Paris, it was quite different. Paris was splendid. I liked it the best of any place we have been since we left home. The sun shone all the time. We never stayed in the house at all, and the Louvre was just lovely. I suppose you went there often. Oh yes, nearly every day. Their gloves are ever so much better than the Bon Marchés, don't you think so? All their things are better, in fact. Oh, such pretty wraps and the loveliest shoes and slippers. It's just a splendid place. You meant the magazine the Louvre then? Yes, what do you suppose I meant? The place where all those old pictures are? Carl used to go there, but the rest of us only went there once. We never could find the time. There was so much to do. And after Paris, where do you go? Oh, we stayed on there as long as we possibly could. But at last, Pa got impatient and said he had come to see Europe and not a lot of shops. And he made us come away. We went to Antwerp first and Bruges and then up to Holland. I did like that. It's such a dear little queer country, all cows and windmills and canals, just like the pictures. And from there we came straight here. We got in late on Saturday evening, and we had such a horrid time. Pa had never thought to telegraph, and all the first-class hotels were full. They couldn't give us rooms anywhere, and we drove about in the rain till we were tired out, and at last in despair, went to one which our driver recommended. And when we waked up the next morning, we found that its name was the Grand Hotel de Ostende and Prince Oscar's swimming baths. Now, Mr. Bryce, just think of it. Us staying at a swimming bar? It must have been a shock, said Elliot, highly diverted. And what did you do? Oh, Ma was fairly wild. She said she never could hold up her head in Pawtucket again if folks found out that she had been at such a place and that nothing could induce her to remain another night. She wouldn't go to church or anything but just pinned on her bonnet and said Pa must take us away, whether or no, 
So we looked into Badeka and found this pension mentioned with a star, and they had rooms. So we came here. I don't like it much, though, lowering her voice. Don't you? Why not? Oh, I don't know. It makes me think of boarding school, only it's stricter. There are rules hung up in all the rooms. You mustn't do this and you must do that. And if you're late to breakfast, you pay a franc. And on Sunday, when Lila and I came in late to dinner, Mrs. Cocker was so disagreeable. We explained that we didn't know that it was an hour early on Sundays than on other days. And she said there were the printed regulations and she expected her inmates to take the trouble to read them. And the people are so queer looking, so different from Americans. They hardly ever speak a word to us. And if we sit silent, they talk at us to each other and say it's so unpleasant having people at table who do not join in the general conversation. It was quite horrid all day yesterday. And the worst is that we have got to stay till Saturday for part of the rooms for a week. It won't be so bad though now that you are come. Elliot glanced round the table and in that glance made a rapid revision of his opinions as to the desirability of an exclusively British society. The company, which was decidedly queer-looking, seemed to him made up of pretty equal parts of half-pay officers, purple with port or sallow of India, their wives, and maiden ladies of an age by no means uncertain, who spotted headdresses of wonderful make, stiff with ribbons and spiky flowers, mortuary jewellery, Greystones and whipping willows, rimmed pearls, locks of hair mounted in jet or gold frame miniatures. They all, to a woman, wore fuzzy little curls, which they wave and wag vivaciously at the half-pay officers as they refought the whist battles of the night before. At times, the discussion waxed vehement. But, Major, you have forgotten. I do assure you, you have forgotten. You played the ten, you know. Miss Jackson put on her knife, and I trumped with my seven of diamonds. Madame, you have it all mixed up. It was I who played the queen. Miss Jackson threw away her knave on it. You didn't trump to the next hand. Oh, Major Brown, indeed you are mistaken. I appeal to Mrs. Brown. She will remember how it was, I'm sure. Madam, I am never mistaken. My memory is my strong point. And as for my wife, she knows better than to differ with me, I can assure you. But Miss Jackson, Miss Jackson will never go against me. Will you, Miss Jackson? Oh, never. Surely not, dear Major Brown. I am quite, quite sure you must be right. Right angle angles, flirting with isosceles triangles, quoted Mr. Bryce to himself, and turned to meet an answering flash of fun in the grey eyes of Carl Walcott. You seem amused, he said, smiling. Oh, I am. It's exactly like Dickens. I am so glad we had to come here. Miss Lucatia talks and Joey Bat talks, sir have suddenly grown real and possible. We should never have met them anywhere else. Who is that stout person opposite Mrs. Cocker? That is Captain Briggs. They say he is a partner in the business. Though no one is supposed to know it, they take turns in praising the food. End of The Quiet Girl Part 1 Recording by Jade from Linwood The Barbary Bush and Eight Other Stories for Girls by Susan Coolidge A Quiet Girl, Part 2 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org The Barbary Bush and Eight Other Stories for Girls by Susan Coolidge A Quiet Girl, Part 2 In effect, at that moment Mrs. Cocker, with a bland smile, was heard to say, Try the curried lamb, Captain. It's very fine today. With the immediate response, Your cook's a treasure, Mrs. Cocker. I don't know a better in Brussels. And presently, Elliot heard, What's this wine, Mrs. Cocker? The claret with the yellow seal, hey? It's mighty good stuff, I can tell you. Sipping ostentatiously, I advise you to hold on to it. It will be worth twice what it is now in another year or two. Stroff and empty straw, muttered Elliot and his companion replied with such a soft little laugh that, moved by a sudden impulse, he added, I hope you've forgiven me, in part at least, for my heterodox sentiments last night on the steamer. Really, I'm not so bad as I seemed. Oh, Mr. Bryce, I was vexed at myself afterward for speaking so strongly. I wanted to apologize to you, 
My father says I'm much too peppery for a woman, where country is concerned. But you keep to the same opinion. Oh, yes, indeed. Nothing will change that, I hope. But I should have remembered that I was not responsible for yours, and that you had a right to differ if you felt differently. Only I wish you didn't. We will exchange forgiveness then, said Elliot lightly, as Mrs. Cocker made the move to rise. This was all pleasant enough, but far less, so the evening spent later in the salon, when the English continent gathered itself together and looked askance at the American intruders, among whom Elliot, to his vast disgust, found himself included. Mrs. Frisby, wrathful and sensitive, bound to support her own dignity and that of Portucket, sat in the midst ignoring snubs and sneers and in a high-pitched voice discounted on the superiority of things in america to all other countries appealing now and again to him for corroboration which he was equally unwilling to give or to withhold this terrible evening renewed all his sense of distaste for the frisbee family and led to the determination of seeing as little as possible of them during their stay he hastily resolved on a series of all-day expeditions to Ghent, to Bourges, to Malines, and to Waterloo, which kept him away from Brussels so effectually that he saw the Frisbees but once again, and that was when, from behind his blinds, he witnessed their departure early on the Saturday morning. Again he felicitated himself on the unlikelihood of their further meeting. A few weeks later he was crossing the Tetanoi, on foot on his way from Martigny to Chamoni. It had been a morning of wonderful beauty, with mists in the deeper gorges curling up fantastically to be lost in a sapphire blue sky. The higher agulets, glittering in freshly fallen snow, shone with a clear-cut intensity, which made them doubly high and sharp, and from half-seen depths of verdure below the mist, the chime of innumerable cowbells corded in sweet-toned tinkles rose like a wandering and vagrant music. Suddenly all was changed. Heavy clouds swept up from the north and blotted out the brightness. A light rain began to fall, which presently increased to a wild downpour, varied by sleep. A wind which seemed born in the Arctic regions flung the storm directly into his face. Drenched, buffeted and benumbed, it was with relief that he spied not far ahead a place of refuge. It was a small inn, sat close beside the pass, whose sign bore this imposing legend, Grand Hotel de la Cascade, de la Baverine, in letters of green on an orange ground. Short as had been his exposure to the rain, Mr. Bryce was thoroughly soaked, and he gladly made his way toward the fire which he saw blazing under a rude chimney-piece in the otherwise bare dining-room. A party of travellers, also surprised by the storm, had arrived half an hour before him, and were drying themselves round the hearth. It was again the Frisbees who encountered him in this unlikely place, where, as a general thing, no one halted except guides on their return journeys, and now and then a traveller belated or unable to account of whether to cross the pass. They were not as effusive at the sight of their ocean acquaintance as they had been at Brussels. His marked avoidance of them there had left a sting. Mrs. Frisbee had formed the firm opinion that he gave himself airs, which was a thing she could not abide, and even the sweet-natured Elise had felt hurt and resentful. His extreme wetness, however, was more than their kind hearts could resist, and promptly, though not so happily, as if he had shown his desire to avoid them less plainly, they made room for him by the fire. He was so chilled that his lips looked blue so benumbed that his greetings were almost unintelligible. My dear sir, cried Mr. Frisbee, melting into compassion, you must have some brandy at once. Lila, get the flask from my black bag. It's some I brought from home, Mr. Bryce. Got it in Newport, in fact. Sure to be good there, you know. Garson, a protest in glass. In glass, vous savez. In glass, to meter this in. There, he understands. They always do if you say it over often enough. Now, my dear sir, not a word. You must take it. Elliot, quite unable to refuse, swallowed the brandy gratefully. It did him a world of good. As his powers of speech came back, he tried to make a little talk with the ladies of the party, but his efforts were not cordially received. Mrs. Frisbee tossed her head and replied in monosyllables. Elise was unwontedly constrained. 
The unpleasant Lila turned her back on him and walked over to the window. Edward saw that he had given deep offence and internally execrated the unlucky chance which had brought about so untoward a meeting. Only Miss Walcott was unchanged. Her eyes met his pleasantly, and she spoke in her usual manner, courteously and gently. He and she exchanged a few sentiments, then a constrained silence fell upon the group, broken by Lila from her post of observation at the window. Oh, Ma, the here are two nuns coming up the hill, and they haven't any umbrella, and are just as wet as salt. How funny they do look! Poor superstitious creatures. I dare say they are taught that using umbrellas is sinful. The Romish church is capable of anything, remarked Mrs. Frisbee, whose sympathies were the reverse of Catholic. In another moment, the nuns entered, constrained to do so, as it appeared, by the landlord, for they stood shyly by the door and did not come forward. They were Christuses, or sisters of charity, sent forth over the long round from Martigny to Geneva, and so back by the valley of the Rhone to solicit alms for their convent and the orphanage which it supported. One was elderly, one young and remarkably pretty. Both were dripping wet. Water ran from the hems of their black gowns and their stuffed veils. Little pools formed around them as they stood with their muddy shoes on the sanded floor, timidly regarding the strangers. Nothing would have induced Mrs. Frisbee to so far play into the hands of the scarlet woman as to offer her chair to a sister of charity, however wet. But Carl Walcott jumped up at once hurried to the covering black figures, and Elliot heard her say in French, which to his surprise was quite as good as his own. You are very wet, my sisters. You must have come a long way in the storm. Take this seat and dry yourselves by the fire. Mademoiselle is very good. The elder sister suffered herself to be placed in the chair. Mr. Frisbee gave his to the pretty one. I never saw anybody so wet, went on Miss Walker, kindly hanging a black cloak nearer the blaze. Oh, your poor shoes! how muddy they are could you not take them off perhaps the landlady would put them into her oven to dry while you sit here and keep warm let me help you to unfasten them no dear mademoiselle we must not do that putting back the helpful hand then in a lower voice we never should be able to get them on again if we took them off now they must dry on our feet or they will be quite spoiled and we have no others poor wretches thought elliot as his hand fumbled in his damp pocket he held the coin which it brought forth hidden while he listened to the low voice talk behind him. But surely, surely you will stay here tonight and go on tomorrow in pleasant weather. You will not face the storm again. Oh, mademoiselle, we must. We may not stay in inns. It is only in the sisters' houses or at the priest's that we are permitted to sleep. But the storm, it is nothing. We have often been out in worse. But how far must you go then before you are allowed to stop, insisted Carl. It will be the presbytere at Argentiras, mademoiselle, about four miles farther. Four miles? And in this dreadful weather? And suppose the priest should be away and his house locked up? Then we should go to the church and wait. That will not be locked up. And the church is the true home for all of us, mademoiselle. There was a little chink of silver, and Elliot knew that Carl was slipping an offering into his sister's hand even before the soft, oh, merci, merci bien, mademoiselle, which followed. He got up, and as he passed, dropped his own dole into the lap of the elder nun. Paul was pauvres, ma soeur, he said, and was rewarded by a beam of pleasure and surprise from Miss Walcott's eyes. Mr. Frisbee, I must beg that you will not give these people anything, he heard Mrs. Frisbee say. I know they are wet, and one of them is good-looking, spitefully. But they are papists all the same, and I object to my family having dealings with them. Next morning, he parted for the third time with the Frisbees. It's funny how we keep meeting, isn't it? said Elise, who had warmed into cordiality again, and he replied, Well, not so much so as it seems. Europe is a small place, after all. People are forever crossing each other's paths. I dare say we shall meet again frequently, but he forbore to ask their plans. Che sera, sera, he thought. But there's no use anticipating evil. They are good people enough. Certainly they were very kind about their brandy. And that quiet little Miss Walcott isn't half bad. I suspect, in fact, she proved very nice if one could get her by herself without the others. Still, for all that, I wish they were all safely back in America. But no such good luck. They'll turn up again presently, no doubt. But time passed. 
so long a time in fact that mr bryce had forgotten his apprehensions and the frisbees did not turn up he took a little run down into montenegro he spent a month in the Wallachian provinces and made the tour of the danube winding up in st petersburg all of them unlikely places for running across the average american tourist april found him a little worn with travel and rather hungry for english speech settled at sorrento for a month or six weeks with a sense of pleasure in being able to take life in an easier and more leisurely way than had of late been possible the spring of south italy was in full perfection every orange grove and olive orchard and clump of aloe and agave was putting its whole soul into the work of making the world delightful roses and myrtles perfumed the air the very sea seemed emulous and responded with a balm of salt fragrance to the fragrances of the shore some english people with whom he had made acquaintance at the table de pote of his hotel had chartered a large boat for the road to capri and asked him to make one of the party major hawker the getter up of the excursion was one of these somewhat battered warriors on half pay who pervade the continent communicating to his alien heirs an odour of chutney sauce and indian reminiscences he was of trusulent demeanour and boasted that in the course of two years spent in italy he had never given to a single beggar a single soul this was certainly not for one of asking for in sorrento every other wayfarer whom one meets in the road solicits elms take away your nasty dirty paw roared the major as a miserable object crept nearer to where he stood with elliot bryce in the gateway of the tramontana there don't tell me they don't understand english they understand me fast enough i can assure you then he resumed the topic of morrow's arrangement there are some people at the falcon whom streeter asked to fill the boat i forget what they call themselves but no matter there's a pretty girl among them and they'll do to make up our load got to have the boat full you know makes it come cheaper to us all by the way the what do you call them are compatriots of yours i believe americans from somewhere or other i never can remember your confounded names over there well be ready at half nine sharp you understand so at half nine sharp next morning mr bryce appointed in all respects as a well-bred sightseer should be with field glass badecker knickerbockers and gaiters ran lightly down the fern-bordered path whose zigzags led into the depths of the great sorrento gorge toward the sand beach which forms its outlet the boat with its gay awnings was ready its red-shirted yellow sash rowers keeping in patient watch of the path down which the passengers were to come a part of them seemed already arrived for there was a flutter of wheels under the awning and a gentleman watch in hand was pacing the beach he turned as elliot came down and presented the well-known form of mr frisbee this is an unexpected pleasure said elliot i hope you are all well quite so quite so was the reply mrs frisbee isn't with us to-day she doesn't affection the sea much as you remember and preferred to stay on at the hotel the others are on board the boat we are going over to the island there capri i believe they call it to see something called the azure grotto the young ladies set their hearts upon it or i should have contented myself with the description in the guidebook these sea voyages are not much to my mind oh this isn't a sea voyage the bay is as smooth as glass you won't mind it at all said mr bryce reassuringly then he stepped into the boat and shook hands with the young ladies lila pretended not to see him oh stuck-up thing she whispered to her sister i ain't going to shake hands with him he's brimful of airs ma said so hush lila i shan't hush you needn't think i'm going to be bossed by you the rest of the party now arrived and they rode out over the lovely bay the boatmen timing their oar strokes to a refrain of macaroni botticlia molto macaroni molto botticlia which seemed suggestive of a compensating future after their day's toil with every flash of the blades capri grew more distinct and more beautiful its outlines which from the distance had seemed fairy woven of blue air resolved themselves into bold headlands and promontories over which lines of white glittering foam incessantly dashed nearer they drew and still nearer now they were rowing in the deep shadow cast by a great purple precipice, over which they were shelving slopes of exquisite verdure now fragments of ruined walls raised by the cyclops it would seem 
so enormous were the blocks towered above their heads. Then a shining beach with a steep white path zigzagging up from it and glimpses of walls and dwellings above. The sea, where the sun smelt it, was all shimmering rose and silver. In the shadows it was of iridescent hues like a peacock's breast and a mingling of blues and greens with soft suffusions of pearl and violet, indescribably strange and exquisite. An old boatman in a narrow skiff waited at the entrance to row them into the grotto. He could take but three at a time, and it so befell that Elliot Bryce, Carl Walcott, and Mrs. Hawker, wife of the pugnacious mayor, were first to go, bending flat in their seats as, with one bold stroke, the boat shot under the low broad arch of the cave. Within all was soft blue gloom of a strange ethereal tint quite unlike the common blues of sea or sky. Nowhere save in the heart of glaciers or icebergs is seen that unearthly depth of pale perfect colour. The roof above them rose to a great height, and as they floated across the mysterious space beneath, torches were lit on rock shells high over their heads, and a white shape shot from above and dived and flashed in the water, which broke into widening circles lit with blue flashing fire. Every drop that fell from the oars, every ripple which broke on the rocks, was charged with the same magical iridescence. It was a glory of colour, but all the colour was blue. Oh, how wonderful, said Carr, drawing a long breath. It is another world quite different from ours, which seems suggestive. It's all explained in the books, my dear, said prosaic Mrs. Hawker. There's nothing very wonderful about it, I believe. It's all refraction or reflection, I forget which, but it's all easily explained. I don't want it explained, said Carr, almost in a whisper. The unexplained is always the most beautiful. To shoot out into the light of common day after that peep into the cool underworld was curiously disillusionizing. Elliot felt it. The shrieks and exclamations of each returning party, the idle chatter of those left in the boat jarred upon him. He betook himself to the boatman, with whom he talked a while in somewhat halting Italian. Then he returned to where Carr was sitting, the only silent member of the noisy group. The men tell me, he said in a low tone, that there is a path from here up the cliff to Anna Capri, which is the highest point on the island. I think I shall try it and walk down to meet the rest at the Tibero. I dare say I shall get there as soon as they will. The row round is so long. He paused. Then with a quick impulse which surprised him even as he yielded to it, added, Why shouldn't you go with me? As far as I can make out from the men, the climb isn't a very steep one, and the walk down from Anna Capri is beautiful as I know, for I took it once years ago. Carr hesitated. If only Mr. Frisby and Elise were here, she said. Then with sudden determination, surprised in her turn by the strength of desire for mutual adventure, which took possession of her, she added, I'm sure they won't mind. Yes, Mr. Bryce, I'll go. All right. In another moment, he had helped her to land on the flat rock, to which one of the men held the boat, and they vanished up the cliff. The boatman said something as they passed, but Elliot did not listen. A moment later, Mr. Frisby and his daughters shot out of the blue grotto. Why, where is Carr? asked Elise after a moment of exclamation. She has gone up to the cliff to Anna Capri with Mr. Price. Price, I believe, is the name. They are to walk down and meet us at the hotel where we lunch. Mrs. Hawker's tone was stiff. Gone? Up there? Why, there is no path at all, whatever they possess Carr, and with Mr. Price too, of all persons. It's rather a venturesome thing to attempt said one of the young Englishmen. I didn't understand what was going forward. Or I should have warned your friend. I don't think she could have known what she was undertaking. There's almost no path, the oldest boatman says. It is a way for goats and not for ladies. Oh, she'll be killed, cried Elise, bursting into tears. Oh, why didn't somebody stop her? Come back, Carr. You can't possibly go up that way. Carr, Carr, come back. But no answer returned from the cliff. It would, in fact, have been impossible for the climbers to return to the point from which they had set out, even had the calls from below reached their ears. On a path so steep, to turn back, even to look back, invited catastrophe. It took but a few moments to show Carl Walcott the risk of the undertaking which she had so lightly accepted. The track, if track it could be called, was up steep, slippery rocks, hot with sun, or across shelving lava-like masses, which crumbled and gave way under the tread. There was bare footing, nothing to catch at or hold by, and to slip meant a fall down the sheer cliff into the sea below. Happily, she was light and active, 
and her girlhood spent among the Vermont mountains had taught her how to climb. Well was it for her that her head was steady and her foot sure, for never had her powers been so heavily taxed as now. For a breathless quarter of an hour they made their way upward, with a sense of imminent risk in every step. Then they reached a point where the incline was easier and Carl could turn to speak to her companion, who, after the first moment or two, had found the task of keeping his own footing so onerous that he had not attempted to offer her any assistance. We are nearly on top at last, she said, smiling though breathless. There were times when I thought we should end at the bottom. Mr. Bryce did not answer. There were curious blue shadows under his eyes and at the corners of his mouth, and he sank down on a rock with a look of exhaustion. Carr was startled at his appearance. I had not the least notion that it was like this, or I would have never urged you to come, he said as he recovered his breath. It hasn't hurt me in the least. I am used to climbing. You seem more tired than I feel. I am rather done up, though I cannot think why I should be, for I have climbed all my life. Up place is quite as bad as this sometimes. It is only for a moment. I shall be all right presently. She sat down near him and looked back over the way by which they had come, realizing more clearly than before its dangers, and then forgetting danger and everything else in the exquisite beauty of the view. From the cliff's sheer edge stretched the Bay of Naples, a sheet of shimmering turquoise, bounded in the distance by the domes and towers of the city, and behind them the dark blue outlines of Vesuvius, over which floated a light curl of smoke. The farther islands reared their translucent shapes, out of the jewel-tinted water, scarce denser in appearance than the clouds which floated above them. Every glint of every wave, every breath of the magical atmosphere seemed suffused with the spirit of old fable. That way sailed Ulysses, and there had Siren sung, that Seche, seated on her enchanted shore, had waited to draw the souls of men into a pitiless net. It seemed easier at that moment to credit the picturesque belief of old paganism than to realize the existence of the modern world, with its tenser creeds, its more stringent standards, its insistent needs and responsibilities. We ought to go, I suppose, said Elliot, rousing himself with an effort. The others will get to the marina before us, and Mrs. Harker does not seem the sort of person who would easily forgive a delay in the luncheon. If you're not tired, that is, Miss Walcott. Carr privately taught him in much greater need of rest than herself, but she did not say so, and they went on. It was a stiff climb still over the upper slope of the cliff and up to the hamlet of Anna Capri, which perches like an eagle on its difficult airy. But the risk were over, and the path was more defined. There were bushes and an occasional tree by way of support, and a foothold was no longer slippery. Twenty minutes brought them to the village, where a brief halt in a glass of vino di Capri refreshed them both, and they set out for the downward tram with a sense of having conquered tough fate and minds attuned to enjoyment. A little boy, shoeless, hatless, and girded with a yellow sash, ran after them as they turned into the path, screaming something in the island patois which neither of them understood, and of which they consequently took no notice. Mr. Bryce tossed him a sword, but it did not content the child, who still pursued them, calling out the same reiterated phrase and fairly dancing with excitement. He actually caught hold of Carl's dress at last, striving to pull her back and gesticulating wildly. This is rather too much, cried Elliot, giving the lad a shake. Here, you little scamp, let that alone, will you? He pulled out a silver coin. Take that and be off with you, do you hear? Go back, I tell you, energetically. Via ragazzo, via capisco. His gesture left no doubt as to his meaning. The boy hesitated, ran a few steps farther, halted. But he still looked perplexed and distressed and continued to call after them the same phrase, which had in it a note of warning as well as supplication. The others continued their rapid course down the hill. That child seemed awfully troubled about something, said Carr thoughtfully, when they had gone some distance. I half thought that it was about us that he was troubled. Do you suppose he could have known of any danger that we are running into? Why, no, how could he? We are all right. This is the plain path up and down which the islanders go every day. There is no possibility of danger about it. The light words were scarcely out of his mouth when there was a sound of a violent explosion and a shower of stones, large and small, fell on the path before them with a thundering noise. Miss Walker gave a little scream and they stopped short. For two or three minutes they stood irresolute, whether to go forward or back. Then came the sound of another blast and a fresh shower of stones fell behind them. We must get out of this, cried Elliot. That was what the boy was trying to warn us of, that this blasting was going on. We shall have to go back to Anne Capri and wait. But don't you see that we can't go back? We are between two fires. 
it is as bad to go up as to go down. What can we do then? He seemed strangely shaken and irresolute. The blue shadows had come back to his mouth and eyes. Carr instinctively felt that for the moment that she was the stronger of the two. What we must do, she said, the only thing we can do is to wait till another blast comes ahead of us and then run for our lives and get past the point of danger before the next follows. I'm not sure I scarcely know, began her escort irresolutely. But the blast sounded and Carr, who was very sure, seized his hand the moment that the stones ceased to fall and started at a rapid run across the space. They reached the stones, they passed the stones, but long before she felt that they were in safety, Elliot halted, breathless, gasping out. That will do. We must be quite past the danger now, Miss Walcott. We can stop here, I think. Indeed, we cannot. We haven't gone far enough yet. There is still danger. Oh, don't you see that there is still danger? Mr. Bryce, come on. Do come on, she cried. As he still hesitated, she seized his hand again and almost forced him to run forward with her. They had not gone twenty yards when another avalanche of stones descended exactly where they had been standing, while he assured her that they were past the danger. Now I think we are beyond the line of fire, she said, releasing her grasp upon his arm. But we were not till now, Mr. Bryce, as you see. I see. You are quite right. I can't think what is the matter with me today. It is you who do all the thinking and all the hard work too, he added, trying to smile, but evidently disgusted with himself. You are very tired, it seems to me. Could it be the sun on that hot cliff, do you think? My head is aching a little. I seem given to headaches of late, but it really amounts to nothing. I am ashamed of having let such a little thing upset me, replied Elliot, with a man's resentment at any physical failure. Indeed, I don't consider headaches a little thing, said Carr gently. It overmasters all of us when it comes on. A man with a red flag now appeared. He had been sent to guard the path and turn back travellers from below. It had not been supposed that there was need for similar precaution above. No strangers were staying at Anna Capri, and the inhabitants of the little commune had been duly warned of the blasting hours. The anger and astonishment of this man at the sight of the walkers were indescribable. He stood staring at them as though thunderstruck for a moment, then poured forth a torrent of reproaches and expertise in the island patois, of which Elliot could only make out that they had no business to be there, that they were violating a law, a very serious law, that the authorities of Capri were responsible for accidents incurred by public blasts, and disobedience to orders might cause expense, yes, a great expense. Were they to be ruined because all the English were mad? Precautions? Yes, but of what use were precautions? Of what use was it for him, Giovanni Ravelli, to leave his farm work and raise his day waving flags of warning on a hillside if Forestieri were to come dropping out of the skies and against all expectations to get himself killed and ruin the community? At one time, Carr thought that he would actually insist upon their going back to Anna Capri to come down again at the permitted time of the day. But at length, time, his own objurgations and a five-franc piece so far softened his resentment that somewhat sullenly he allowed them to proceed. These delays made them very late at the Hotel Tiberio, where they found the party nearly true with their delayed luncheon, and not disposed to give them a very cordial reception. Elise had cried herself into a headache. Mr. Frisby looked sour and displeased, and the English chaperones who regarded affairs highly improper and American preserved a rigid dignity of demeanour. You just spoil our whole day, whispered Elise petulantly. I've been frightened nearly to death about you, and so has Pa. That Mrs. Hawker has kept on saying the most unpleasant things, and the Englishmen have shrugged their shoulders till I long to box their ears all around. You're all blown to bits, and Mr. Bryce looks half dead. Oh, Carr, how could you? I can't think why I went, said Carr penitently, and I'm so sorry I did. Forgive me, Elise, dear. You'll be sorry for us, not angry when you hear what a time we have had. Her humility and the recital of their perils won a partial pardon for the offences. They were allowed some half-cold luncheon, and amnesty being restored, the party finished the excursion by a drive to the ruined palace of the Emperor Tiberius. Later came the road back to Sorrento, across the sunset-tinted moonlighted sea, the chorus of Moto Macaroni, Moto Bottiglia, increasing in volume and intensity as they neared the shore. I think it will be best not to mention your adventure on the cliff to Mrs. Frisby, Miss Carr said Mr. Frisby, as he led his party up the steep path. She'll probably be quite disturbed by it, and as all has ended well, I see no use in making her uncomfortable. You understand, Lila, don't you? You are not to say a word to your mother. 
cow was grateful to be spared. Mrs. Frisby disturbed was not a pleasant object to encounter, and though it would never have occurred to her to object to cow's escapade on the ground of conventional propriety, she would undoubtedly have resented highly of what she had termed her going off with a stuck-up peacock like that Mr. Bryce, who seemed to think himself too good for Americans and was always trying to get in with the English, as if he were ashamed of his own people. So the Anna Capri episode remained a secret, even Lila feeling it the part of wisdom to observe her father's hint with regard to it. What made me do that? Carr asked herself in the secrecy of her own thoughts. It wasn't a bit like me. I was never the sort of girl who acts from impulse and gets into scrapes. I don't think I ever did anything of the sort before in my life, and I am sure I hope I never shall again. It's absolutely unaccountable. They met Mr. Bryce only once more during the short remainder of their stay at Sorrento. This was when he came with due politeness to call, and more particularly to ask if Miss Walcott had suffered from her exertions, inquiries which, in obedience to him from Elise, were kept safely general. He was scrupulously courteous to all, and made himself very pleasant, but Carr thought him looking unwell, and imagined that he had not got over the effects of the Anna Capri incident as easily as she herself had done. From Sorrento the Frisbees went on to Naples, whence, after duly doing the customary things, they proceeded to Rome. There they stayed longer than they had intended, the single week allotted for the visit in Mr. Frisbee's itinerary proving much too short for the desires of the party. Each in turn, and for a different reason, experienced the spell which the eternal city cast over its lovers. To Elise, it took the form of society. The American consul general of the moment chanced to be a Rhode Islander, and this fact led to various invitations, balls at the Quinerial and elsewhere, picnics on the Campagna, receptions and dinners at which Miss Frisbee's charming face and French toilette, together with the reputation of her father's wealth, gave her vogue as a belle. To Carr, ancient Rome as seen in ruins and medieval Rome as represented in picture galleries, vied in interest. Mrs. Frisbee found some acquaintances at the hotel, and with them, plunged into a vortex of shops and shopping, while Mr. Frisbee experienced a newborn pleasure in joining certain archaeological parties in visits to tombs and catacombs, under the guidance of an obliging savant who turned his erudition to account by imparting it for consideration to less well-informed strangers. So it befell that it was fully six weeks after the day, at Capri, when packed into diligence of the old-fashioned type, with rumble, banquet, and three horses jingling with bells, the party found themselves mounting the steep inclines of the road between Bolsena and Perugia. This deter from the beaten track of everyday travel was undertaken at the instance of the archaeologists before mentioned, under whose auspices Mr. Frisbee had imbibed learning and tradition during his stay in Rome. So much had been said by him of the delightfulness of getting off the railroads and onto the less known and unmodernized byways of Italian travel, and so much as to the Etruscan remains at Montefiascon and Viterbo, and the splendid architectural details at Perugia and Assisi, that Mr. Frisbee, warm into enthusiasm, had persuaded. It might almost be said coerce his wife into consenting to a divergence on the way to Florence to visit these places. It was now late in the month of May, and summer seemed fairly established in the fair Southland, with such wealth of blossom and luxuriance of vine grass and rose sprays as Rhode Island never knew. Each breath in their divine air and sunshine was a separate pleasure. Even Mrs. Frisbee was forced to confess that travelling by carriage in such weather had something agreeable about it. She had deeply resented the brick floor of her bedroom in Bolsena, and certain sour bread, of which, it being a case of Hobson's choice, she had unwillingly partaken at Viterbo but it had dawned upon her that these privations might in the end be found repaying. Visions of herself dazzling the Portacut world with allusions to places of which no other return traveller knew anything, danced before her eyes and lent her patience to endure the light affliction of a moment with becoming resignation. The diligence drew up at the door of a small wayside inn, scarcely more than an austeria, and the driver explained in such broken English as he had at command that the horses needed an hour's halt for rest and to be fed. It's small, but not ill for the lady. You call the brin to eat, to drink, pane, vino, chianti, what he will. Very good, well. The landlord, a swarthy black-browed man, stood in the doorway inviting them by signs to enter the house, but the interior did not look inviting and Mrs. Frisbee preferred a branch outside. We might as well have something, she said. Ask what they got, Miss Carr, will you? An omelette and some real good oolong tea would be nice. 
but I don't suppose there's a cup of decent tea to be had within miles. He might give us some milk, perhaps, or a bottle of that red wine. I never can remember the name of it, and it all tastes precisely alike to me, like a mixture of vinegar and ink. Dear me, how I should enjoy a glass of ice cream soda on this hot day, she fanned herself. Carr had taken a few Italian lessons at Sorrento and in consequence had been elected interpreter to the party. Her vocabulary was limited but sufficed for the very moderate demands of the present occasion as she translated Mrs. Frisbee's wishes to the landlord. He shrugged his shoulders apologetically. Unhappily, his wife was detained from the kitchen by a sick person in the house, which made all things difficult. Even an omelette he could not promise. So slight a thing as that. The girl only was left to do for him, and she knew nothing, next to nothing, a mere contadina. Scrub? Yes. Cook? No. Wine of the best there was, and bread, and olives. Could the noble ladies do with these? Is it your child who is ill? inquired Carr. My child? But no, we have no child. The sick person was a signor in glass. He had stopped there four days before on his way to Perugia on foot as these mad English often were, and had been unable to go on. It was una febre molto funesta, and for his part, he, the landlord, knew not what to do. He could not put the stranger out on the road to die, but to have him in his house was a calamity, a true calamity, molto sinistro. He was wild at times and made much noise. It took all madame's time to care for him, time she could ill spare in that place where helpers could not be had, and Forest Terry kept arriving as the noble ladies had done, and calling for refreshments, and who was there to serve them properly? He did his possible, but had he ten pairs of hands? Omelette? No. Coffee? Yes, and wine. Those they could have, and milk, certainly milk. Good gracious, a case of fever, cried Mrs. Frisbee, when this explanation was explained to her. We shall all catch it. Lila, at least, come away directly. She scuttled across the road, followed by her daughters, to a bench which stood under some trees opposite the house, while the landlord sorrowfully ejaculated, Behold, did I not say it? It is a calamity. End of A Quiet Girl, Part 2 Recording by J. The Barbary Bush and Eight Other Stories for Girls by Susan Coolidge A Quiet Girl, Part 3 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org The Barbary Bush and Eight Other Stories for Girls by Susan Coolidge A Quiet Girl, Part 3 Where on earth is your father? demanded Mrs. Frisbee. We must get away from here as soon as we ever can. There's nothing in the world that I dread like typhoid. Coffee? No. Tell the man I wouldn't drink a drop of his coffee for anything. It would give us all the contagion as like as not. I declare, I can hear the man raving all the way out here. Oh, where is Mr. Frisbee? It was true. From an upper window in the front of the inn, a low muttering sound was audible, which at times rose into louder tones. Carr listened a moment with the rest. What is the name of this English signor? she demanded. Signora, it's not for me to pronounce the names of Forestieri. They're too difficult. Besides, the Signor did not write in the Book of Travellers, but his Libro di Viago is within, and in it a name which we believe to be his. The Signora shall see it. Perhaps she might know his friends in Al Inglinetera. He went in and returned with a red bound badeca, which she presented to Carr with a triumphant echo. Don't touch it! screamed Mrs. Frisbee from the opposite side of the road. Don't take it into your hand, Carr. It will give you the fever if you do. But Carr had already seized the volume and was staring with dilated eyes and a pale face at the inscription on the title page. Elliot Bryce, Boston, USA. Oh, Mrs. Frisbee, oh, Elise, she cried, hurrying to where he sat with a book in her hand. Just think, it is Mr. Bryce who is here ill. This is his book. His name is in it. Is it not dreadful? What shall we do? Do, shrieked Mrs. Frisbee. Why, get away as fast as you possibly can, to be sure. What is Mr. Bryce to us? But surely you will not go away and leave him alone with his people, who do not speak a word of English, and with no doctor or nurse or anything. Indeed I will. Do you think I am going to stay here and let my family die of fever for the sake of Mr. Bryce? I assure you I am not. Mr. Bryce doesn't belong to our party, and I never took any stock in him anyways. 
He never was at the least pains to be nice, but seemed to think we were all as common as dirt. I don't owe him any kindness for one that I would say. But Mrs. Frisbee, he is an American, one of our own countrymen. We couldn't have the heart to leave him in his place to die alone. Mr. Frisbee will stay, I'm sure, if you think the rest of us must go on. Mr. Frisbee will do no such thing. I shall see to that. My husband's life doesn't seem to be much of value to you, but it's worth a good deal to me. What is the matter, my dear? asked Mr. Frisbee, who appeared at this moment. What is the matter? The matter, began Carr, but Mrs. Frisbee took the words out of her mouth. The matter is, Mr. Frisbee, that we have just found out that that stuck-up, disagreeable Mr. Bryce is sick over in the house of fever, typhus probably, and Miss Carr seems to think that it's the duty of all of us to stay and take care of him and catch it. I don't know how young ladies feel about such things, sarcastically. I was brought up different when I was a girl, but I'm not interested in Mr. Bryce, and I don't propose to sacrifice myself or any of my family members for his benefit. So you'll please hurry up the horses and let us get away as fast as we can. Mr. Frisbee, said Carr in an agitated voice, of course I never meant to expose Mrs. Frisbee or any of you to the risk of catching fever. But it seems to me that to stay here a day or two till your doctor and nurse can be found need not be a dangerous exposure. You could telegraph from Assisi or the nearest railroad point to Florence. There must be English doctors there, and it wouldn't take more than two days, I think, to get one up here. Mr. Bryce, from what the landlord says, is very ill, delirious, and it seems too cruel to turn our backs and leave him here without help. If he died, we should never forgive ourselves. If Mrs. Frisbee think the rest of us must go on, won't you at least stay with him till a nurse can come? I? Why, yes, of course I will, began kind little Mr. Frisbee, but his terrible better half struck in. Mr. Frisbee, you will do nothing of the sort. I am not going to leave you here to catch typhus, and I am not going to stay myself. I should like to know who Miss Carr expects will take us home and do for us when we get there, after she's killed you off in this fever hole. Go at once and order the men to put in the horses. Mr. Frisbee hesitated. Carr's appeal had affected him. Left to himself, he was the last man to turn his back on a countryman in distress. But the habit of marital obedience was strong upon him. He looked at his wife's relentless face. He looked at Elise, who was crying. The sound of her sobs was the only interruption to the brief, fateful silence. He avoided Carr's imploring eyes. Tell the man to come round at once, repeated Mrs. Frisbee inexorably. Yes, my dear, Mr. Frisbee had succumbed. He turned to go. Then, said Carr, in a voice made unnaturally clear by the sudden flash of anger in her veins, if you really are capable of going away and leaving a fellow countryman to die alone, I am not. I should scorn myself to the last day of my life if I did such a thing. Go, if you will, but I shall stay here and do my best to keep Mr. Bryce alive till someone comes along to help. Carr, you can't. I must, if no one else will. There must be plenty of doctors and nurses at Florence. You can get the address at the bankers tomorrow. Make them come at once, Mr. Frisbee. They must bring medicines and stimulants with them. There is nothing to be had here. The minute they get here, I will leave and join you. I consider it a most improper arrangement, said Mrs. Frisbee icily. So do I. It ought not to be put upon me, but someone must help Mr. Bryce. If you won't, I am forced to do it. I won't then. That is all there is about it. She stopped majestically away down the road. Oh, darling Carr, don't stay. Don't, pleaded at least. Mama will be so angry. People will talk about you. Why should you do it for Mr. Bryce? You don't really care about him. If I did, I should hesitate. Perhaps. Though I hope not. Dear Elise, don't you see that I must? I will do the same for any American, for any stranger. It is the claim that people of the same country have on one another. I hate to leave you. I hate to vex your mother. But I simply must. My dear, I'm so sorry about this, said Mr. Frisbee. I can't say you're all in the wrong, for I seem to see how you feel about it. And I'd willingly stay in your place if I could. You see how it is. Mrs. Frisbee is naturally nervous, and I am bound to consider her feelings. You may depend upon my doing the best to get the doctor here at the first possible moment. Meanwhile, where's my flask? There's nearly a pin of brandy in it, luckily. And here, you want money, pulling out a roll of bills. And Papa, there's that bottle of Liebig that we never open. Take my cologne car as well as your own. Oh, how I wish we had never come this way. Don't let them carry off car's valise in the carriage park. The horses are ready, called the implacable voice of Mrs. Frisbee from far down the road. It's perfectly splendid of you, cried Elise, hugging Carr tumultuously in her arms. But oh, how horrid it all is. Ten minutes later and they were gone. 
Carl stood in front of the inn alone, her little salvage of necessaries at her feet, her cheek still wet from Elise's last tearful kiss, her mind in a sense of whirl. What had she done? And yet, how could she have done otherwise? The landlord stood looking at Carl, doubtfully, and rubbing his hands. He had not understood a word of the conversation, but he was quite aware that the others had driven off, without waiting for the refreshments they had ordered, leaving this foreign miss on his hands. Carr's state of stunned confusion was such that for the moment every word of Italian that she had learned seemed to fly out of her memory. She read the half-impertinent curiosity in the man's eyes and felt to the full the embarrassments of the situation. But she could do nothing to relieve it beyond sinking on the bench which Mrs. Frisbee had just quitted and faintly murmuring the word coffee. By the time the coffee appeared, her wits had grown clearer. Helped by an occasional reference to a pocket dictionary, she managed to explain to the landlord that she was a friend of the gentleman who was ill, that the others had gone forward to send a doctor from Florence and a nurse, and she was to stay and take care of him till they came. This will be a relief to Madame, your wife, she said, trying after a smile. I will arrange things so that she should not be detained from her other duties so much, though I shall still have to call upon you both to help me till the regular nurse comes. Then she paid for the coffee, adding a couple of francs for the refreshments which the party, in their haste to reach Florence, had not had time to wait for, and asked to be shown to a room. Her courteous manner and self-possession had its effect. The landlord grew several shades more civil, and led the way upstairs to a chamber in the front, which, though not over clean, was of good size and fairly habitable. It was opposite the room which the sick man occupied. Carr removed her hat, cooled her face and hands with water, and stealing softly across the entry, look in at the open door. It was indeed Mr. Bryce who lay there, quietly now, for the brief merciful torpor of sleep was upon him. Short as his illness had been, he was already much changed. Had she not been previously prepared, she would scarcely have known him. There was nothing to suggest the alert, well-appointed passenger of the Calabria in a disheveled head, with sunken features and hot burning cheeks, which rested on the poor pillow of the wayside osteria. Beside him sat the landlord's wife, a peasant-looking woman, with a strongly built figure and fresh-coloured, not unkindly face. She gazed with stolid amazement at Carr and accepted without question her carefully conned explanations as to her presence there. It perhaps was part of that mysterious state of existence, known in her mind as El Inglaterra, the young ladies should appear suddenly by the bedsides of sick signors and offer to take care of them. She answered Carr's questions readily enough. The signor slept much, but not for long at a time, she said. She did not know if he was in his right mind or not. How should she? What did he eat? Nothing but water and one's coffee. She had cooked him an egg, but he would not taste it. Sometimes he made much noise and tried to get out of bed. Then Giuseppe, her husband's nephew, who fortunately was strong, came in and made him lie down again. The signora, who was perhaps his sister, was going to sit beside him. In that case, she would go and see to dinner. It would be convenient. Many things had been left undone while she stayed upstairs, but Shefara, there was no one else. It was a misfortune for them all that the signor had not fallen ill in some other house. Oh, what was the signora doing? With a little shriek, opening the window? Did she not know that a current of air was deadly to the sick? Everyone said so. Carr, however, persisted. The stifling and feverish atmosphere of the room was overpowering to her. In spite of the landlady's protest, she opened both the windows, partly closing the wooden shutters to exclude the sun, and as the fresh breeze blew in, it seemed to her that the sick man breathed more easily. She straightened the bedclothes, wiped the dust from the scanty furniture and the brick floor, and gave a more orderly air to the untidy room. The sound of running water came from below, and putting her head out the window, she saw a stone receptacle set in the side of a rough wall, over which presided a battered fawn's head, from whose mouth a clear stream of water was pouring. That is comfortable, she thought. I can get fresh water whenever I need it, without troubling anyone. She ran down, refilled the empty pitcher, and stood for one moment looking about her at the unfamiliar scene. The straggling hillsides clothed with dusky greyish olives, the dark ilex groves, the fragments of ruined carvings and parish magnificence. Only the blue sky seemed to belong to the customary world of every day. Was it really true, and not a bad dream, that she, Caroline Walcott, was left in this strange place all alone? 
to fight with death in behalf of a stranger. After all, Mr. Bryce was little more than that. I don't repent. It was right to stay, she said to herself stoutly, and ran upstairs again. Her patient roused as she entered, and fixed upon her a stare from a pair of unnaturally bright, quite unseeing eyes. She held a glass to his lips, and he swallowed thirstily. More, he muttered hoarsely. She hastily poured some beef juice into the glass, and he took it without seeming to notice the difference. Then she sponged his face and hands with eau de cologne and water, and brushed his hair for which attentions he seemed vaguely grateful, after which he fell into stupor again, and she sat down, fanning him gently, and at intervals counting his pulse. She had learned how to do this when Elise Frisbee was ill at school, but how she wished for a clinical thermometer, for a glass feeding tube, for a feather pillow, for hundred and one things which are the matter of cause of illness in modern life. But as unattainable in the El Greco d'Italia, such car had learned was the impressive name of the Osteria, as a rock's egg or the great emerald aigrette in the turban of Tipo Saif. So limited were her appliances, in fact, so little could she really affect for the welfare or comfort of the patient, that at moments she doubted whether she had been wise in staying, whether the good done offset the sacrifice it had entailed. There were hours of complete reaction when these thoughts had power to trouble her. All she could do was to keep the room cool and shaded, persuade the landlady and Giuseppe into a daily change of their feverish bedclothes, and see that these were properly aired and warm and not put on clammy with dampness after the fashion of the country, get as much beef juice down the sick man's throat as she could, and keep a register of the fluctuations of his pulse. Three times she was conscious that his strength had suddenly failed, and recalled it by the administration of a stiff dose of Mr. Frisbee's brandy. If he grew violent, she summoned aid, but though he was never aware of her identity, he seemed so uneasy, and his wanderings grew so much wilder if she left him, that she put aside the landlady's offers of help, and kept her steadfast watch unassisted, resolute not to abandon him or yield to fatigue, till help should come. Her one anxious hope was that it might arrive before any gleam of recognition visited him, and that he might never know of her presence in his sick room. The embarrassment of explanation on her part, or gratitude on his, would be equally unbearable. Late in the afternoon of the third day, help came in the shape of a young English doctor from Florence, with a trained nurse and all manner of appliances and comforts. To him, Carr gladly relinquished her charge. She told him briefly but clearly whatever her observations had taught her of Mr. Bryce's condition, handed him the notes she had taken of the variations of pulse, and then, with one long look at the sick man, in which she mentally took what she hoped was a final farewell of him, she went away to sleep and make ready for a departure in the early morning. Her gentleness and consideration, as well as her liberal pay, had won the hearts of the household. Even the unpleasant landlord handed her into the charabal with regret, and the landlady stood in the doorway crying a little, with her apron over her eyes. The signorina must come again, they protested, when there was no fever to care for, and they could make her comfortable. Carr smiled as she thanked them, but her heart registered a devout hope that never again, so long as she lived, need she see the Abeco d'Italia with its impeccable associations of loneliness and anxiety. Her sensations during the long drive to the railway station were of a mixed character. She did not repent her action. She was sure that under the circumstances, she should do the same again. But all the same, the prospect of facing Mrs. Frisbee, to say nothing of the frowning world, was one from which her wearied spirits shrank. For all her certainty that she had done what was right, a wave of homesickness swept over her. If only... With a wish she could be put back across the sea and into her mother's arms. But she and father too would say that what I did was only duty, she told herself. They always taught me that there were better things than just pleasing people and getting along easily through life. I could not have acted differently. Upborne by this firm little fibre of conviction, she prepared to face bravely whatever of evil might fall to her lot as a consequence of her behaviour and fall back on her conscience for relief. I dare say the good Samaritan may have had a rather bad time of it when he got home, she reflected, with a glint of that humour 
which was part of the warp and woof of her character. Very likely he had a wife who objected to finding the oil bottle empty, and considered that the best wine was too good to be slopped away on a stranger, and had something to say about his duty to his own family. Well, the good Samaritan is an altogether bad company to be found in after all. To her relief and surprise, she met with a kinder reception than she had dared to hope for. Mrs. Frisbee's manner was stiff, it is true, but she said nothing actively disagreeable. She would not have confessed it, but in the bottom of her heart she was ashamed of her conduct. She felt that Elise and her husband too tacitly blamed her, and though this did not make her love Carr the better, it at least kept her silent. For the others their warmth of welcome was reassuring. Little Mr. Frisbee had actual tears in his eyes as he shook her by both hands, and wiped his glasses nervously as he assured her he had done all that man could do to get the doctor off by an earlier train, and that he hoped her exertions had not worn her out. You must not suppose that I blame you for remaining, my dear, he said in a whisper. It was a thing that some persons might take exception to, but not if they knew the circumstances, I think. The circumstances were peculiar, very peculiar. The good Samaritan flashed into Carr's mind again. So were his circumstances, very peculiar. Come up to your room and rest, you dear tired thing, cried Elise. I want you all to myself. I want to hear all about Mr. Bryce. Or no, I don't want to hear a thing about Mr. Bryce. I want you to forget all about him and sleep for two solid days at least and eat and be petted. You can't think how I have missed you. Europe is horrid when you are not around, Carr. Now you will scold me, she went on when she had got her friend safely to herself. But I just wasn't going to have people gossiping and pulling you to pieces for doing what was just the kindest, bravest thing that ever a girl did. And so like you, Carr. Just what you did for me when I was sick. She paused for a hug. So I called you Mrs. Walcott in speaking of you to the doctor and sort of gave him to understand that you are a relation of Mr. Bryce, a cousin or sister-in-law or something, so that he shouldn't think it strange that you should be there. I don't care if it wasn't true. I tell fifty lies a great deal bigger than that, rather than have your character torn to bits by these old cats at Florence. How do I know that they are old cats? They always are. The continent is full of them. Anyhow, this can't make up anything about you this time, for you are a married woman and Mr. Bryce is your cousin, frankly. Oh, Elise, how could you? Truth above all things, Papa says. You above truth on this occasion, persisted the unabashed Elise. And though Carr scolded, she kissed her fondly all the same. She had been saved too much not to be forgiving. They had the satisfaction of hearing before they left Florence that Mr. Bryce was doing fairly well, and there was a good chance of his recovery. The night before their departure, the English doctor called. He had been up to the Osteria for the second time and just returned. I think he'll pull through, he said, but it was touch and go. If you hadn't been there just when you were, Mrs. Walcott, he might very well have gone off in one of those sinking turns. I never saw such ignorant fools as the people of the house are, and there seemed to be nothing to be had but eggs and polenta and sour wine. It was with the deuce own luck for your cousin to fall ill in such a place. But he'll do now, I fancy. That Blandy's a crack nurse, a number one, if we say in your country, and she's got him well in hand by now. I shall go up again on Monday, and I hope to find him past the turn. But he owes his life to you, Mrs. Walcott, I consider. We are all very happy to hear such good news, said Mrs. Frisbee suavely. It was a risky thing for Miss Carr to stay on as she did. But all is well that ends well, and I'm sure I hope Mr. Bryce will recover. What on earth did that woman mean by calling Mrs. Walcott Miss Carr, thought Dr. Bliss as he walked home. Very odd, but Americans are odd. Made a name, I suppose. A fortnight later, the Frisbee sailed from Liverpool having seen the kingdoms of the earth and the glory of them, but feeling quite ready to resume their home comforts and the uneventful life of Pawtucket again. Meanwhile, Elliot Bryce was creeping back into life by the slow stages which fever patients know. As soon as it was feasible, they removed him from the comfortless Albecco d'Italia to a small English inn at Perugia, and later to Florence. There his progress was much more rapid. By the middle of July, he was quite fit for independent travel, and the heat of the city made him impatient to be off. Dr. Bliss paid him a parting visit the day before he left. You will get on all right now if you are ordinary prudent, he said. The mountains will set you up fast, but I wouldn't advise much climbing, and you'll have to be careful about getting too tired. Take things easy, loaf, as your country people would say. 
You must have a first-rate constitution to pick up as you have in this heat. No weak spots in your heredity, I should imagine. When, what did your father die of? Railroad accident, responded Elliot briefly. And your grandfather? Old age as much as anything, I should say. He lived to be 97. Ha, I knew it. I knew you came off a sound stock. But I didn't give you credit for half the rallying power you got the first time I saw you. That was what put you through, through those sinking turns. That and your cousin's brandy. My cousin? Mrs. Walcott, you know. Oh, I forgot you don't know. And now I think of it, she begged me not to mention the fact of her being there to you. She seemed to think it would annoy you or something. However, cheerfully, since I forgot I have mentioned it, I don't suppose it can make much of a difference. It was only that she stayed behind the others and took care of you for three days till Blandy and I could get up there. The others? Yes, the what do you call them? Frisbees? She was one of their party, was not she? My cousin, Mrs. Walcott, do you say? Yes. Miss Frisbee told me she was your cousin, didn't she? Well, however you're related, you're indebted to her for your life, in my opinion. It was her being there to keep your strength up for those three days that made all the difference. We should probably have come too late if she hadn't been. Nice lady-like person she is. Gentle, you know, but lots of pluck and character, I should say. Have you got many women of her type over there? You don't look at all alike. Widow, I suppose. Or is she globe-trotting with her husband at home like so many of them? Well, good day. I'll see you at the train tomorrow. Elliot, thoroughly puzzled at the voluble doctor's communication, was left to wonder over this astounding development. Gradually, he arrived at a comprehension of the facts. A few questions to Nurse Blandy confirmed his suspicions. I hardly saw the lady, sir. A very sweet lady she seemed to be, and good care she'd taken of you, so far as she had to do with in that all of a place. She just said, Oh nurse, I'm thankful that you have come, and now you will do all the things for Mr. Bryce. Poor Mr. Bryce, I think it was, that I didn't know enough to do. That was what she said, sir. Then she stood by the bed and looked at you a while without speaking, and then she went away to rest, and I didn't see her again, for she was off at daybreak the next morning. I heard them abiding of her goodbye downstairs, but you were out of your head just then, and I couldn't be spared from the room. And that was all I see of the lady, sir. Carr Walker nursing him for three days. Carr standing silent for a long look by his bedside. He felt as though the confusion in his thoughts was a sign of returning delirium. Could it be true? And if it were true, what did he not owe her? He thought the situation over almost incessantly during the next month, which he passed in the cool valleys of the Ingadin, and more and more the depth of gratitude possessed his soul. In his imagination, he gradually filled out the picture. The modest retiring car would never have remained behind if anyone else had been willing to do so. He realized the scene. Mr. Frisbee helpless, his wife defiant, car alone rousing to the situation and refusing to desert him in his extremity. That strong little chin of hers was not given her for nothing, he reflected. By Jove, what a girl she is. I owe her everything. Then he meditated on the well-known ways of Mrs. Grundy and the extreme probability that things had been made unpleasant for poor Carr till his heart grew hot within him. The reflection which would mingle itself that there might have been, nay must have been, something of peculiar and special interest in her feeling toward him to impel her to such daring action awoke a corresponding emotion. He meditated long and deeply upon her qualities in general more especially this desirable quality just exhibited of appreciating him till at last what with gratitude chivalry and admiration combined he worked himself into quite a lover-like frame of mind and felt justified in writing the following letter which arriving in st johnsbury three weeks later gave car a sensation as if a volcano in full eruption had suddenly opened proceedings among the quiet vermont hills st moritz august sixteenth my dear Miss Walcott, it is only of late that I learned through an indiscretion on the part of our friend Dr. Bliss, for which you must forgive him, that it was you who came to my rescue so nobly at the outset of my late illness. Do not be sorry that I know the truth. If I could tell you how deeply the sense of your goodness has sunk into my heart, how truly and fervently I honour and thank you for it, you will not regret it, I am certain. I owe you such a debt of gratitude as I owe to no other human being and that I am not overwhelmed by it is due to the hope, which I venture to cherish, that you will give me the chance to repay it. 
by the devotion of the rest of my lifetime. Will you make me very happy by becoming my wife? This is putting it in a bald, plain way. It does not answer to my feeling. Rather, I should ask, will you allow me to follow you to your home, and there gradually convince you how strongly my heart is set on this matter? I shall wait your reply here, and if you give me a gleam of hope, shall return at once to America. Face to face, I can tell you better than written words, can tell what I think of your noble goodness, what I feel toward you, how truly and devotedly I am. Yours, Elliot Bryce. There were five weeks of waiting before the answer to this letter could be hoped for. During this interval, its writer passed through many varied fluctuations of feeling. Now he applauded himself for his action. Now he half regretted it. He told himself that a future spent with Carl Walcott could not but be a happy one. Then he reminded himself that he had not meant to marry just yet, least of all a quiet girl with little to distinguish her. Visions of other girls with greater beauty, higher animation, more style and action swept across his mind, and again the genuine side of his nature asserted itself, and he realized that somehow he scarcely could say why his quiet car, to whom he had just offered himself, was better worthwhile than any of them, always in the depths of his heart, those honest depths which underlay the superficial froth of worldly estimates and ambitions. He recognized the fact that Carl was better than himself, simpler, truer, more trustworthy, their standards were higher and her desires purer. She would do me a world of good, he reflected, and felt the shivering joy of one about to take a self-prescribed moral shower bath. Clearly, he was not exactly in love that Mr. Elliot Bryce found himself, but his sensations at times so well stimulated that condition that he could easily persuade himself that he was so, and always he was sure that he was not sorry it had all happened. The answer came. Elliot locked himself into his room to read it, an odd mixture of hope and apprehension struggling in his mind. My dear Mr. Bryce, your letter was like you, and I thank you for it. I can easily imagine that you feel grateful beyond what is necessary for what I did, and are ready to repay it, perhaps fearing, though you are too generous to say so, that I may in some way have suffered for having stayed to care for you till better help should come. Of that, let me reassure you, it seemed right and inevitable that I should do as I did under circumstances. I will do the same again for anyone who needed it, certainly for any American, but a right act may be misconstrued, and people might easily have misunderstood. At least, however, save me this by letting the doctor suppose that I was a relative of yours. It was not true, of course, but she meant it in all kindness, and the result was that none of the few persons who knew the circumstances were in the least surprised at my being there with you. So you see, as far as that is concerned, there is no reason why you should atone for anything or ask me to marry you. I cannot accept your offer, though I thank you for it. You made it from an honourable sense of something owing to me, and that alone would prevent my taking advantage of it, even if I loved you, which I do not. I speak frankly because it is best for us both that I should do so and because I have a regard for you. You are truly a gentleman at heart, I think. You know much more of the world than I do. I believe you to be sincere and brave and well-intentioned as far as you go. Do not think me harsh or unkind, but this would not be enough to satisfy me. The man I marry, if I ever do, must go farther than that. He must not only be truthful, he must love truth for its own sake. He must not be content to be wise for himself. He must use his wisdom for others. He must be a worker. He must value his country above his own interests, even when she does not suit his taste. You are weak, forgive me, where your fastidiousness is concerned. I have heard you sneer at America, and it made me feel as if you were sneering at your own mother. Americans are not always agreeable. I do not like or enjoy some of them any more than you do, but our standpoint with regard to them is vitally different. I look upon them even when they vex me, as one looks upon troublesome members of one's own family. To you, they are outsiders with whom you have absolutely no concern. Forgive me for saying this. I must tell the whole truth since you ask me such an important thing. Truth may hurt, but after all, she is the best friend we have. I thank you with all my heart, and am very, very glad that you are all well again. Sincerely yours, Caroline Walcott. We have all seen chemical experiments where a variety of elements lay in it in the retort of the crucible. 
unblending and inoperative till the final moment when the last ingredient was poured in by the demonstrator and suddenly with heat and colour and iridescence all fused in one moment into one wonderful flashing whole. A similar miracle is sometimes wrought with those more mysterious particles which go toward the formation of an emotion, of an enduring and passionate change of sentiment. So this is what she thinks of me, cried Elliot Bryce, as he finished the reading of this letter. He dashed it down, then took it up again and read it carefully from end to end. After that, he dropped his head into his hands and sat thinking for a long time. Detached sentences floated before his mind. You are weak where your fastidiousness is concerned. It made me feel as though you were sneering at your own mother. How she reads me, he thought. What a keen little white soul it is, sharp as ethereal spear to detect a sham. I feel as if I were standing outside myself looking in. It is not pleasant, certainly, but again he dropped his head into his hands. When he raised it again, his eyes shone with the light of a new intention. By heaven, he said aloud, striking his hand heavily on the table. She shall take that back yet, if I die in the attempt. I swear it. I am weak, as she says, idle, fastidious, but I'll go to work from this moment to mend myself. She has a fixed nature of her own. I could see that when I was with her. Perhaps I may never be able to move her from her resolution, but I'll never marry anyone else. And whatever comes, I'll make myself, before I die, the sort of man that Carl Walcott would be willing to marry. That will be something, even if women have been known to change their minds before now, and she's not an exception to the rest of the world. Though she's the best and truest little creature in it, I'll start for home at once, and we shall see. End of A Quiet Girl, Part 3 Recording by Jade The Barbary Bush and Eight Other Stories for Girls by Susan Coolidge. What the Pudding Brought. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Barbary Bush and Eight Other Stories for Girls by Susan Coolidge. What the Pudding Brought. It was the midnight of the Christmas vigil. Not the cold, brilliant midnight that we want to associate with the Holy Eve but soft and black, with mild airs moving in from the sea, and a misty moon struggling through faint clouds. On the cliffs, the surf laughs and broke with deep-toned murmur. The high chalk downs above still wore a garment of turf, almost summer green. Greener yet was the trimly cut grass where tiny bone church lay buried in tree shadows so deep as to shut out every ray of moonlight, and all the lovely, lovely isle of white seemed wrapped in a deep repose of universal sleep. Not quite all, half a mile away from Vaughan Church to Moon, peeping through the yews, reveal a knot of dark figures collected under the windows of a small house, and presently, after some preliminary notes on a tuning fork, voices broke forth in a Christmas carol. These were the waits, beginning their tuneful round. They had come first of all to Mrs. Durkey's, because of her lodgers, American ladies, to whom the custom might probably be a novelty, and thereby provoke a larger dole than the performers were in the habit of getting from more accustomed listeners. The American lodgers were not particularly charmed to be thus roused from their first sleep by strains which, though well meant, were rather the reverse of harmonious. Good gracious, what is it? demanded Eileen, the first to wake. Then her clouded senses gradually clearing themselves. Emmy, Emmy, she cried. Do you hear the noise? It must be the carol singers. Oh dear, why did they come? protested sleepy Emmy. I was just so nicely asleep. But she sought out wrapper and slippers in the dark, and presently joined Eileen at the window, from which the waits could be seen standing in the shadow of the yews, with their music books and lanterns. No unpicturesque group. Another moment, and the inner door opened, admitting Marion, the third and older sister of the trio. What are those horrible sounds? she asked. They woke me out of a sound sleep and such a nice dream. I thought we were at home again and spending Christmas at Nestledown with Auntie Roo. It's too bad to be waked up. I should like to sleep all through tomorrow and keep on dreaming. Where are you, children, and what is this extraordinary warbling? Hush, Marion, and come and listen. It's the waits. Dear me, why couldn't they wait till tomorrow? 
They look rather pretty too out there in the moonlight, admitted Marion, peeping over Emmy's shoulder. But why don't they keep better time? There, did you catch that high note? Half a tone flat. And what is the instrument that tall man is playing, which makes such extraordinary discords now and then? A flute, I think. Only it's always three quarters of a bar behind the voices. What a droll old custom it is. I object to it altogether, said the fair stately Eileen. What right have these, well, very doubtfully musical people to come and wake us up without saying, by your leave, and remind us of the thing we were doing our best to forget? You know, we agreed not to speak the very name of Christmas, even, or give any presents or do anything different from any other day of the year. We didn't reckon on his crotchetons and quaverers, remarked Emmy. What's that? That was a low knock at the door. Ladies, do you hear the carols? asked the voice of their landlady, modulated to a cautious whisper. Why, of course we do, Mrs. Durkey. How can we help hearing them? said Marion, with rather an exasperated accent in her voice. The music waked us up, said Emmy. Mrs. Durkey, are we expected to give something to the singers? You must tell us. Well, it is usual, admitted Mrs. Durkey. Eileen, could you lay your hand on your purse in the dark? I think so. Yes, here it is. Ten minutes later, the waits departed, made glad with half a crown, and the sisters were again in bed, and more than half asleep. The morrow dawned grey and misty, and was made additionally cheerless by a drizzling rain which soon began to fall. The little sitting room, which the sisters had taken so much pains to make homelike on their arrival a month before, was at its worst always in such weather. The sea view, its chief advantage, was blotted out, and Mrs. Durkey's chimneys never drew well with a southeast wind. The tree breakfasted, almost in silence. Emmy looked pale. Eileen was evidently in low spirits. Marion suggested church, but Emmy was not up to the rainy walk, and Eileen would not leave her. Mrs. Durkey came for the day's orders. Her contented rosy face and Merry Christmas rather jarred on the homesick tree. Don't for Peter's sake order anything unnatural for dinner, said Eileen. Let us make the day as unlike Christmas as we can. I don't think I could bear a feeble imitation of the home holiday. The only way is to forget all about it. Yes, if you only can, put in Emmy from her sofa, with something like a sob in her voice. In a moment, Eileen was on her knees beside her. Fragile little Emmy was the pet and best beloved of the other two. After all, we have the best thing that Christmas could possibly bring us, cooed Eileen, stroking the soft hair. You are better. Yes, I think I am a little, admitted Emmy. Marion, meanwhile, held her housekeeping conference in the entry. You like to have a turkey today, suggested Mrs. Durkey in a persuasive tone. No, I think not, racking her brains for prosaic suggestion. Chops, I think, Mrs. Durkey, and a sole, if you can get a fresh one, and a cauliflower with white sauce and mashed potato. That will do very well. Dear me, it's not a bit like a Christmas dinner, in a disappointed tone. And for the sweet cause, Miss Wren? Well, said Marion, I think we won't mind about that today. None of us care much for sweets. Mrs. Durkey looked deeply, darkly doubtful. She shook her head and seemed about to speak. Then her face relaxed, a little sagacious smile shone in her eyes, and she departed without saying more. The day went by, as hard days will. There was a good deal of laborious cheerfulness in the party. Eileen practiced stoutly on some difficult music. Marion read throat Caesar aloud to Amelia. Neither of the three said a word about the far-off home of which all were thinking. Toward night, the rain ceased, and Marion, leaning out to close the blind, announced the moon to be visible. Don't let's dress for dinner, she said. We are all so comfortable as we are. But I think her object was to discard even so commonplace and observant to make the day, as it were, even less than ordinary days. Dinner came up and was eaten with an accompaniment of chat, which grew happier now that the dreaded holiday was fairly past. The white-capped maid removed the plates and swept the last crumb from the table. There is nothing, Marion began, but at the moment the door opened and in came Mrs. Durkey, her face bright with fire, her eyes with triumph, and in her hand raised aloft a dish on which flamed a small but symmetrical pudding surrounded with blazing brandy and topped with a towering sprig of red berry holly. Ladies, she said, I took the liberty of making your Christmas pudding in our English way, and I hope you excuse it, and accept with my best respects. It was a shock, but noblesse obliged, and after a single moment of consternation, the rants roused to the situation. 
What a beauty of a pudding, cried Eileen. How very good of you, put in Emmy. We are so obliged, dear Mrs. Durkee. Well, I couldn't seem to bear your spending the day so dull like, responded Mrs. Durkee. Christmas isn't like itself without a pudding, to my thinking. And my mother, she always felt so too. This is a recipe, and it has got all the things that ought to be. What do you mean? asked the puzzled Marion. Oh, I don't mean plums and such like, ma'am. Every pudding has them at all seasons of the year. But the Christmas pudding is the only one, you know, which has the ring, the sixpence, and a thimble. What? The ring, the sixpence, and a thimble, ma'am. It's for luck, you understand? The sixpence means money, you know. The one of you that gets that in a slice is sure to have some at left in the course of a year and a day as a legacy like. The ring means a husband, of course, and a thimble is poverty. Ah, Miss Wren, you're laughing, I see. But I've no need to come true more times than one. The pudding seldom misses. I call this exciting, said Eileen. Now, Mrs. Durkee, carve the pudding for us and give each a slice while I open this bottle of ginger ale. We must all drink one another's health in honour of your wondrous present. The pudding was carved, and Mrs. Zerke, nothing low, sipped her glass of foaming ale, while the sisters curiously explored each her slice with a fork. I have the ring, said Eileen solemnly, and I do believe, yes, here is the sixpence, declared Emmy, fishing the hot little disc out daintily from the burning sauce. I am to be the rich one, it seems. I have nothing at all. That seems hardly fair, pronounced Marion. At that very moment, her fork encountered a hard substance, the thimble. Well, that is the most curious, cried Mrs. Durkee. I never before heard of all three things being drawn, except there was a large party and the whole pudding was served. Well, I'm sorry you've got the thimble, Miss Rand, but there's some sorts of poverty that is as good as riches, they say, and I hope your sort will be that kind. What a good creature that is, remarked Eileen after she had gone. We didn't want a pudding, and we didn't mean to have a pudding, but after all, I am glad she made us one, if only to show what a kind heart she has. The English are very nice, I think. So they are, and it was a really jolly idea to put those things in. I never heard of such a custom before. It makes a plum pudding really interesting. It is all very well for you who did not happen to draw the thimble, remarked Marion severely. I am not sure that I find the pudding so interesting. Porty called is an old acquaintance. I don't care to have him freshly introduced to me. Altogether, what with the surprise and the fun, the pudding was a great success, and the Christmas in lodgings ended much more cheerily with the Rand sisters than it had begun. The next week drifted by, and now it was the twelfth night, a festival with little meaning to American years. With the Rands, the day was chiefly remarkable for the expected arrival of a belated American mail. Marion went to the post in the afternoon and returned rosy and elated, with quite a bundle of letters. Three letters for you, Eileen, two for me, and with a lot of newspapers. And for you, Emmy, this thick blue envelope, which looks business-like. I wonder who could have sent it. Then she tore open her own letters, and soon became too much absorbed to notice the faces of her companions, till a double exclamation caught her ear and made her look up suddenly. Marion, what do you think the pudding has come true? cried Emmy. Oh, Marion, the pudding! See what has come of it! exclaimed Eileen at the same moment. Then they stopped and regarded each other with wondering eyes. What is it? demanded the astonished Marion. I don't know what Eileen's news may be, but listen to mine. Only think, I drew the sixpence, you know, and here is a letter from old Mr. Wickham, the lawyer, to say that Cousin Amelia Storrs is dead and has left me twenty thousand dollars because of my being named after her. Twenty thousand? Why, that is news, cried Marion. Why, my darling dear, now you can go to the Rivera just as we wished. How delighted I am. You will get well there in just one minute, I am sure of it. I mean, how queer you look. Have you had a fortune left you too? No, not a fortune, replied Eileen slowly. I didn't draw money, you know. I drew the ring, blushing most beautifully. Yes, well, what is it? What are you growing so red about? Eileen, speak. Don't keep us in a suspense. Girls, said Eileen, I'm going to confess something that will surprise you a good deal. You won't be vexed with me, will you? Promise in advance, you won't. Very well, we promise. Only make haste and tell, said Marion, on fire with curiosity. Well then, when Jim Chauncey went to China three years ago, I promised to marry him whenever he was able to come home and ask me. The sister stared at her speechlessly. It seems me never to have let you know. 
went on Eileen rapidly. But it was a very far away sort of dream to me. And just then, just after he sailed, came the beginning of Mother's long sickness. And then Emmy fell ill, and there seemed so much to think about and worry over that I couldn't bear to add this to the rest, or make you feel that I had any hopes or plans apart from yours. And in fact, I hadn't. It might be for years, or it might be forever, for all I could tell, before Jim would be in a condition to claim my promise. But here he writes that all is suddenly changed. The New York partner of the firm is dead, and they have decided to send Jim back to his place. He will have an ample income, and, and in short, we must go home, dears, as soon as the warm weather is fairly come, and is safe for Emmy. Jim will reach New York in June, and he wants to be met, I mean, to see me as soon as possible after he lands. Well, I never was not quite so flat in all my life before, said Marion, recovering her speech with a sort of gasp. One such surprise in a day would be almost too much. Two is too utterly too. You wretched little humbug. Who would have ever suspected you were of secreting an engagement all this while? But you were an angel of unselfishness not to mope and not to tell us, giving Eileen an energetic squeeze. It would have added to our worries dreadfully to feel that you only half belonged to us. It was just like you, Eileen. So it was, added Amelia, drawing her sister's fair face down for a kiss. Oh my, Ally, how bewildering it is. I rich and you engage. I shall always believe in puddings for the future. Marion is the only one left out. Don't despair. It wouldn't surprise me if some man all tattered and torn made his appearance at any moment, said Marion. Besides, she has half of all we have, said Eileen. Half of Jim Chauncey? Thank you, replied Marion grimly. Solomon himself will find it rather difficult to effect that amicable division. No, my dears, poverty is my portion. Witness the fatal timber, and I am quite content. Great was Mrs. Durkee's surprise, and great her triumph at learning what wonders her culinary spell had wrought. Her satisfaction was only marred by the tidings that her lodgers must leave her soon. They had decided on San Remo for the spring months, and indeed, I would never have made any pudding at all had I guessed what it was to cost me, protested the good landlady. But you will write and let me know what comes to you, Miss Marion, won't you? Something will before the year's out, depend upon it, and I've right to hear. Don't you think so yourself now, ma'am? Of course you have, and you shall hear, promised Marion. But spring and summer passed, and autumn was well under way before a letter with the American postmark came to satisfy the good landlady's curiosity. It bore date. New York, November 12th. My dear Mrs. Durkee, so it ran. I hope you have not forgotten us or our promise to write. I meant to have done so before, but I thought you would be too disappointed to hear that the pudding charm had, in my case, failed and produced nothing at all. Until lately, this seemed to be the truth. We got home on the 29th of May, and just a month later, my sister Eileen was married. She is settled now in her pretty new home and is very well and very happy and hopes we got the cards she sent out to you. Emmy, who you will like to hear, is quite strong again. Spend the summer with me in Colorado, which is the most beautiful country you can imagine, with such mountains and park-like valleys and such air as cannot be described. Colorado, you know, is a state in the far west, almost as far from New York as you are in the Isle of Wight. Now we are come eastward again, and we are staying with Eileen for a little while, until... Here comes my news. And, as you will see, the pudding was a true prophet. Until I am married, as I expect to be on the 10th of next month, to Mr. Robert Ramsey, whom we met at Ed's Park last July. He is a ranchman, that is, a sort of sheep farmer, and I'm going back with him to live in Colorado. Our house will be pretty rough for the first year or two. In fact, it is a sort of cabin built entirely of wood and partly of logs, with no paint or plaster, and I suppose would seem rather poverty stricken to some people but we hope to improve it in time and meanwhile we have beautiful hills to look at and a splendid climate which together with youth and fair prospects make a very pleasant sort of poverty as i think so you needn't be at all sorry for me or regret the pudding for if i could put that timber back again with a wish i assure you i wouldn't and i'm not only contented but proud of the fate it has brought me my sisters join me in kind regards, and I am, dear Mrs. Durkee, yours most cordially, Marion Rand. The blessed young thing that she is, ejaculated Mrs. Durkee, wiping her eyes as she finished the letter. Well, let folks that will doubt that old saying about the pudding, 
I never shall again. It's made my young lady's fortune, true as life, and I mean to keep on with a ring, a sixpence, and a thimble as long as I live. End of What the Pudding Brought Recording by Jade from Washington Chapter 14 of The Barbary Bush and 8 Other Stories for Girls This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Barbary Bush and 8 Other Stories for Girls by Susan Coolidge Chapter 14 A Chance Word Myra Sidney was sitting in the window of a little parlour, watching the slow rising of the storm over the opposite sky. Even city streets have their opportunity. This street in which Miss Sidney dwelt was in the outskirts of a suburb, where building plots were still generously measured. It ran along the ridge of a slope, and Miss Sidney's house had the further advantage of standing opposite a group of vacant lots, beyond which, above the roofs and chimneys on the lower streets, a line of blue hills was visible, topped with woods and dappled with cloud shadows. Many an autumn sunset had she watched from her front window, many a soft spring and whirling snowstorm. To some natures, there are both companionship and compensation in the changeful aspects of nature. Myra was one of these. She would not have exchanged her little house with its wide view for any other, however magnificent, whose boundaries were brick walls alone and sky and sun and hill made for the leisure moments of a busy life a perpetual and unwearying peace. The room in which Miss Sidney sat expressed its owner, as rooms will, whether meant to do so or not. In no respect of size or shape did it differ from number 11 on one side or number 15 on the other. Yet, its aspect was anything rather than commonplace. The prevailing tint on wall and floor was a soft oil which made a background for brighter coloured things, for the old Indian shawl which did duty as a portiere, for a couple of deep-hued eastern rugs, for pictures of various kinds and values and a sprinkling of brick of brack, odd rather than valuable, but so chosen as to be in thorough harmony with the surroundings. Everything had a use. No pitfalls yawned for unwary guests in the shape of minute tables, Queen Anne or otherwise, laden with trumpery biscuits or serviettes, and ready to upset with a touch. A couple of short old-fashioned sofas flanked the fireplace on either side. Two or three easy chairs and a firm set low table laden with books and periodicals, completed a sort of circle where ten or a dozen persons could group themselves round the place. Miss Sidney herself, slight, vivid, simply dressed, but without an ungraceful point of fold, was in accordance with her room. The clock struck seven. The black cloud had crept to the zenith, and now a strong gust of wind swept from beneath it, bringing on its wings the first drop of rain. Miss Sidney rose and shut the window. At that moment, the doorbell rang. It's two girls with a parcel, Miss Myra, said Esther, the parlour maid. They'd like to speak with you, they say. Miss Sidney went out into a little entry. The girls, about the same age, were of the unmistakable short girl type. You are from Snow and Ashes, I think, she said in her courteous voice. Yes, ma'am. Mr. Snow said he wasn't sure which of the underways it was that you took, so he sent both kinds. And will you try them on, please? Certainly. Are you to wait for them? Yes, ma'am. Miss Sidney made what haste she could, but before she returned, the rain was falling in torrents. You must wait till it slackens, she said. You'll be very wet if you don't. Have you far to go? She has, replied one of the girls, with an embarrassed giggle. I'm pretty nearby, and the horse car runs just in front of the door, but Carrie has to walk quite a way, and her shoes is thin too. She better wait, I guess, but I must go anyway. Miss Sidney glanced at the shoes, cheap paper soap boots with a dusty velvet bow sewed on the toe of each, and she too concluded that by all means, Carrie must wait. Come in here, she said, leading the way into the parlour. Esther had now lighted the lamp, a little fire sparkled on the hearth. Myra drew an easy chair close to it. Sit down and have a thorough warming, she said. It is a chilly evening. Yes, ma'am. The girl thrust the velvet bowed boots, which gaped for lack of buttons, out to the fire and half from embarrassment, held up a hand to shade her face. It was a small hand with an ambiguous red gem on forefinger. The nails were all bitten to the quick, Miss Sidney observed. The face shaded by the hand was not unpretty, 
The brown eyes had a straightforward, honest glance. The mouth was rather sweet, and there was that delicacy of modelling just bordering on fragility, which gives to the early youth of so many American women a fleeting charm. It was a face with softly banded hair and a low knot would have suited, but with the bad taste of a class, Carrie had adopted the style of coiffer which became her least. All the front hair was an unkept tangle of bang. At the back was a mess of jute switches braided and surmounted with a gilt comb. And on top of the erection was perched a straw hat lined with blue and ornamented with a bit rag of cock's tail. The dress of cheap material was blue also and was frilled and flounced into caricature of the prevailing fashion. A ruffle of soiled lace surrounded the girl's neck beneath which over a not over clean muslin tie hung a smart locket of yellow metal, very yellow. Bangles clinked round the slender wrist. Beneath the puff and ruffled skirt, a shabby petticoat of grey cotton peeped out. Though the weather was chill, the girl wore no wrap. Miss Sidney noted these details in half the time it has taken to describe them, and stirred with a pity, which was half indignation, said, My child, how could you think of coming out on such a day as this without a shawl? I haven't any shawl. Well, a jacket then. I haven't any jacket either that matches this dress. Glancing complacently down at the beruffled skirt. But you would rather wear a jacket that didn't match your dress than catch a cold, wouldn't you? Yes, admitted the girl in rather an unwilling tone. But the only one I've got is purple and it looks horrid with this blue. Noting dissent in her companion's face, she added, We poor girls can't have a wrap for every dress like rich ladies do. No, said Miss Sidney gently. I know it. I never attempt to have a different wrap for each dress I wear. I can't afford it either. Carrie stared. How clear she began, then changed it to. But you and us are quite different, ma'am. There was something wistful in the face which touched Myra Sidney. It will be time wasted, I dare say, she said to herself. Still, I should like just for once to argue out the dress question with a girl like this. She's one of great class, and poor things, they are so dreadfully foolish and ignorant. She made no immediate reply to her companion, but rose and rang the bell. I'm going to give you a cup of tea, she said. Hark, how it rains. You can't go yet, and you will be less likely to take a cold when you do go, if you start well warm. Besides, I want to have you stay. I should like to have a little talk over this question of dress, which is so interesting to all of us women. She smiled brightly at her guest who, as if dazzled, watched the entrance of the tray, with its bubbling kettle, its plates of tin bread and butter, and crisp dainty cakes, watched Myra measure the tea, warm the pot of gay Japanese ware, and when the brew was ready, fill the tin lid cups and drop in sugar and cream. How nice, she said with a sigh of satisfaction. Her heart opened under the unwanted kindness and comfort, and Miss Sidney had little difficulty in learning what she wished to know. Carrie Thomas was the girl's name. She had lived at home till two years ago. Did she like the city? Yes, she guessed she liked it well enough. But boarding wasn't much like home. She and another girl that worked at Snow and Ashes had a room together out in Farewell Street. They had pretty good times when they weren't too full of work. But in the busy season, they stayed so late at the store that they didn't want anything when they got home except to go straight to bed. They got $7 a week more when there were extra work to do. Can you lay up anything out of that? asked Miss Sidney. No ma'am, not a cent. At least I don't. There's some girls in the store that do, but they've got sick friends to save for. Now, said Miss Sidney, having thus felt her way, to go back to the jacket question, as I told you, I can't at all afford to have one for every dress. Can't you ma'am? What do you do then? I buy one jacket which will do with everything I wear. But that isn't a suit, said Carrie doubtfully. No, but it's absolutely necessary that everything should be a suit. The girls at our store think so much of suits, in a puzzled tone of self-defense. I know some people have a fancy for them, and they are very pretty sometimes. But don't you see that they must cost a great deal of money, and that working people, you and myself for instance, ought to manage more carefully? Do you work, ma'am? To be sure I do. You look surprised. 
Ah, uh, you think that because I have a little home of my own and live in a pretty room, I must be a fine lady with nothing to do? That's a mistake of yours. I work nearly as many hours a day as you do and earn the greater part of my own income. And I have to consult economy to keep my home and make it pleasant. And among the things which I can't afford to have are suits. I wish you'd tell me how you do, ma'am. I will, though I'm not in the habit of talking quite so freely about my affairs. But I'll tell you, because it may give you an idea of how to manage better for yourself. In the first place, I keep to two or three colours. I have a black gown or two and an oily brown and this yellowish green that you see and some lighter ones, white or pale yellow. Now if any of these, the same bonnet would do. The one I am wearing now is black with a little jet and pale yellow and it goes perfectly well with all my dresses. And so does my black cashmere jacket and my parasol and gloves which are yellow also. Don't you see that there is an economy in this and that if I had a purple dress and a blue one and a brown, I should want a different bonnet for each, and different gloves and a different parasol. Why yes, it does seem so, said Carrie, drawing a long breath. I like to do somehow different myself, but I don't suppose I know how. Would you mind if I told you what I think? asked Myra gently. No ma'am, I thank you. It seems to me that the chief trouble with girls who work in stores is that they care more for being what they call stylish than for being either neat or pretty. A young girl can look her best in a simple dress if it is well put on and becoming. That's what mother used to say. And Mark, he always liked me best in a white bib apron. To be sure he never saw me in city clothes, she stopped blushing. Is Mark your brother? asked Myra. Then she smiled at her own stupidity, for such a deep blush as mantle in Carrie's cheek is seldom evoked by the mention of a brother. No ma'am, he's just a friend. His folks and mine live opposite. In Gilmanton? And is he a farmer? His father farms, and Mark works for him. But his time is out in the spring, and then he calculates to set up for himself. Does he ever come to the city? No, not once since I was here, but he speaks some of coming down along towards spring, and that's one reason I like to look as stylish as I can, so as not to be different from the rest when Mark. I think in his place I should prefer you to be different, said Miss Sidney decidedly. Now, Carrie, don't be offended. What you girls aim at is to look like the ladies who come to the shop, isn't it? Stylish, as you would say. Yes, I suppose it is, admitted Carrie. Well then, I must tell you the plain truth. You utterly fail in your attempt. No one will mistake a girl dressed as you are at this moment for a lady. Nobody. But, disregarding the deep flush on her companion's cheeks, if I went into a shop and saw that a young girl as pretty and as delicately made as you are, Carrie, with hair as smooth as satin, and a simple gown that fitted exactly, and a collar and cuffs as white as snow, and perhaps a black silk apron or a white one, and with neat shoes and nice stockings. If I saw a girl dressed like that, with nothing costly, nothing that any girl cannot have, but everything fresh and neat and pretty, I should say to myself, there is a shop girl with the true instincts of a lady, and carry. Don't think me impertinent if Mark came to town and saw a girl like that among the crowd of untidy, overdressed ones at Snow and Ashes. I think the contrast would strike him as it would me, agreeably. Miss Sidney paused, half frightened at her own daring. Carrie looked steadily into the fire without speaking. The rain had ceased. Myra rose and threw back the blind, revealing the moon struggling through thin edges of cloud. Carrie followed her to the window. Her cheeks were a deep red. But there was a frank and grateful look in her eyes as she said, I must be going now, ma'am. You have been ever so good to let me stay. I shan't forget it, and I guess you're about right. I wonder if I said the right thing or have done the least good, queried Miss Sidney, as she watched the guest depart. It was some weeks before she had the occasion again to visit Snow and Ashes, and she had half forgotten the little incident, when one day, entering the shop in quest of something, her attention was attracted by a face which beamed with sudden smiles at the sight of her. It was indeed Carrie, but such a different Carrie from the draggled vision of the wet evening. She still wore the blue dress, but the flounces had been ripped off and the front was hidden with a neat black silk apron. The tangle of hair was smoothed into orderly waves. A white collar with a knot of blue ribbon was round her neck. One of the objectionable rings had disappeared and so had the yellow locket. 
so changed and so much prettier was the little maiden that Miss Sydney scarcely knew her till blush and smile pointed her out. She waited on her customer with assiduity and under cover of a box of ruffles they exchanged confidences. Did Miss Sydney think she looked better? She was so glad. The girls had laughed at her at first, but not so much now. And her roommate, Ellen Morris, had got herself an apron-like curse. Miss Sydney left the shop with a pleased amusement at her heart. She meant to go often to keep a little hold on Carrie, but circumstances took her off to Florida soon afterward, and it was late in April before she returned. That girl from Snow and Ashes was to see you about a week ago, ma'am, said Esther the evening after her arrival. I told her you was expected Tuesday, and she said she would come again today, but she wanted to speak to you particular, and she was going away. There she is now. Carrie indeed it was, with a steady, manly-looking young fellow by her side. It is Mark, Miss Sydney, she said, by the way of introduction. Later, when Mark had walked over to the window to see the view, she explained further in a rapid undertone. He came down two months ago while you was away, ma'am. I came to tell you, but you was gone, and day after tomorrow, I'm going back with him to Gilmanton. I told him he must bring me out tonight, for I couldn't leave without saying goodbye to you. You're going to be married? Yes, with a happy look. Tomorrow morning, and oh, Miss Sydney, what do you think Mark says? He says, if he found me looking like the rest of the girls at the store, with false hair and jewelry like that, he never in the world has asked me at all. And I did look just like that, you know. It was what you said that rainy night that made me change. And except for that, nothing would have happened that has, and I shouldn't be the happy girl I am. Bread on the waters, thought Myra a little later, as she watched the lovers walk down the street. Such a little crumb and such wide waters, yet it has come back. How impossible it seems or would seem if one did not have to believe that what we call chances and accidents are God's opportunities by which he allows us to lend a helping hand in his work, not quite understanding what we do, but knowing that, guided by him, the smallest things end sometimes in great results. End of chapter 14, recording by Jade from Malaysia. The Barbary Bush and Eight Other Stories for Girls by Susan Coolidge. Nika. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Denise Nordell. The Barbary Bush and Eight Other Stories for Girls by Susan Coolidge. Nika. There was a happy excitement in the Irving homestead one morning in early June, an excitement in which every member of the family, from least to greatest, participated. Miss Irving, who was that delightful thing, a bright, well-to-do maiden aunt, had arrived only the night before from a year's absence in Europe, and now the pleasantest part to the homestayers of such a journey was going on, the unpacking of trunks and distribution of presents. And Helen had forgotten nobody. There were rosaries blessed by the Pope for Winnie the cook and Kate the housemaid. There was a Cairngorm scarf pin for Andrew, the old Scotch gardener, and a parcel marked The New Servant, which was for Mary Jane, the laundress who had come into the family since Aunt Helen went away. Photographs and engraving, a pretty easel picture painted on porcelain, Russia leather portfolios, and a super excellent English umbrella there were for Mr. and Mrs. Irving and the boys. Little Madge received a resplendent Paris doll, Lucy Marsh, a Sorrento workbox, and for Helen, Auntie's namesake and chief favorite, there was everything. All the gifts to other people were interspersed with gifts big and little for her. First came a long package of many buttoned gloves, next a dainty jabot of Melanie's lace, and a very special parasol. After that, a tortoise-shell fan with Helen's monogram carved on the sticks, and a slender dagger of silver filigree for her hair. Auntie had evidently thought of her at every step of her journey. There seemed no end to the pretty things labeled Helen. Last of all, as she sat with her lap full of treasures, when the power of wish seemed almost satiated, came a final parcel. I kept this till the last because it is your real present, said her aunt. The others are only little trifles to show that I carried you about me wherever I went. Dear auntie, you carry everybody about, I think, replied Helen, reaching up her lips for a kiss. Then she opened the package with fingers which shook with a pleased excitement. 
within was a small velvet case and inside that a locket of dull roman gold one side bore in raised letters the well-known monogram which by a graceful transposition is made to spell both roma and amor on the other side worked in fine blue enamel was the word nika what does it mean said helen wonderingly i don't know said her mother i never saw the word before perhaps an appropriate allusion to the old nick suggested naughty jim or to the scandinavian nixa put in lucy no none of those sent aunt helen it is from a greek word and means victory i like that cried helen with a proud light in her frank eyes i thought you would returned her aunt gently it is a noble word but there is more than one sort of victory my darling remember that helen looked as though she only half understood her lips parted with the question but she checked herself later however when the gifts were all given and the household had quieted down to its usual calm and miss irving was resting in her own room helen tapped at the door her locket was in her hand together with a long piece of pale blue velvet ribbon see she said isn't this velvet just the shade of the enamel she sat down close beside the sofa and began to draw the velvet through the clasp of the pendant auntie what did you mean exactly when you said that about the different kinds of victory she said greater is he that ruleth his own spirit than he that taketh a city quoted aunt helen softly that is one this is the victory that overcometh the world even our faith that is another in all these things we are more than conquerors auntie how very serious cried helen she did not quite like these grave associations established with her pretty locket victory to her meant triumph success the accomplishment of wish and will she was in that first brilliant flush of youth when no good thing seems impossible her untried fingers seemed to hold the key of a golden future it was but to fit the key to the right lock and turn and all things should be hers into her mind had lately come a dim prescience as to what the lock might be which this golden key of hers was to open girls often have this veiled insight into coming fate sometimes the insight proves true more frequently wrong in helen's case it was still doubtful but as she studied the enameled legend on her locket a throb of triumph stirred her heart and shone in her brown eyes the person in her thought for of course there was a person was ellen marsh lucy's cousin and guardian mrs marsh had been mrs irving's intimate friend as well as distant relative and on her death many years before she had bequeathed her little daughter to mrs irving's care the gentle clinging girl had grown up among the irving children like one of themselves but a few months helen's junior lucy had always looked up to her as to a superior power there was no thought of rivalry or jealousy in her mind in her eyes helen was perfection and she loved her better than any one else in the world except her cousin alan with lucy alan always stood first in the old days of their childhood lucy was forever talking about this cousin alan she spoke of him with a sort of reverent affection as of a person immeasurably older and wiser than herself so that the irving children were prepared to find in him a white-haired sage alan came his hair was not white but still he might be a sage and certainly he was old for to eyes of fourteen twenty-six seems nearly as venerable as fifty but now at nineteen alan seemed to helen only so much older than herself as to be greatly more interesting than if he had been of her own age and a boy at fourteen alan was lucy's exclusive possession the others had no claim upon him no one disputed her right to stand first in his affection and thoughts lately there had come a change it was hard to say just where this change began or just how far it went but helen was conscious of it and that consciousness had brought the throb of triumph into her heart as she studied the victory on her locket could it really be true that alan liked her better than lucy now than lucy who for so many years had reigned supreme first as his pet then his confidant and favorite she recalled things that had happened of late little things but important in meaning he had consulted her more than once instead of consulting lucy he had asked her to play though lucy played so much better there was the afternoon when he forgot his engagement to row with lucy because of that long talk they were having in the grey barber helen colored half with pleasure half with pride at the recollection and then with a little pang came the questioning thought did lucy mind very much all this train of ideas drifted across her in those few minutes as she sat looking at the trinket in her hand and mingling with them came a dim spiritual quickening born of her aunt's last words if lucy did mind what then the little painful doubt was the prick of conscience she stood at the turning of the ways 
It was hardly love that she felt for Alan, it was hardly love which he felt for her. On both sides it was a mutual attraction which might easily grow into love. It was not too late for all this to be changed if Lucy cared very much. Helen scarcely put this clearly to her own mind, but she had an instinct. She was capable of noble things, and her aunt's words had waked the capacity into life. She would not go on thoughtlessly after this. She came down to tea that night with the locket tied under the ruffle of a delicately frilled white woolen dress. There was a new expression in her face which made it unusually sweet. Lucy noted it, and, drawn to Helen, put a pair of soft arms round her neck and kissed her gently. Alan noted it when he came in later. It drew him to Helen's side and held him there. For the time he had no eyes for any one else. Lucy's loyal love for Helen made blame impossible, but she felt lonely and left out. Helen marked the wistful shade on Lucy's face, and her heart smote her. She took Lucy's hand in hers. It was cold. "'Dear Lucy,' she said, "'you ought not to sit by this open window. You are shivering now. Please shut it, Alan, and Lucy, come and play us that pretty nocturne of Schumann's. It will warm your fingers.' She drew Lucy to the piano. It was generously done, for in music Lucy far excelled her, and Alan loved music passionately. Helen stood by, saw him caught and held in the spell of sweet sounds, saw that he had for the moment forgotten her and was absorbed in Lucy and her nocturne. Then she turned and quietly left the room. Upstairs the windows stood wide open, and the moonbeams filtering through the boughs made a beautiful checkerwork of light and shadow on the floor of Helen's pretty chamber. She sat down in the clear beams, and, looking out, thought over the past few weeks, during which the sense of growing power, of standing first where once she had stood second, had gradually taken possession of her and become delightful. She thought of Lucy, her gentle dependence upon others, her absorbed affection for Alan, her fragile health as contrasted with her own vigor and courage and imperious spring of life. I have so many things, so many chances, and she has but one, she reflected. Lucy might fade away and die like girls in books if a great sorrow fell upon her, while I, she drew herself up with the keen sense of inward strength, I should not die, even if I loved Alan very much and had to give him up. It would hurt, but it would take more than that to kill me. She tried to think clearly, to analyze the situation. It was an odd mental process for a girl of nineteen, but Helen was not like ordinary girls, and, as I have already said, was not exactly in love with Alan Marsh, else the mental process might have resulted differently. No, it wouldn't kill me, was the end of her reflections. I like Alan. I enjoy having him like me. It's rather hard to stand aside and give Lucy the first chance, but I can do it, and if I ought, I will. Dear Lucy, I won't be a bar to her happiness. If this is her happiness, she shall have her chance. Then, if it proves not to be a chance, and not to be the true happiness, well, then it will be all different, and perhaps... She checked herself. A big, bright tear dropped over her cheek onto the window-sill, glistening in the moonlight like a diamond. She dried it impatiently. Nika, she said, squeezing the blue locket tightly between her fingers, I will be brave. There is more than one sort of victory, Auntie said. Then she ran downstairs again. Helen was true to her word. Lucy had her chance. Alan Marsh would have found it hard to explain in after days just how it was that, being more than half in love with Helen Irving, the feeling somehow faded and grew dim, and he ended by falling wholly in love with his cousin Lucy. Many men experience these half-loves before they arrive at the real ones. Circumstances not easily or wholly understood aid or retard their development, just as circumstances, equally obscure, help on the blossoming or the blighting of a flower-bud circumstance in this case was a girl's high-mindedness waked into life by a chance word but its result was to make not mar for alan was a devoted and happy husband and in the sunshine of love and home little lucy rounded into a fair and gracious womanhood which far outgrew the promise of her youth and helen there is something pathetic in the sure hopefulness of youth any day any hour the wonderful dreamed-of thing may come may happen every morning the sun dawns full of promise Meanwhile there are the passing moments, each with its stir of life, its freight of infinitely interesting small things. Today does not fulfill the great hope? Well, then, tomorrow will. The expectation is but transferred. So the days glide by, and year follows year, and still there is no actual sharpness of disappointment. For still all may be coming which has not come. And at last middle age lays its quieting hand on the pulses, and the time comes when a vivid emotion or a great sudden change becomes an unwelcome thought, as a disturbance of the calm which has grown dear and necessary. 
I will not tell you more clearly of Helen's fate. She had many chances, as she herself said, chances not only of love and marriage, but of other things, and today she is a happy woman, and though her girlish desires might have found fault with just such happiness as hers, none the less does it fulfill her riper wish. There is more than one sort of victory. The End End of Nika Recording by Denise Nordell, Modesto, California End of the Barbary Bush and Eight Other Stories for Girls by Susan Coolidge